1864. We were first class then, and we're first class now, with a dream to spread cricket through Lancashire's towns. Where girls and boys, with willow and leather, become more than a badge, but the red rose together. A club where more than legends are made, but friendships, obsessions, moments replayed on our screens, in our minds, in our hearts forever. Because it's who we are, our DNA, the red rose together. Statham, Briggs, Jimmy, Freddie and Joss, Chappie, Sir Clive Lloyd, Carol Hodges, Kate Cross. What a roll call. It's a hard one to measure, with future names still to be written on the red rolls together. We're all about people. It's what the red rose really means. Yeah, the ones signing autographs, but the ones behind the scenes. Our community, grassroots, the ones that feel tethered. Whether you're from here or belong here, we are the Red Rose together. And what about this place? Talk about world-class venues, internationals, gigs, events. You can choose from a menu of triumph, of disaster, of pain, or pleasure. We've seen it all at Emirates Old Trafford with the Red Rose together. Red ball, white ball, lightning and thunder. Have you ever sat back? Have you ever just wondered how far we've come? The storms we've weathered, or how far we'll go as the red rolls together. Good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome to our coverage here on Lanx TV. Day three of this county championship fixture at Emirates Old Trafford between Lancashire and Surrey. Already it's been badly affected by the weather. We lost the first day. We lost the morning session on day two, and we're set for a delayed start, I'm afraid, on the third day. An umpire's inspection due to take place at 11.30. The conditions outside are actually quite bright sunshine and blue sky but a lot of rain overnight and early this morning means the outfield again is a little wet in places so an 11:30 inspection fingers crossed that means we'll get some play a little bit later on uh, this afternoon what cricket we have seen has been absolutely fascinating we saw two sessions yesterday uh, 80 overs of cricket in total we saw lancashire um, batting and then we saw surrey batting by the close of play. We had Nathan Lyon and Tom Hartley bowling on the floodlights late on last night. And um, Mark Church from BBC Radio London's alongside me. Morning, Churchy. Morning, Scott Reid. It's a shame we're not going to start on time on the third day, but what we have seen from the, the two sessions of cricket so far has been quite interesting. It wasn't what we expected. I think that's fair to say. Uh, sorry, winning the toss bowling first, which I don't think surprised anybody with the conditions that we've had. And then Dan Lawrence is suddenly into the attack to bowl his off spin in the 10th over. Picks up the first wicket of Keaton Jennings. Josh Bohannon plays beautifully alongside Luke Wells. Luke Wells then pulls a short ball from Tom Laws into the hands of Dan Lawrence. And Luke Wells goes for 40. And then it was all about spin. And Cameron Steele comes into the attack and picks up Pfeiffer. And Dan Lawrence bowls, you know, this, this off spin we've talked about with Dan Lawrence, he's a genuine all rounder. That's what Surrey have said. We've signed him because he is a genuine all rounder. Uh, he got plenty of overs under his belt yesterday. Uh, I thought he bowled really nicely. A and between them, they picked up nine. <laughs> of the 10 Lancashire wickets to four. And it was quite a collapse from Lancashire in the fact that they were 150 for two uh, and all out for 202. And then the wonderful thing was, Surrey went out to bat with Rory Burns and Dom Sibley and we've got Nathan Lyon into the attack very early. I know we only had the five overs last night, but we saw a bit of Lyon and then we saw an over from Hartley. Now, 
today, if the weather had been better, it would have been a fantastic day of cricket. In the fact that I think you, you might have seen a bit of Will Williams and Tom Bailey to start up with, but then it would have been Hartley in line for the majority of today because that's what we saw with Cam Steele and Dan Lawrence yesterday. And the other thing we saw with Cam Steele in particular is the ball was turning. So if we could get out there today, it would be fascinating. And, and if we get a shortened day, that, that might even take the quicks out the equation and you just give the ball straight to Lyon and straight to Hartley and just let them go with men round the bat. So actually yesterday in the 80 overs that we had, it was, it was fascinating. It didn't go the way anybody expected. I think if you said to anybody yesterday, nine of the wickets will fall to spin, especially with the Surrey pace attack, which is what we've talked about before this season. They've won the championship the last two years off the back of a high quality pace attack. Yesterday, it was the spinners that did the job. And, and you and I were sort of looking forward thinking, cool, we could get a whole day of Hartley and Lyon, but we have to wait to see what happens with the weather. Um, just to pick up a few things from, from yesterday, um, the way that Lawrence and Steele uh, bowled. For Lawrence, he got a fantastic run out, but perhaps more overs than maybe he would have expected on the first day of the season. Yeah, without a doubt. And, and the other thing there is, I was looking back at how many overs he bowled for Essex last summer. He bowled eight overs in total last summer. What was it yesterday? I think he bowled 29. Uh, picked up a four for career best figures for him. A and... Surrey have spoken about this with Dan Lawrence, that, that, that he's come to Surrey to be a genuine all-rounder. And we saw that yesterday. And I thought it was a lovely bit of captaincy as well from Rory Burns to get him into a, the attack very, very early indeed. Because the other thing is, with this strong wind, and again today it's a very strong breeze, for the pacemen it's not easy. You know, whichever way you bowl, whichever end you're bowling from, you've either got it hitting your right shoulder or your left shoulder. But I thought he used the breeze really nicely. Uh, the other thing is with his action, he, he, he when he but when he gets to that point in his action, that arm is so high that actually he gets the ball to really bounce, and we saw that from him yesterday. And then the lovely thing is to have Cam still bowling leg spin from the other end. You've got one taking it away from the bat and one spinning it back into the bat, so you, you you've got the perfect combination there really. And, and, and I thought he, he, he did a brilliant job yesterday. And Cam Steele said that last night. You know, I, I know I picked up the five wickets and career best figures for me. But actually, it was what Dan Lawrence did from the other end enabled me to come on and pick up, pick up my wickets. Um, Lancashire's day, I think, basically split into two halves. It's, it started really well. Um, they got to tea in a very healthy looking position. And then the collapse post T. In the middle of all this was Josh Bahannon, who got himself a, a, an 80 odd, kind of picking up from where he left off last season. It was such a brilliant year for him last last year to finish his, the Division One's top run scorer. He got named the club's player of the year. He got his England Lions captaincy call up. He batted beautifully, didn't he, for Lancashire mm. yesterday? Oh, he is a top quality player. And, and every time I've seen him bat, he's made runs. And he, he just looks a player who knows exactly what his game is. He's in, he's in his game. I thought actually against Dan Lawrence, he played him beautifully yesterday because the couple of times he did come down the pitch to go over the top, his, his footwork was immaculate. I, th I think the other thing there is he had such a brilliant summer last summer that all you really want to do, and you said you'd spoken to him and he'd sort of put last summer in the locker and was just concentrating on this summer. All you really want to do then is get off to a good start. And, and he looked like he'd never been away, really. He was absolutely assured in everything that he did. Um, and as I say, he, he looks a player to me that knows exactly how he plays his game. He knows where his strengths are. He plays to those strengths. Um, and, and again, they, they always say, don't they, when you go up that level to international cricket, how do you play pace and how do you play spin? Seen him against pace, he can play pace. Seen him against spin, and he can play spin. So, so I think, you know, Josh Bohannon had that amazing summer last summer. I have absolutely no doubt that he'll have an amazing summer again this summer. And, you know, he's done England Lions. I, I don't think it'll be too long before he steps up another level. 
OK, so that's that's where we're at at the minute. Um, the ground staff, as they, they have done through the course of the, the, the whole winter, and indeed the first two days, are working really hard to try and get the outfield playable as quickly as possible. I think a little bit like yesterday, we're just waiting for the natural kind of elements to help us out here. We need the wind to try and help dry out the outfield and hopefully we'll get some play a little bit later on. So it's an 11.30 inspection. We'll bring you news of that inspection when we have it. Um, must remind you as well, we have an ongoing competition to win a signed Nathan Lyon shirt if the QR code's not on the screen. Now it will be at some point. So look out for the QR code and um, you have a chance to try and win a signed Nathan Lyon shirt. So the 11.30 inspection, as soon as we get some details of that, we'll let you know. Eighteen sixty-four. We were first class then, and we're first class now. With a dream to spread cricket through Lancashire's towns. Where girls and boys, with willow and leather, become more than a badge but the red rose together. A club where more than legends are made, but friendships, obsessions, moments replayed on our screens, in our minds, in our hearts forever. Cause it's who we are, our DNA, the red rose together. Statham, Briggs, Jimmy, Freddie and Joss, Jappy, Sir Clive Lloyd, Carol Hodges, Kate Cross. What a roll call. It's a hard one to measure, with future names still to be written on the red rolls together. We're all about people. It's what the red rose really means. Yeah, the ones signing autographs, but the ones behind the scenes. Our community, grassroots, the ones that feel tethered. Whether you're from here or belong here, we are the Red Rose together. And what about this place? Talk about world-class venues, internationals, gigs, events. You can choose from a menu of triumph, of disaster, of pain, or pleasure. We've seen it all at Emirates Old Trafford with the Red Rose together. Red ball, white ball, lightning and thunder. Have you ever sat back? Have you ever just wondered how far we've come? The storms we've weathered, or how far we'll go as the red rolls together. Alex, nice to see you. First things first, um, you love ice cream. Top three favourite flavours, hit me, come on. Oh, I mean, easy. Mint chocolate chip, Yeah. raspberry ripple, vanilla. How have you answered that so far? Well, it's easy. That's I'm not, ridiculous. Do you know what? I actually haven't had an ice cream for ages because I got not, got spotted as the ice cream girl from the BBC and yeah. I was like, this cannot carry on. I, no, can't be known be for, I can't be known for just eating ice cream. Um, so I've stopped eating ice cream. Now. I just went to Italy and we had gelato every day. But if you say gelato, it makes you sound super pretentious. Yeah, it does. It makes you sound posh, doesn't it? Especially then when you have pistachio and elderberry. Oh, stop. Honestly, unbelievable. <laughs> I was like, what should I have? They were like this. Also, they were like pumpkin seed. No. That's what I thought. Amazing. Is it? Yeah, maybe only in Florence. Probably don't get it in like Warrington. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to stick to the what you know. You know yeah. what's where? Strawberry, chocolate, vanilla. That one where you can Done. get only one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a good start. Mm. How did you get into cricket? 
Um, so I played football with all the lads on my estate. So I was the only girl. There was okay. probably about six or seven lads. So we all played football. One Friday night, they were like, we're going to go up to the cricket club. So I ran home. I was like, mum, mum, can I go and play cricket? She's like, no, you do everything. She's like, you do football, you do basketball, you do hockey, you do anything, everything, gymnastics, swimming. I was like, come on. She's like, no, not any, not one more spot. I was like, the bar's open. Come on, mum. She's like, right, come on, we're <laughs> going up. So <laughs> not quite like that, but yeah. So we yeah. went up every Friday night um, and I absolutely fell in love with it. So every Friday after school, I'd be up at the cricket club from as soon as we finished school, right until I got told I had to go home because it was dark. Just loved it. Now, I didn't Google you earlier, definitely did, but you went to school in Clitheroe, is that right? Yes. So did you play at school as well as at home? Yes, yeah, so I played at school uh, when all the girls in PE went to do netball. I was not very good at netball, I kept bouncing the ball and they were like, Like you oh were playing basketball? Yeah. Wanted to be Jordan? All the girls were like, oh my God, this girl's so annoying. So I, then I started playing cricket with the boys. So the girls would go and play netball and I'd say to the teachers, can I play cricket? And they'd be like, well, yeah, fine. When you started playing, was it immediate that you decided you were going to bowl left arm? Um, I guess Is that just a natural thing. Yes, I've always been left-handed, um, but yeah, picked the ball up left-handed, obviously, uh, but bowled seam, so okay. started just bowling. I want to say rapid, yeah, <laughs> but obviously it wasn't that like quick. quick. Yeah, uh, but but always batted right-handed as well, so always been ambidextrous. And you made your county debut super young. Mm. I think you were only fourteen. Yeah. How did that come about, and how did you feel? Um, do you know what? I've got no idea how I felt. I remember being really nervous. Yeah. And I remember my mum being there. And I remember her... Where was it? Do you know? got no idea. Really? Yeah, I've got Can't no remember. idea. I remember being stood at fine leg, obviously. Yeah. And my mum stood standing next to me. I was that young that my mum's like stood there being like, are you okay? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I think so. She's like, you're going to do great. Um, but it just came about because I played under 13s for Lanks girls. Okay. And then under 15s. And when I was 12 or 13, I was still playing in the under 15s team and under 17s. So just got picked for the first 11. Um. And I think, on memory, I did get two for, I did think. You? No way. Um, yeah, two for about 20, something like that. Um, and just loved it. Okay, so you started at 14, and then obviously you're playing and improving, and then you make the decision when you're, what, 19, 20, to move, I guess, down to London and play for Middlesex. Yeah. How did that come about? Um, so Lancashire were in Division 2, Yeah. and everybody that played for England at the time played Div 1 cricket. So I thought... If I'm going to play cricket for England, I've got to take a bit of a leap of faith here and, and try and play Div 1 cricket. Not going to go to Yorkshire because it's Yorkshire, obviously. Yeah. So I was like, I'm not going to there. Um, I think Warwickshire already had an overseas. Um, so it was literally pick a team out of a hat, um, any of the southern teams. Um, so I was like, right, Middlesex, no one will know who I am, what really, I do. That was it. Yeah, <laughs> that I was it. like, that one will do. Yeah. Um, just a fresh start. You know, nobody knows who I am. No one's got an opinion on what I do that I'm rubbish with the bat or in the field. I can go and just be a new version of myself. Um, so I travelled down twice a week for four years or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, but I loved my time playing for Middlesex. Like, if it wasn't for me moving down there, I genuinely don't think I'd have ever, ever played cricket for England because really? I got to be a, a new version of myself and work hard. And actually travelling down for cricket made me really focused on cricket. And I obviously met some amazing friends, yeah. which I'm still friends with now. And I've kept in touch with them all. So... Yeah, wouldn't change it for the world. Obviously, amazing. I've known you for four years or so, and your media kind of personality is you're pretty confident and outgoing and like a laugh, and you kind of say what you think, and people seemingly love that about yeah. you. Have you always been like that? When you went down to Middlesex at 1920, were you like that, or were you more reserved in, in on yourself? No, I've always been like that. Really? Literally always been like that. Um, I'm very Marmite, like... <laughs> People are, a lot of people hate me before they've met me because I'm quite boisterous and say what I think. Yeah. Um, don't hold back. I don't know where I've really got that from. My mum's a little bit like that, but I reckon I, it's not that I'm confident because I'm actually not a very confident person. I just come across confident. Um, it's just my personality. It's just who I am. Um, I guess I've always been comfortable in myself. Yeah, um, that's a good thing. So I go down and I'm... Like, hey, Alex the lad, Jack, yeah, Jack lad, the lad, lad from Manchester. Yeah, I'm talking to everyone <laughs> on the tube. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, always, literally always been the same. And on, on air, the first piece of advice I got given was be yourself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I was like, I think it massively oh, right. comes across if someone isn't their authentic self or they're disingenuous about things. Yeah, and I um, think... So eating ice cream is perfect. <laughs> doing stupid things, talking into yeah, your yeah. ice cream. Um, but no, so, you know, be yourself on the radio because otherwise... 
you're going to be sound stiff and yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. Well, I want to talk to you about that in a minute, but you mentioned something earlier about playing for England. Mm -hmm. Was that always an ambition? And then how does that feel when you get that call to say, oh, yeah, you're in the squad and you're going to make your debut? Um, yeah, it was all, always, always an ambition, but I didn't think it would ever happen because okay. at 15, I got onto the England Academy. At 17, I got dropped because I wasn't good enough. And I didn't get back on until I was 21. Right. Um, so I dropped out of college. Um, started, I was a will writer for a while. Um, really? I worked in a bakery just so that I could train. Yeah. Um, trained my arse off the train so hard. Um, I never really got anywhere. Got back in the England Academy, but was then always a net bowler for England. Mm -hmm. And I would constantly bowl 60, 70 overs a week at the England Girls and never get that call up. And Mark Robinson came to me on a Friday afternoon. He was like, I'll see you on Monday. I was like, all right, okay, like the girls need a net bowler. Like, And he was like, no, you're in the squad. I was like, pardon? Wow. Like, How old were you then? I don't know. I made my debut in 2016, so 24. Yeah. Okay, and that was against Pakistan, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but now I look back on my career and I'm like, I'm genuinely a fan that ended up playing great for England because I've always just been a massive cricket fan. Yeah. And just I used to follow England women around and watch them all Did around you? all around the country. Yeah. Um. So you make your debut in 2016, yeah. and then what? Less than 18 months later, World Cup winner. Yeah, it, it was a whirlwind, absolute yeah, right. whirlwind. So, debut June. 2016 against Pakistan. Yeah. Worst day of my cricket career Why? ever. Um, didn't enjoy it. Hated every second of it. Didn't bowl well. Why did you hate it? Were you nervous? So nervous. Yeah. Like I'd tried so hard for so long that I thought I'd just be all right when the day came. And yeah. I was too busy concentrating on, was my partner's family okay? Was my family okay? Where are they sat? I can't see them. Where are they? Really? I didn't do all my routines. I didn't right. get into the zone. I was just so like oblivious to the cricket game yeah um i think i bowled none for 50 56 maybe in 10 overs and pakistan probably only got 150 and i right. <laughs> you way. shelled a third of their runs <laughs> yeah and the first ever ball that came to me i let through my legs for four did you so it just couldn't have gone any worse like okay. it was just couldn't have gone any worse um then we went away from international cricket when that happened and it goes through your legs for four do you then massively get in your own head or, yeah. and then you can't stop thinking about it? Or were you like, that's gone, um, focus? You do go, oh, am I really good enough to be here? And then yeah. all those thoughts start coming back because I believe, always believed I was good enough to play cricket for England. I just never got the opportunity. And then I got the opportunity and I was rubbish. So I was did, like... Did mm. anyone like put their arm around you or have a quiet word or go, okay? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course, yeah. they're all your teammates. They want yeah. you to do well. You probably could see I was nervous. Yeah, um, <laughs> like a rabbit in headlights. Yeah. And then we went to the West Indies. I got picked for the West Indies after a good KSL, uh, Super League. Yeah. Um, and in the warm-up game, I did the same again. None for 80 and 10 overs. And the coach said to me, I was like, crying on the pitch. I was like, I'm just not good enough for this. Yeah. He's like, where were you a year ago? I was like, in the bakery making chicken sandwiches. He's like, where are you now? I was like, in the West Indies. Yeah. Like, you know, in Jamaica. And he's like, where would you rather be? I was like, here. He's like, We'll get on with it then. He's like, you're playing the first game, get your head around it. I mean, you don't want to make Danish pastries. What's, what's, up with what's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. I get so fat just eating cakes all the time. Um, so, yeah, that was a real mindset shift. And it was the best thing he ever said to me. He was like, you're here now. Get in the moment. You're playing the first game. Yeah. And then that tour um, broke world records and bowled really well. And that was it. I had a world win 18 months. And then in the final, mm -hmm. two wickets? Yes. Yeah. Talk me through that. Um, well, I was, I was always the wicket taker during that World Cup, so every time the game needed changing, I'd come on. Um, sorry, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, literally, one, because yeah. I'm like, what's going so on now? Confident. I'm out yeah. the team now, I'm yeah, like, yeah. this is amazing. <laughs> this, how was that me? Yeah. Um, so we needed a wicket, we needed to get home and pre core out. So I got brought back on, she hit me for two sixes. I was like, this is not going well. Um, two really nice shots down the ground, um, into the crowd, both of them. One was a slog sweep. Over square leg, and then she top edged a slog sweep and Tammy Bowman at square leg. I'm stood there, and I was like this. Please, I didn't even Tammy. watch it. Did you? I not? was like that. I just I want to just hear the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Um, then she took the catch, and the game completely changed from there. Um, I we didn't win the World Cup. India lost it, you know. But it was still the best cares? best day of my life. It was. Were amazing. the celebrations amazing afterwards? What happened, or did we not go there? Um, I drank a magnum of champagne on the lap did of honour, and I don't remember on the, the lap of honour. Yeah, I don't remember the rest. That's pretty it's impressive. Really, it's the worst thing I ever did. I re it's my biggest regret. What, because you can't remember? We after. worked for four years to sing the team song at Lords. Right. And I don't remember singing the team song at Lords. Okay. 
but yeah all I remember is Kate Cross trying to give me a chicken drum sh- drumstick and was like eat that you'll regret it and I just threw it at her no way <laughs> I was like I shut up two hours later I was in bed class mm. I woke up naked with my medal on though so I was Did like you? yeah <laughs> baby <laughs> I still got my medal <laughs> it's the greatest story I remember us talking about this before in terms of that's a pretty tricky transition time in terms of stopping playing for England yeah. and then thinking do I still want to carry on playing cricket or mm. how am I feeling about this that's that's tough and takes a lot of mental strength and resilience mm. um was that a hard period for you yeah it was like the worst because I lost my England contract I got told well, I went on holiday this is the worst thing right I had a two-week cruise with Kate Cross and we worked really hard went to the gym every day did you on the cruise on the cruise really? and ran, ran laps of the cruise and everything you weren't throwing chicken drumsticks at her <laughs> yeah, like throwing balls we were on holiday but also working hard because we had fitness testing when we got back okay Day after I got back from a holiday, I had my appraisal with Jonathan Finch and he told me I'd lost my England contract. And I was like, you could have told me two weeks ago, mate. Yeah. I've just been I'd working have, hard on I'd a holiday. Just been drinking magnums of champagne, yes. Um, but it was awful, like the, the worst feeling. Um, I rang my dad and I rang Crossy. I think I rang Crossy first, said I've lost my contract, rang my dad. They both came around to my house. And I'd just lost my identity overnight. Yeah. Um, I'd gone from Alex Hartley, a World Cup winner. So actually the newspaper article actually said... Um, World Cup winner to trash heap overnight. So what? Trash heap. Yeah. Brilliant. And that was, and that's what I felt like as well. Um, yeah. Felt like I was nobody. I had nothing to get up for. Um, I was still going to the gym with Crossy, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then there was one Friday. I was like, "What am I doing? I don't need." To... But I just that was just my routine. Yeah. Um. So then I spent three months at home, didn't get out of bed, didn't leave the house. Do you not? Um, no, I was didn't didn't know what I was or who I was going to be. Where or... were you? Were you? With your parents or no, by yourself? by myself in the flat. So my mum rang me five or six times a day and I'd be like, go away, I'm fine. Yeah, but yeah. she obviously knew I wasn't fine. Yeah. Um, I was like, I'm fine, leave me alone, leave me alone. I don't want to speak to anybody. I don't want to go out. I don't want to do anything. Um, so yeah, I had September, October, November, December basically doing absolutely nothing. Crying every day, didn't leave the house. Um, and then Mark Robinson, the England coach, was like, you need to start getting out. You need to start doing things. Um, so I joined a gym mm-hmm. and I decided to go travelling the whole thing was just changed it just did you just completely switch off from cricket and training and just yeah. relax well I don't like so I missed a bit of the story out sorry so my mum knew I wasn't alright and took me to see Connor Maynard really okay. random because right. like, I need to try and get her out of the house so I said I've got tickets to see Connor Maynard and that night I had a complete mental breakdown on my mum um, ripping my hair out eyelashes out just was Seriously? just like so stressed yeah right. um, and my mum rang the ECB and said you can't treat people like this because they hadn't even checked if I was okay. They, they just like gone right, not ours problem anymore. Like see you later. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that all got sorted. I got myself into a little bit of a better place. Um. And then I went traveling, and I just thought, well, I can live my life now because playing international cricket, you sacrifice so much. You know, I missed out on birthdays, Christmases, everything. You know, I missed yeah, yeah. My, my own twenty first birthday. Yeah. Um. So I guess it's quite freeing in a it way. was and I could I could just be who I wanted to be and sort of be a different version of myself and I was a loose cannon you know I mm-hmm. missed out on so much so I just went and, and had a good that. time yeah, I went and had a brilliant time yeah and then from LA I flew straight to Australia to commentate for the T20 World Cup before Covid did you yeah so, so had you had that lined up before you went to America no so I got a conversation when I was there being like do you fancy coming over and I was like yeah but you're gonna have to fly me from LA I'm in the states okay and they're like yeah okay that's fine we'll and fly was that your first kind of punditry commentary gig? proper gig yeah was it so I'd done bits and bobs so I'd done a few days here and there my first ever day as a radio commentator um Lanks were playing Worcester I think okay um and I was commentating with Henry Moran he's like that was a good shot Alex wasn't it and I just went and he's like you're on the radio yeah, you have yeah, to speak yeah um so yeah ebony rainford brent couldn't do australia so i got the call and went over okay um yeah and that's when covid hit and you know i did the world cup finally 2020 yeah flew home a few days later because of covid yeah and then my life changed forever after that it's in losing my england contract was the best thing that ever happened to me and then it's gone from strength to strength in terms of your media stuff obviously you got the podcast yeah two awards was that last week yeah award-winning podcast now nice yeah you can ask me what the awards were we got best cricket podcast. Okay. And so you beat Greg James and Jimmy. Have you yeah. told Jimmy yet? Have you been like? No, I've oh. not. I've not. But we are the best podcast, you know. It's okay. fine. Yeah. Um, and something about, this is really bad, but um, the best 
inclusion and diversity podcast. Yeah, I saw that. Um, which actually for me means the most because we do try and be diverse and get every and anyone on. Yeah. And we talk about really tough topics. Um, so yeah, it's amazing to be the best cricket podcast, but that one like means a little yeah, bit more yeah, to me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Who's been the best guest? Um, we had Danae Van Nierkirk just yeah, on, and yeah. she talked everything yeah, about I, losing I the that. contract. I saw the, uh, it sounds weird to say I saw it rather than heard it, but I think there was a video clip or something, Yeah, and it was pretty powerful. Yeah, it was really powerful. Um, she was brilliant. Yeah, She just spoke openly and honestly about the fact she's now retired from international cricket because she was too unfit, basically. They said, you're not going to get picked, and she was like, right, well, I'll go and play cricket around the world. Yeah, and Women's cricket's at a really funny place now where international cricketers are retiring to go and play franchise cricket um so yeah they're a bit of a, a lock ahead really with women's cricket at the minute yeah well i wanted to talk to you about that because obviously the growth is huge you played in australia mm. you've obviously played in the hundreds we've got the wpl now um i don't want to use a massive cliche in terms of saying the sky's the limit but it feels like the growth in the women's game is colossal yeah it is it's, it's been huge i honestly wish i was five years younger really because the How old are you now? 29? Nine. I've heard this shit. You've got ages. You've yeah. got ages. All the girls at Lanx are now professional cricketers. Not yeah. all of them, but most of them. And it's just credit to, you know, the women's game. You know, it's growing and growing. They've gone from Yeah, but without being massively... Um, I can't think what the right word is. Like, you and, like, the people who've come before have helped kind of yeah, set of that course. up. Of so. course. But, you know, I've... Then the hard yards are not being paid to play cricket. <laughs> yeah, sure. Paid to commentate, it's fine. Yeah, no, but it's, you know, I, it's amazing. You know, the young, you see the younger girls coming through at Lanx now and they're so athletic because they've been going yeah, to the yeah. gym since they were young. You know, I've still got the athleticism of probably a 15-year-old because I've not really been going to the gym for that long. You know, and the, the 15-year-olds that are coming through, we've got, they're fitter and stronger than I am. Um, but it, it is, it's amazing, you know, and you've got all the franchise leagues around the world kids growing up or girls growing up now sorry actually can be professional cricketers it's a yeah, job sure. opportunity yeah whereas when i was growing up it was just a hobby um so yeah it's class it's actually amazing where do you see it going in the next five ten years um probably more parity with the men so i guess as female cricketers we've always said we don't want to be paid the same because we at the minute we don't deserve to be paid the same we just want equal opportunity yeah and that's becoming more and more we are getting equal opportunity so when that starts happening all around the world because at the minute you know you've got your other countries your west indies south africa sri lanka they're all falling behind we want those teams to sort of yeah. catch up and then as soon as all teams have got equal opportunity with the men i think it can skyrocket it's great as well that loads of the women's teams now are playing rather than playing at outgrounds um playing at old trafford yeah. Um, Emirates Old Trafford. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and then obviously with the hundred with the double headers, that must be pretty cool in terms of full houses. Must make a massive difference. No disrespect to outgrounds and playing at schools and stuff, yeah. but it's it's a different vibe and setup, isn't it? Well, COVID's the best thing that happened to the hundred because the girls were actually meant to be playing as Manchester. We were meant to be playing at Sedbury School. Yeah. But because of COVID, we had to play double headers with the men, and we had to play at the same ground. Um, and it took off. It's massive. You now get 10, 12, 14,000 people coming to watch the women's game. Yeah. And then more coming to watch the men's. Also, there are loads of people now who are talking about the 100 who are like, yeah, I prefer the women's competition yeah. to the men's. I can't believe how many people now are like, oh, the 100 would be nothing without women's cricket. Yes, yeah, so many Imagine people Imagine people that. saying that five, six yeah, years ago. It yeah. wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a class competition. I absolutely love it. It's been really good to see the domestic game grow. I guess not only from the girls now being professional, um, which makes a huge difference. You know, yeah. the, the money invested, obviously we're going to get better. You know, the more contracts we have at Lanks Thunder, the better we're going to get because at the minute, I think we've got 10 contracted girls where we've got 20 in the squad. So we're expecting half the team to train full-time but without getting paid a proper wage. Luckily, we Lanks are really supported and we do get paid at, you know, per hour to be at training, but it's not okay. a full-time job. Yeah, sure. So Lanks are so supportive in that regard um but we want everyone to be pro because we're gonna just you know women's cricket is sky gonna skyrocket um yeah it's, it's been fantastic because you see how good we can be by watching the 100 and then you come back to domestic cricket and it's the same group of players but without the overseas and you think jesus christ like we've actually got so much better so quickly and the Wait, women's did you see team, that you yeah. see that development in the squad yeah. from, the, from the ksl to the last year of the 100 it's so much better 
you wow. know, because girls are training full time. It's, it's okay. like being like, I don't know, if you practice typing on a keyboard, you practice every day, you're going to, you know, you're going to be able to do it without looking within a week. It's like, well, if you train cricket every day, you obviously get better. It's like that Mavis Beacon thing. Did you ever do that in IT? We had yeah. this thing called Mavis Beacon and it used to tell you how quickly you type yeah, no. words per minute. <laughs> w, WPM. I'd be like that. You wouldn't. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's been amazing. And, and Lancashire have been so supportive of the girls. Like, we're the only team that's gone on a massive pre-season tour this year. Yeah. And you can just see how beneficial that was. You know, we, we've gone to Dubai with the boys. We played a double header against the UAE again, with the boys. So we played in the morning. They played in the afternoon. We've been in Dubai for a week, trained, you know, the same days as the lads. We've socialised. We've had golf days. We've had sponsor days. And then the girls went on to Mumbai. And went there for six days, and that was incredible within itself because I saw the pictures. It you're like on a tougher good time. wickets, you're in tougher conditions, yeah. you know. And to have that support from Lanks means a lot because we are we're setting the standard for everybody else. You know, the other teams went on pre-season tour, but they went to Desert Springs for four days and played against each other. We, you know, were playing against the state team in Mumbai. You know, it was it was unbelievable. Mm. And how are you feeling about this season? Good. We didn't get off to the best start, but we've got our bad game out of the way, I reckon. Yeah, get um, it done early. Yeah. Mm. Personally, I had a really bad game, but so did the whole team. So I'm like, oh, well. <laughs> but no. It happened. We've got the best team that we've had for years. We've recruited three really good players, um, signed three new pros. Um, so, yeah, we we are stronger than we've ever been. We look really good on paper. We look like a really strong side, but you have to still perform on the field. So we went into Saturday's game being like, We've got the best team on paper. We just didn't perform. You have to perform. Um, so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Really looking forward to the summer. I love it. You know, I'm, the girls laugh at me now. They call me a volunteer because I'm not a pro anymore. Stepped away from a pro contract and one of the other girls has got it. Yeah. So, I literally am You're only playing. You're back to being your cricket badge I enjoy it. Yeah. And I literally only play because I enjoy it. And that's credit to the girls and credit to Lanks for the environment that they've set up because if it wasn't enjoyable, I just wouldn't be playing cricket anymore. I heard you were going to get your top score this season. Yeah, well, I sort of nearly did at the weekend. Yeah? I got five, and I hit a lovely cut shot through the did covers. You? And then I got given out bold, and I still don't think it bowled me. You'll have to put it on. Um, yeah, that's put outrageous. It on. I still don't think it bowled me. How's that happened? Well, don't put the reverse angle on, because that does look like it bowled me. But the front <laughs> angle, I've covered the stumps, right. and it's hit the keeper's gloves and then gone on to the go stumps. Oh, okay. I don't think I was out. And we were going to win. We needed four a ball for the next 12 overs. Right, so you'd have done that. <laughs> I'd have done that. <laughs> Easy. Knocked him off probably in like a couple of overs. Done. Yeah, do you enjoy that role in terms of looking after the younger members of the squad? I love it. So I was captain for two years and I absolutely love being captain. Um, but stepped away from that because I'm not a trainer as much anymore because I've got a full-time job in the commentary world. So Ellie Freltel's taken over. She's brilliant. But I know I'm coming to the end of my career now. Um don't train as much as the girls you know one day someone's going to be better than I am and they're going to take my place so at training now I see it as my job to get the spinners ready to for when I'm not there so I love coaching the spinners and watching the spinners bowl and the younger girls a couple of them have really struggled this year or in the previous years and I love even though we've got Stephen Parry who's a brilliant spin coach I'm always like can I help can, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. can I jump in <laughs> um but yeah I love being a senior player and the girls you know they they do listen and they do want to learn and I, I guess you know, I have played international cricket, albeit a few years ago now, but I do, I do know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so, yeah, I love it. We are in a hard world of professional elite sport. And a warm welcome from Emirates Old Trafford. We are back again. It isn't a nice Sunday school tea party. There are no hiding places. It's another monster hit for six. I know we are good enough, but we're just not showing it on the pit. You put that support in, you put that investment in, right, start winning games. It doesn't work like that, does it? It means so much, it means so much to me, the staff and everyone in here. A few wins put together, maybe they could actually grace finals day. Oh, that's a ferocious looking shot. We don't want equal pay, we want equal opportunity. They're going to try and show a little bit of something for the investment that's been put in. The reality dawns, that is what professional sport is.
Chris, welcome back to Manchester. How was your time away on tour with your new team? Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, brilliant. Um, you know, two and a half weeks, Dubai, Bangalore, uh, facilities were great. Um, weather was, was awesome, apart from one mad day in Dubai where it was seven months of rain in one day. But Bangalore was, was, was fantastic, great facilities, uh, good opposition. Um, and we got, we got everything we needed from that, uh, from that tour. Was it a good chance to sit down with the players and, and get to know them, not only on the pitch and their performances on the pitch, but get to know them off the field as well? Yeah, very much so. I, I feel like you know, I feel really lucky that I've had a couple of opportunities to see them in a competitive environment away from away from Emirates Old Trafford and, and out on the grass. We, we went to Mumbai on a, a, a spin, sort of batting v spin development camp back in, in January. Um, and then obviously to have the whole squad, um, or the majority of the squad, those not away with England and WPL uh, available to, 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 to go on tour recently was, was great. And, uh, you know, you do see a different side to them when, when, you, when you, you know, you're living and breathing cricket then on and off the field. I guess that's just the modern era now, is that the cricket doesn't stop over the winter now. It's, it's sort of the most, most you can do is get ready and prepared for the season. Yeah, very much so. And we've, you know, we, I think we're really lucky here. We've had a, a, a blend of, of girls who've stayed the winter and done the whole winter programme. But we've also had a number playing in different franchise competitions. We've had a number away with England and England A. Uh, some have taken themselves off to play uh, uh, club cricket and get opportunities in, in, in Australia. Uh, and I think that's all valuable experience. And, and, and the more time that we can spend out on grass practicing and playing, uh, the, the better. Now, what are your plans for the season? What are your hopes in terms of achievements to bring some silverware back to Emmett's Old Trafford? I think, yeah, ultimately, we're looking to win. We're looking to win games of tri cricket. We're looking to win trophies. And we're looking for su sustained success. Um, whether that happens this year, who knows? You know, there's, there's, I always say at this time of year, there's, there's seven other teams saying exactly the same thing. And, and there's, the competition is going to be hard. So um, from our point of view, it's, it's about using the, the, the really strong preparation period that we've had this winter uh, and taking that into the first few games of the season. We've got a block of 650 over um, our HFT uh, trophy games. Um, to, to start the season off, and that's you know it's not not quite off halfway of the half of that competition. So it's a, it's a real serious block to get us started, and and we need to hit the ground running. Well, Fee Morris actually mentioned something that you said to her in terms of that we might not win every single game of cricket, but it's about enjoying every single game of cricket that we play, and and the wins will come. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I think I said yeah we, we should expect to win. We shouldn't be we shouldn't be fearful of anyone. We should go out expecting to win every game of cricket. I know we won't because that's unrealistic, but. Um, absolutely. If we're in, if we're enjoying our cricket um, and, and feeling free uh, on the pitch and free to express ourselves and, and to play play uh, a positive brand, then uh, then I'd like to think we'll uh, we'll go far. Welcome to Kanra Dubai. Here's your key. Thank you. Let me help you with the bags. Nice room. How's that? <laughs> How's that? How's that? So it's uh, inspection time. We're, we're almost at, we're exactly at 11.30. So we're, we're, we're waiting for news of an inspection which is currently taking place. The, uh, the two umpires you can see 
uh, just starting this inspection, a kind of tentative walk around the edge of the square. Here they are um, in their black, they look rather mean, don't they, in their black jackets? <laughs> like some <laughs> characters from Star Wars or something. So they're, they're creeping around the edge of the square, having a little look to see what conditions are like. Um, myself, Scott Reed, and Callum Flynn uh, up in the commentary box here. Well, we, so we kind of, well, we're just waiting for this, aren't we, Callum, basically? The frustrating thing is, it's a bit like yesterday, where it's dry, it's blue sky, it's sunny, but there's obviously still a few concerns about the parts of the outfit. Yeah, the damage has been done in the past three, four weeks, hasn't it? It's not really stopped raining at all um, since last season, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like you say, any bit of, any bit of rain will unfortunately... Um, bring it all up and, and it will take a while to go away but there's been a lot of activity from the groundsmen um, they've been cutting the square they've been on with the with the bloggers whatever they call them these days yeah um, so we are hopeful for a bit of cricket like you say it could be very similar to yesterday start around lunchtime um, one o'clock hopefully but hopefully we can get on a little bit earlier and and see some play because it is a lovely day in Manchester and we don't say that very often. We don't, do we? No. We, we were chatting about the <laughs> about the quality of the wind yesterday. It was an ideal windy, drying day, and it did seem to dry up pretty quickly. We started at ten past one yesterday, and we got eighty overs in, so we had two sessions. So we've actually got quite a lot of cricket yesterday, and the conditions are are pretty similar. And I think, as we were saying yesterday, the ground staff have done all they can. There's nothing really more they can do and it's now up to the kind of natural elements to try and dry out. But you can see on the screen there for viewers on Lanks TV that the issue is the bowler's run-ups. It's that kind of landing zone where the bowlers are putting their, their front foot down and landing heavy in, especially the seamers. Th those little areas, if it's a little so uh, soft there and you, and, you, and you can see little bits of patchy, kind of muddy, grassy area, that's it. It's a concern, isn't it? Yeah, they're your main kind of takeoff spots as well. And the first game of the season, the umpire is going to be very wary of of putting fr putting the bowlers through sort of risky conditions. Um, same with both captains; they won't want the the seamers and the spinners to be running up on on an outfield, which is pretty risky. Not not this early in the season. Um, fingers crossed; it, it can dry out. Like you say, the wind. It's blowing a gale out there. There's plenty of sheets across the pitch that mm. I don't think are meant to be positioned there. I think <laughs> they've just been blew out of control a little bit. Um, but fingers crossed the, the wind can keep doing its um, business because I think the sun's due to be out for, for most of today. Maybe a little bit of rain later on um, at the back end of the evening session. But well, fingers crossed these conditions can keep staying like this and we can, mm. we can try and get on sooner rather than later because Surrey will certainly want to but try and get in there and try and force a result out, which does look very optimistic at the moment, but but they're in a decent position with, with bowling Lancashire out for just over 200. Yeah, and because we've, we've started the match, even if you say it looks difficult to try and force a result, it's not impossible from this position, but for either side, but because we've started the match, there's bonus points at stake now, so Surrey have you know gobbled up their bowling bonus points and now want some batting points, and Lancashire fancy a few bowling bonus points themselves so the, 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 there is a degree of wanting to get out there because there are there are actual points at stake even if it goes to a to a draw yeah it'll be interesting to see how when we do get out there how sorry go out here actually because like you say with the bonus points will they just look at the forecast tomorrow which looks a bit a bit more bleak will they just look at it and go well, let's just try and bat as long as we can and just bat for bonus points mm -hmm. Um, knowing that the draw is the most likely result, or with the way Surrey play and the, the attacking players they have in this batting lineup, will they try and pile on the runs and maybe put Lancashire in later on um, tonight or early in the morning and try and try and force a result? It'll be interesting to see. I think they'll, I think they'll look to bat for their bonus points. I think, yeah, get as many bonus points as possible and and you know go on to the next the next fixture, looking searching for a result there. Um, I think that's the most likely way Surrey will go will go today. Well, you can see there the, the, the two umpires, Paul Pollard and, and Peter Hartley, and then in between them is uh, Mike Smith. He's the uh, the match referee. So the three um, officials are having a conversation between themselves, umpires Pollard, Hartley, and match official Mike Smith, and they'll uh, report back in the not-too-distant future the um, outcome of this um, 
of this inspection. Let's keep our fingers crossed that it's similar to yesterday and that we, we get some play a little bit later on this afternoon. There are games taking place uh, elsewhere across the, um, the county uh, championship uh, at Trent Bridge. We'll take a look at that one where Nottinghamshire are playing uh, Essex. So Essex are batting second time round. Sam Cook on 18 and Tom Wesley on 12. So Essex are 95 for two. And that's a lead of 55 runs over uh, Nottinghamshire. Um, Warwickshire are playing Worcestershire in uh, Division 1 as well, uh, where Warwickshire are batting, and they're 318 for 8, and they trail Worcestershire by 42. Worcestershire made 360 before being bowled out at uh, Edgebaston. So uh, they're both Division uh, 1 games. In Division 2, Middlesex are up against Glamorgan. This is this game where we saw this magnificent triple century yesterday uh, for Sam Northeast. Not a bad way to start your season, that Callum, is it? 3-3-5-9? Three, three, I eight? think most ar amateur cricketers <laughs> will take that across the year <laughs> <laughs> in their statistics. And Sam Northeast has done it on the first day in April. <laughs> I think the odds might have been pretty high for someone to, to get a triple ton in, in the first week in April in England. So Middlesex, as you, as you, you can see there, 175 for one in reply to Glamorgan's three, uh, 620 for three declared. And the other Division Two game that's started is the game between Sussex and Northamptonshire. Looks quite sunny on the south coast, um, where North are 333 for nine in their first innings against Sussex. So there are, there are some games taking place. The games between Yorkshire and Leicestershire delayed. Uh, on day three, there's still nothing at all between Derbyshire and Gloucestershire. They've not even had a toss there, not even named the teams for that game. Not a ball ball between Derbyshire and Gloucestershire so far. And that is the case again. In fact, it's close of play at Chesterley Street. Third successive day where there's been no play. Durham against Hampshire. Uh, no play possible on the uh, on the third day. So you are um, up to date with what's happening uh, elsewhere. You can just see there... Uh, the, the three three officials still in conversation there. So it's quite a lengthy chat, this, isn't it? I'm not sure what to read into this. The, 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 the three of them have had the, well, they've had the inspection, and the three of them are now still nattering away, Paul Pollard and Peter Hartley and Mike Smith, the uh, match referee. The positive thing for, for anyone watching the stream, they, they won't be able to see it, but the play, some of the players are having a hit and, mm. and loosening up in the nets a little bit, so... I don't think the word is out that they are optimistic for for a start pretty soon, and they're just waiting for the official word from the from the umpires, or if the players have just finally got a bit bored and <laughs> fancy doing a little bit of something to their own entertainment. But fingers crossed, we come to some sort of conclusion with the umpires soon, and we find out a start time. Yeah, to to, to the left of the screen, as you can see, there is where the outdoor nets are, and there are some um, there are some some players that are out there just having a net and, and uh, kind of warming up, just starting the, well, there we can see now, um, one or two of the Surrey lads having a bat. I mean, s some of it might be a combination of maybe there's a possibility, of course, we'll play today, and some of it could just be a bit of boredom. <laughs> wanting yeah. to have a net. <laughs> it's like you say, the, the pre-season um, training would have been affected as well with the weather, so it kind of still see, feels like pre-season vibes with, with how the, the past week has gone in terms of trying to get as prepared as possible for for the season so they'll be we're trying to take advantage of mu as much practice as possible um even when they're not on, out on the square playing well as you can see the uh, inspection has taken place that pr pretty lengthy conversation between the two umpires and the match referee has concluded and uh, the officials are heading back towards the uh, player and media center here to um report back to the to the respective captains about uh, about where we're at so we'll we'll stay with you hopefully we'll, we'll get this information filtered back to us reasonably quickly um, we can um, let you know the outcome of, of this um, inspection but the forecast is actually reasonably good for the afternoon so I guess you want to try and um, you know give it the best possible chance don't you yeah, unless there's been some real damage done to, like you say, where the where the ball was a taking off, because I think it was wet yesterday, wasn't it? It was quite um, borderline risky mm. yesterday in terms of how damp it was. Uh, it hasn't torn up much. It still looks in pretty good shape, Old Trafford, for, for this time of year and the weather we've had. So credit to the ground staff 
Um, but fingers crossed we can get some cricket. I think we will. Um, like you say, the rest of the day, it looks looks a good day in Manchester, and I think that's the forecast for, for the remainder of the day. I think the, the rain is hopefully going to pass us by later on as well. So we might see a fairly bit of cricket after lunch, but fingers crossed the, the umpires fancy getting out there a little bit earlier. And we had that... Um me and Church, you were chatting about it when we, we, we started the broadcast kind of uh, an hour or so ago. Had that wonderful, tantalising prospect of watching Lyon and Hartley bowl today, which we got to see in probably the most unlikely circumstances last night. It was right at the end of the day. It was windy April day in Manchester. The floodlights were on. It looked like the, the least spinner-friendly conditions and both are spinning at, <laughs> bowling at the end there, which is great. I know, like you say, thank you, Shreen. They'll be very disappointed with... with you know their first innings score and, and how they went about it but they'll take a little bit of positivity from two part-time spinners probably a bit better than part-time spinners um both took um career best figures i believe they'll take a little bit, bit of positivity of them bowling so many overs and getting a little bit out the wicket when they've got for me the best finger spinner in the world in nathan lyon and then someone like tom hartley who um has got a lot of confidence from his previous uh, winter with England in India so Lanky should be looking for them to probably bowl m the bulk of the overs mm. but, you know we're seeing across the across the country these cooker balls aren't doing too much for the seamers there's there's not many overs in the legs of the seamers across the country so um, spin is being bowled a lot more than what we probably predicted in April <laughs> yeah just a bit yeah uh, which is quite encouraging I suppose yeah um, just so the uh, match manager and uh, Lancashire's head groundsman Matt Merchant walking out to the middle there. There's the two you can see on, on screen. So they've gone out to have a little chat in the middle. Um, so, yeah, we're just still waiting to hear back from what uh, the conversation's been had downstairs. Um, the, the, the rain last night and first thing this morning was uh, uh, pretty heavy. And there was a suggestion that actually parts of the outfield, in particular those, those concerning spots by the... Uh, the bowlers' run-ups were actually a little bit wetter than they were on Friday. So, um, albeit the, the conditions are better than they were on Friday for for, for things to dry, so that, that might balance that out a little bit. Um, fingers crossed, anyway. Yeah, the pictures this morning on the Lancashire's um, X page, as they call it these days. <laughs> um, there's lots of puddles, wasn't there, in standing water on the pitch this morning. Like you say, the ground staff have done a, a terrific job. Old Trafford look still looks pretty good for for April. Um, but fingers crossed we can we can get started pretty soon because it's a beautiful day and I think Surrey would like to Surrey's batters would like to get out there and just just get going and same with the Lancashire bowlers they'll finally it's been a long winter for some of some of the lads stuck in the indoor schools and they'll they'll finally want to get out there on the square and and uh, put the practice out out onto a real match scenario yeah just a little reminder of the, uh, as to the, the state of the the game if and when we get uh, a start time for today. Lancashire uh, bowled out for 202. They actually had um, a very, very good first session. They got to T, I think, 150 for two. They're in a really healthy position, um, looking nicely set. And then uh, a, a pretty poor second session and uh, all out for uh, 202. We can see the Lancashire players coming back from the nets. Um, so they've had a, a, a net session and are making their way back over. So whether that's because we're, we're hearing about a potential idea of, uh, of starting, in maybe early afternoon, remains to be seen. So yeah, 202 all out. Josh Bannon top scoring on 84. Uh, Keaton Jennings there, that's a Lancashire captain to the right of screen. He made uh, 11. Luke Wells making 40. George Balderson making 21. And... Uh, as Callum mentioned, the spinners had an absolute field day. Dan Lawrence with um, his career best figures, four for 91. Cameron Steele's best figures are five for 25. He likes it at Old Trafford, doesn't he? He does, yeah. He, was it 100 and... Was it over 150? Got, he, got, he, oh, it just he got 100 definitely last year yeah. in the game here. He batted really well last season in the first game. Um, very similar day to this last year. It was four days of sunshine over the Easter weekend. Yeah, he made... Um, in that uh, opening game, yeah, 141 not out in the first innings. 
Yeah, he obviously quite likes playing, playing at Old Trafford. He does, doesn't he? Yeah. So he got five for 25. Um, Tom Lowe's one for 20. Kimo Roach wicketless, 11 overs for just 16 runs. Jordan Clark, 12 overs for 25. Jamie Overton, four overs for 23. And then we saw five overs for um, Rory Burns and for Dom Sibley, um, which was a pretty tricky little session to come out and bat on the floodlights. Yeah, it's not one that you, as a bat opening batsman, you kind of, you know, you're not exactly running down the steps to get out there on the pitch. You're kind of trying to take as long as possible. Um, do your pads a couple of times and try and waste a few minutes so you, you face as minimum overs as possible. Right, I've got some good news for you. We're going to start at 12.30. Um, so 45 minutes. Uh, lunch, just remind me again, lunch was due to be at uh, 1.30, we think. We'll clarify that for you for certain, but we're, we're looking at a 12.30 start. So it's going to be an hour of play and then lunch at 1.30. Um, so that's actually worked out, I'll be honest with you, Callum, an awful lot better than I thought. I was kind of thinking maybe post-lunch start. Yeah, I was I was thinking that. Similar to yesterday, I thought they would, they would maybe take a bit of an early lunch and then and then get started after lunch. But, mm. but it clearly must be a little bit better than yesterday. Clearly the ground um, drainage system is is working. And you can think you can see Nathan Lyon, the Aussie there, just... just Hud up his typical <laughs> Aussie in English conditions, covered up as much as possible. The earliest to warm up, <laughs> feeling the temperature. But yeah, I think he'll be bowling the bulk of the overs today for Lancashire. I think they'll be looking to put the emphasis on on Nathan Lyon, try and try and lead from the front. He's arguably the best spinner in the world at the moment. His performances for Australia have been so consistent over the last five six years and i think you'll enjoy the old trafford pitch it'll offer a, a little bit of variable bounce we've seen that yesterday for dan lawrence you got a few spitting out the the foot marks and i think nathan lyon with his the way he puts a top spin on the ball he'll be looking to to get a bit of purchase from this old trafford wicket right well that's um that's encouraging news then so confirmation of a, a 12 30 start lunch will be taken at 1 30 following which there will be two sessions lasting two hours and 15 minutes each so we've got quite a decent day of cricket to look forward to so we're about uh, 40 minutes or so away from the start of play on this third day we'll be back with you for that 12 30 start here on Lanks tv and on the bbc sport website <laughs> really important really to to not be afraid to, to take those opportunities and, and go as far as you can with those opportunities and think what for us is really important is that we get to do that for Lancashire cricket and the beauty of what Lancashire cricket do is they they understand the importance of cricket in India and they understand the importance of that cricket fan that, that doesn't just live in India but is Indian and what's important for us as Badger and Coombs is to support that for Lancashire cricket as well and I think what we're very proud of is that we don't just press buttons, we don't just put up cameras, we understand the technical, digital, creative opportunities that we can use with that kit to heighten the brand for Lancashire cricket in India. But because we've got such a good team in Mr Singh and his lads, uh, it's been an absolute breeze for us. And, uh, and sharing that culture with them here and that experience here in, 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 in Bangalore with, with them has been brilliant. been very tired and we've all worked really hard to get the best out of what we've been trying to work on here. The opportunity that's come with this project, it has honestly been such a great experience and opportunity to be able to work on and engineer a production like this. To, to this scale and the, this calibre, it's, it's crazy to think that it's something that I've done. <laughs> Everyone's been great, everyone's smiley, even at a, a, an unearthly hour that we, we all get here, and especially the Badger and Coombs team who, who do far more than I do. I just wander in here and 
chat about the cricket. Everybody behind the scenes is putting in the work and the skill to get this broadcast to, to, to what it is. So, um, yeah, as ever, there's lots of smiley faces behind the scenes, which makes it a pleasure to come in and, and, and work. This is a big deal for Badgers because it's a huge scale production. A lot of work has gone in over the last couple of weeks working with um, Colin and the team at Badger and Coombs. And so, yeah, there's been uh, quite a lot of hard days, sleepless nights, trying to get everything sorted. And this is quite pioneering from the production company, Badger and Coombs. And they are a very, very professional outfit. Take it from me, I've worked with all of them. Over in Bangalore, there's been five days of games. We've had a double-headed T20, a 50-over women's match, and a three-day men's game. Pre-season tours have traditionally been very difficult for fans to access. But now, by being able to see the matches live, the fans are brought ever closer to what their players are doing in the run-up to the domestic summer. Good morning and a very warm welcome to Lanx TV. a challenge to doing a live stream 5,000 plus miles away from Emirates Old Trafford to save on costs and to save on logistics and things like that. We opted for getting in touch with a local production company who have all the kit and then myself and Katie we flew out our remote production kit. We thought let's try and get all this into one Peli case um, and, and kind of pack it up in such a way that the whole of the remote production fits inside that pelly case. Using the Stream Hub's talkback system, um, me and Colin would be engineering things on both ends. Um, is your, if you can take a look at RX2 for us, mate, and just double check the sims. Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing what you're talking about. I never would have expected to be out in Bangalore, India, on tour with uh, Lancashire Cricket. If you'd have told me that years ago, I wouldn't have believed you. I never would have thought that Lancashire would fly me out here to direct for them. That's just an incredible experience to have. I feel very privileged that myself and the company have got that, that relationship with Lancashire Cricket where they have that trust in us and we have that trust in them. Typically in industry, it takes a lot of years to kind of work your way up. So the opportunities I've had at Badger and Coombs to try different roles and learn on the job and progress up through the different stages has been phenomenal. And uh, yeah, it's amazing. It's a great opportunity to be able to broadcast our pre-season tour games live from Emirates Old Trafford, but also live from Bangalore. It's just a great opportunity for us to grow the Lancashire cricket brand, both in India, in England and across the world. And we're just trying to grow the love of the, the game um, and grow the Red Rose brand as much as we can. I think the sky's the limit. I think, I think you guys are so innovative and, and what you come up with and, and we're happy to play along. and. And it, it gives us a gives us a great insight to, to, to what you do and, and how the and how that's that stuff works. Oh great effort Asp! Get in, get in! Finish off! Everybody's bought into this different way of, of, of consuming the content. No no task has been too great. We've challenged us as well and try and make us push on and be the best we can be. You're always coming up with ideas, you know, like today, the example with George Bell. We got him mic'd up and you know the first over they go out there we take a wicket and, and belly gives us the commentary and george what are you in these pre-season games is it just about just trying to find a, a little bit of rhythm when you're a bowler with a batter just ju just get back into the groove of it all yeah i think so i think there's definitely a part of that obviously you want to get back into the swing of things and you want to um, find your way back into the season basically but also there is a big focus on wanting to still play the game win the game you know that's an insight that not many cricket fans get you don't see that on many streams so I think with with sort of your brain power and your creative thinking and our cricket knowledge we, we've made a really good team together I think what we've tried to do is, is sort of show the the nuances of the game in a different way and, and bring it to the audience, you know, bring what's happening out on the pitch to, to the audience, you know, get the players more involved and, and just innovate as much as we can. And I think the Badger and Coombs Lancashire Cricket collaboration has really gone a long way to that. And, and for the county game and the game in general, that can only be a good thing if everyone is, is singing off the same hinge sheet. The, the director 
is most important because she is looking at all these cameras and out in Bengaluru there will be maybe six or eight cameras. This is where I sit uh, during a match. Um, up on the balcony, just outside the changing rooms as well, here, here in Bangalore. Uh, if you come with me quickly, I'll show you where our camera positions are. We're working with a team from India who, who are looking after the camera work and things like that. We've got Katie directing downstairs, which we'll go and show. I'll go and take a little walk down there now. But as you can see, great camera locations, great views. If you'd like to follow me down the stairs. So look, let me introduce you to all the guys from our uh, Indian Badger team who are amazing. <laughs> And this is where Katie is. Again, we've got returns coming down from the UK. And where we spoke to you before, we've got our two Air 320s, the returns. So coming through the internet here and here, and then Katie has her talk back. Lib and Frankie sort this sort of things out. She's just having a, a cup of coffee, so she'll be on next. So going back over here, I've no idea what that lad does. What's he doing here? Checking pictures. He's checking some pic. Good lad, that's the way. So let's get back to the engineers. See, I've, I've always wanted, it's dangerous to let me loose in anything like this. Look at all these here, come down here, Arthur. Look at all these, I wonder what these do. They don't seem to be bothering them, do they? I'll tell you what will bother them. I'll take this plug out. So I've just nipped out to the hotel garden actually just to take a couple of minutes to explain a little bit about why Badger and Coombs are here in India with Lancashire cricket and the importance of what we do as a, as a company we're not just a TV production company we're not just pointing cameras and all that kind of thing we're actually a more of a digital creative consultancy as well we're quite lucky in the vast range of skill sets that we have at Badger and Coombs and what that does is it gives us the ability to advise clients about digital growth strategies, especially when it comes to engaging brands and brands engaging audiences. We get to have conversations about let's put a microphone on a player and bring a fan in from home on the other side of the world to talk to that player or this is how we can look at creating user generated content and bringing the audience into the broadcast and how can we get the audience to feel like they have control over the narrative of a broadcast for example what that does is it engages that audience member in a way that they feel connected better to the brand. We're really fortunate at Badger and Coombs to have Lancashire Cricket as a client. It's, they're fantastic and they're really invested in our success just as much as we're invested in theirs. And they believe in what we believe in and they believe that we can bring that great, hard-working talent to the Emirates Old Trafford cricket brand and just recently and very recently Lanx TV has launched a 24 hour 7 day a week television channel in India on the Geo platform so it's us that have been able to help them facilitate that. That's a massive step for a, a cricket club in, in the UK uh, to do that and, and Badger and Coombs are incredibly proud to be behind that and to give the confidence for the chief executive and the team of Lancashire cricket the, the confidence to take that step. So we've done that because we've constantly advised them on the technology and the things that we can do. They've seen it firsthand that we don't just point cameras, we don't just hit buttons, we do a lot more than that and we are continuing to do that. So uh, yeah, if you're interested, uh, you should get in touch with us at Badger and Coombs. I think for the overall outcome of the project, I think everyone's been really happy with it and I think we're all very proud, honestly. Take people for what they are, you obviously you, you welcome everyone in and then if they're just as welcoming and think a, a good development and a relationship, you, you get a nice bond and I think that's exactly what we have got. All your guys are uh, brilliant to work with, you not in the way at all or anything like that. It's just a, a brilliant relationship that's that's kept growing and growing and we, we, we're happy to have you all around and hopefully vice versa. And they're all young and they're all ambitious and they do it right. And I'm an old stager now, uh, but it, it, it brings the youth out in me when I'm around all these young people watching what they do technically and I, for one, I can tell you, it's mind-boggling.
Lancashire for 10 years has become an adopted Lancastrian and had a wonderful international career with Pakistan. Wazim Akram, welcome along. Welcome, Thank you, Old. Welcome back to em Emirates Old Trafford. Does it still feel a little bit special when you come back of to, course it does. to Manchester? When I was parking my car, so a lot of memories came rushing back. The playing days, obviously the ground has changed a lot for better. But yeah, uh, every time I come here, I, last time I was here about three years ago, when there was a COVID test, so yes, we were in yes. a bubble in the hotel. Yeah. But over and all, uh, playing for Lancashire has been the highlight of my cricketing career. You know, I, I'm writing my book. It's almost ready. It'll be out in November. Okay. So a lot of uh, positive stuff of Lancashire. For me, playing for Pakistan and coming to Lancashire was like a little oasis. Everything was comfortable. You guys just played cricket. And we had three senior players, Paul Allett, <laughs> Michael Watkinson, and Graham Fowler. <laughs> they used to have make fun of all the junior players. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. It was a tough school at times, I it agree. Was. But I, it, <coughs> it's great that you... Uh, hold Lancashire in such reverence and, and, and uh, such esteem. But tell us a little bit about where, how you came to, to come to Lancashire in the first place, because you were a very raw international cricketer in, in the late 80s and 88. Yeah. You, you hadn't much experience of, of Western culture. None. Uh, I don't think you had much experience of playing over here at all, had you? Not at all. I think in 86, uh, the great Imran sent me to play league cricket up north in mm. Durham. Okay. I played for uh, a club called Burnup Field. Yeah. Uh, boundary was about 25 yards okay. one side. And uh, it was tough for me, you know, uh, as, as a, a kid from Pakistan coming to this weather and this country. But the idea was 87, we were touring. So just get the idea how the wickets work, mm. how the weather works. So I enjoyed it. We used to end up every night at that nightclub on, <laughs> you know, on the Newcastle River. On, <laughs> on a the ship. Tyne, the River Tyne. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I bet and the fog on the Tyne was And then, yours. yes, coming back to your question, uh, 87, I think, or 88, 87, we were playing in Sharjah. Yeah. And Neil Fair brother was playing for England. He got picked up. And Laurie Brown, a physio, great guy, one of the best physios I worked with, great yeah. human being too. They got hold of me there. Would you like to play for Lancashire? And remember those days, Lancashire uh, county cricket was, you got to be number one player in the world. Mm. Only one overseas was allowed to play in playing 11 and you can only register two. That's right. So I thought they were talking about Lancashire League. I said, yeah, sure, I'm ready for Lancashire League. They said, no, no, county. I said, really? So yeah, that was my first experience that I found out. And did you, you knew nothing <coughs> about county cricket, presumably? No idea. None. Nothing about it? Nothing about county cricket. I only read about it in Urdu magazines, cricketing Urdu magazines, that's how it works. But uh, when I arrived here, I remember in 1988, uh, but before that, in 87, there was a test match here at, uh, at Old Trafford. And uh, our chairman, Bob Bennett, at the time, he, uh, the Lancashire uh, think tank, they got my family here. Yeah for my birthday surprise. They called everyone, my two brothers, my younger sister, my dad and mom, to, to celebrate my birthday here. I think it was on 4th of June, if I uh, remember correctly. But that was the first experience of me of, uh, you know, Lancastrian hospitality. So the club embraced you right from the word go, and yeah, you in turn embraced the club. It was <coughs> actually David Hughes and Alan Ormrod who were running the cricket department at the time, and yeah. they must have been the two that um, instigated your, your first appearances for Yes, for probably. And I remember uh, uh, they has, uh, both of them, David Hughes, Yosa and Alan, mm. has been a great influence early on as a 20-year-old kid com coming from a different culture altogether and mixing up with, you know, Western culture. And they, hel they really helped me a lot. Remember the first time we met, um, we was a Forte Post House in Nottingham. That hotel on the first floor. Yes. And uh, Alan told me to come to team meeting at six o'clock in the evening, day before the game. I said, "Okay." He said, "It's in the bar." <laughs> okay. I said, "That's different." Yes. <laughs> I come from. Yeah. yeah. You're not 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 a drinking culture. You're exactly. <laughs> but again, uh, you guys. The minute I arrived, walked into that uh, wine at at the bar, you guys all shook hand and said, "Welcome to Lancashire." So that gave me a bit of confidence. And remember, the next day there was a game against Nottingham. And I was sitting in the corner, right somewhere, because huge seniors, I think, I don't know if it still happens or not, the senior players, they have their certain spots in each dressing room and they go and sit there. Mm. So you as a junior, <laughs> junior, you have to wait that everybody is comfortable, then you pick up your spot, if you get a spot. I've been, I remember wandering into a dressing room and somebody, it probably wasn't you, I'd have, 
uh, was sitting in where I normally change. I said, listen, yeah. I've been changing I think it was 15 me. years. I think it was yeah, me. Well, <laughs> I, I would let you off. But that's a good culture, though. Yeah, I suppose it, uh, I suppose it, uh, I suppose it is in a way, although it might be a bit outmoded now. Yeah, no, probably. Now then, your, your um, rise and uh, appearance in, in cricket f was quite extraordinary because you played very little first-class cricket, if any, in Pakistan. None. And you turned up and bowled at the, at the nets. Um, yeah, I, it was a, a camp. Of a Pakistan, Pakistan camp. It was a camp for 100 kids, young kids, and I did, uh, you know, well for my club, uh, Ludhiana Jimkhana in Pakistan. So they, uh, you know, said this guy is good. So they go, my name was in that uh, in particular camp. And uh, uh, I remember first four days, mm -hmm. there were 100 kids, and including Ramiz Raja, who played a test cricket oh, by yeah. then, one test, and Mohsin Kamal, another test cricket cricketer, and top first class performers were there as well. So though nobody gave me the cricket ball to bowl, so I got a bit down, depressed. So I went back to my captain in the club, Sadiq Khan. I said, look, there's no point in me going. I've been standing there for four days. He said, no, no, you go tomorrow. I'll have a word with the camp commander, and he'll give you the ball. So the next day, three or four batters to go. He gave me the old ball. I impressed him for some odd reason. Aga Sadat Ali, another late test cricketer. And then the next day, he gave me the new cherry. And you see, I used to bowl big in-swingers then. And I troubled almost every to the right hander. To the right hander. Good ball from a <laughs> left arm quick. Good ball. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I impressed everyone there. And then Javed Miandad was the captain of Pakistan yeah. squad. So he came to practice. So Qadhafi Stadium is a huge ground. Yeah, yeah. So one side was our camp and his net was the other side. So he wanted some bowlers. So the camp commander said, you want to bowl at Javed Miandad? I said, what? Javed Miandad? I had a poster of him in my room. I would love to. Well, one of the best, one of the best Pakistan batsmen ever. Ever, ever. Uh, and one of the best in the world. In the world. So, I went to bowl at him for a couple of days and he got impressed by me and then New Zealand was touring Pakistan and suddenly my name came in uh, to play against New Zealand team, uh, first three-day game, President 11 versus the New Zealand side in Rawalpindi. I was over the wound, so was my family. Right. Javed Miyadad, Sarfaraz Nawaz, Tahir Nakash, all these tests, Ramiz Raja, Salim Malik, all these guys were in the squad. And Javed dropped, I think, Tahir Nakash or Sir Faraz to have me in playing 11. That was my first first class game. How, how on earth did you feel playing international cricket from straight out of club cricket? How yeah. on earth? Because that would, um, that would, uh, well, it, it would cause issues for, for an awful lot of guys when you were 17, 18? I was 17. 17. Yeah. 18. So how did you feel? I, I probably think probably too young to I even bother I was too young it. to even bother about Absolutely spot yeah. on. It was a blessing in disguise. I didn't know probably half the team of New Zealand. I knew Martin Crow, Jeff Crow, uh, Jeff Harbour, John Reed, Jeremy Corning. The big names there, you know, yeah, cricketing. Yeah. And they were and a good team. Good, great time. team at the time. Yeah. So I got seven for 50 in first innings. I don't know how. And second inning, two for 50. I was just running in and ball. And well, I, I know didn't know at the reverse swing at the time. But it was just happening. I know how. How? <laughs> because you're a good bowler. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, were you, as qu were you quick? And, and presumably you were raw then. As you I was say, raw. I you say I don't know how, but you did swing the ball. You swung the new ball. But, and but you, had this, you, you had this very, yeah, very remember quick that arm. Pindi wicket was like a, like a road. Mm. You know how Pakistani, flat, 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 no, flat no grass, no bounce. But uh, uh, I've got, uh, I think before lunch, I got John Wright caught, caught in second slip. And then from there onwards, just everybody walked in. I would just start bowling full and everybody was getting leg before the bowled. So yeah, I think I was too young and naive. It was a blessing in disguise that I didn't know who the players were. And yeah, and you didn't have time to worry about it, no. presumably. So, so um, what about your development then? Because you, you're <coughs> set into the world stage straight away. Yeah. Uh, and you've got this natural, raw talent. Were you allowed just to carry on doing that? Or was there some um, pressure on you to, to change what you were doing? Oh, there was no pressure. I had very good mentors in Javed Miyadad yeah. and then Mudassar Nazar, who still oh, yeah. lives in Manchester. He does, yeah. Well travelled Cheshire, person uh, in Manassa, yeah. yeah, well travelled, who also helped me off the field. And then that was on New Zealand tour. And then Imran was joining us. He was playing for New South Wales. Mm -hmm. So he was joining us. We were, then we were meant to tour to 
uh, go to tour uh, for to Australia for mini World Cup in 1985, mm. where India I think won eventually. India Pakistan went the finals. So I played. I think my first game was against Windies or against Australia, and I got five for 21, first top five wickets. Again, just bowling full, not no control of the swing. That I learned eventually. But in the beginning, just come and bowl and hit the right areas, and that's what I did. And Imran was standing at mid-on, you know, telling me on every delivery what to do. So that, as a young kid, was a huge confidence. My hero was telling me what mm. to do, and I, I listened to everything he wanted me to do. And I think that's how I, I sort of got into the groove of test cricket. Was, was Imran a, a good teacher, a good mentor? Did he allow you to develop naturally? Yes. Or was he, was he dictatorial? No. He, he was very easy, whatever I'm comfortable with. But he always, he always wanted me to work hard when I was eight, 17, 18. Mm. You know, those were the tra trades I've learned from him, me and that Mudassar, that, you know, talent can stay for two, three years and the hard work can prolong that talent for another, say, 20 years, 15 mm. years. Mm. And I think that's where I have to come back to Lancashire. Uh, when I played in 88, I remember getting my first 100 here, first class 100. And in 89, I became the number one player in the world. Mm. That one six months of county cricket, playing with you guys day in, day out, traveling. And you guys were very helpful. You were helpful as a bowler, our captain, I, Yoza. <laughs> I don't know. It's, a very, it's <coughs> probably the best compliment that anybody's ever paid me to say, for you to say that I helped you with your bowling. Um, uh, but I'm flattered. I do remember um, giving you... Uh, a real kick up the backside once when you came off because you said your nose was running and you didn't feel very well. Yeah, Tunbridge I remember. Wells, do you remember? Yes, I remember. Uh, I remember that game as well, Tunbridge uh, Wales. Don't want I to said, play there anymore. <laughs> no, I never uh, liked it there. So I said, come on, this is hard work. Bowling is hard work. Yeah, I remember. So you have to bowl even though you might not be feeling great, you might not be bowling great. So that might have been a lesson. Probably. I think a tough love sometimes works. Yeah, yeah. And I'm glad you did that. It, it helped me. And you see, the whole team was behind me, the captain, the club. Yeah. I, I remember they would put me in this hotel. It's still there or not. Trafford Hotel? Just oh, the down the road. Yeah. Down the road. Well, Bob Bennett used to, the chairman used to stay there. Yeah, didn't so he? they gave me a no, room. No, I don't there. think he's still there now. Nah. But it was all right at the it time. It was okay. So I, w I went, uh, so we went to play away games. Uh, we were away for about two weeks, two and a half weeks. I yeah. came back. They checked out. They checked me out. I couldn't find my clothes. I said, where are my clothes? They said, we checked you out. I thought you're not coming back. <laughs> so we had some great stories. But again, when I bought my place uh, here uh, at the time, I remember I must uh, give compliment to this uh, Pakistani uh, uh, Sufi Sadiq. He's still around. Mm. Uh, accountant, he says, I'll help you with your accounts and all. Mm. Uh, I said, I need to, I said, ask Lancashire. He said, you buy a house. I said, buy a house? I'm 20 years old. I have no money. What do you mean buy a house? So get a mortgage. I said, what's mortgage? Mm. Then he explained, you have six-year contract. So Lancashire gave me a six-year contract. First time any overseas yeah, yeah. player got such a long contract. Yeah. So that shows the shrewdness of the skipper, Yoza, and of course, Alan, that they realized this guy can actually... Well, those, those were the golden days of, of uh, uh, county cricket being yeah. able to sign overseas players long term because now of course there's so much cricket you, you, you can't can sign it. somebody for two weeks but and you, like, you were available for us virtually all the time except when Pakistan were touring England. yeah and because there was no there, there was there was cricket was not all year round mm. it was only Pakistan season from, from September October onwards till March That's right. and then county started from April onward till August September okay so county cricket was uh, essential in your formative years yes it, when because you're such a pioneer and because you are one of the best bowlers there's ever been with the, the, the record, you've got over 900 international wickets across one-day internationals and test matches, 400, over 400 in test matches, over 500 in one-day internationals. Um, it wasn't all about just running in and bowling fast. You pioneered uh, the ability to reverse swing the ball, which is yeah. now, which is now and if you remember, I wouldn't say it's commonplace, but it, 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 it's a fundamental part of the modern game. Yeah, it really is. Now it's called reverse swing. It used to be ball tampering then, mm. if you remember. Well, <laughs> so they said. But you used to throw me the ball when you yeah. were bowling at the other end. I couldn't swing it. Yeah. You used to bowl without swing. Then suddenly the ball is going towards yeah, the next side. Bit, a little bit. And then eventually you got the hang of it. You said, yeah. okay, if it's going in, I'm going to just pitch outside off stump. Yeah. And I remember the first year when there was used to be rain, I used to take Gehan Mendes yes. at Nets. Yes. And you got me, uh, Walter, Paul got me on the side and said, Vaz, listen, I know you young, <laughs> there's six months to go. 
<laughs> yeah. So just take it easy. Because you used to roar in, didn't you? In the yeah. Nets. Nobody wanted to face you in the nets because you were you were unplayable. But I think nowadays, obviously, mindset has changed. Mm. The more you bowl, you know, a lot of youngsters ask me, how should I increase my pace? What to do? It's a very simple answer. The more you bowl, the quicker you'll become because mm. your bowling muscle gets strong. And bowling muscle is not just one particular muscle. It's everything in your body. Mm. And I think nowadays you bowl six, uh, six deliveries, eight deliveries, and say 12 deliveries, say, okay, I'm done. Okay, thank you very much. Mm. So probably cricket is too much, but mindset has changed over the years, sure. But reverse swing didn't just happen. Uh, no, you, must have, you, you must have developed this in, uh, in line with, with Wakar, probably. Um, Wakar came a little and later. Imran, Imran. Imran was Budassar the one. Budassar and Imran. Yeah. They were the one who actually taught me how to reverse swing. And I remember you being um, absolutely paranoid about keeping the ball dry when yeah. we were out there. The rough side. Just keep it dry. Keep it dry. Don't Do not spit shine. on it. Don't, yeah. don't put sweat on it. Especially dry. the rough side. Yeah, yeah. And I remember our spinner, good, very good spinner, Gary Yates. Yes. He used to bowl like this. Yes, he did. And I had to go at him three, four <laughs> times. I said, you better change your habit, buddy. Because the rough side, if it gets soft, then it won't reverse. The rough no. side has to be rough and shiny side has to be shiny. And we had, a, 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 at Lancashire, we had a wonderful 10 years when you were oh, 88 incredible. to 98. We won all those one day, uh, one day games. And you, you were actually uh, a constant in that team, but there were actually two teams because the old guard, like myself, Graham Fowler, Guillaume Mendes, moved on in about 91, 92. Yes. And then you had uh, another crop of lads with the Avertons and the Fair, well, Fairbrother was there as well. As well. Um, Crawley. Peter Marin uh, came in. Chapel, Peter, Peter Martin Peter came Martin, in. Chappie came in a little later. Then Bumble, Junior mm. Bumble. Ian Austin, the great mm. man. Yeah. Uh, what, a, what a performer he had been for Lancashire in shorter format. Who was who was the, the, the guys that stuck out most for you in, in Lancashire? Who were, the, who, were mean, the, who were the guys that you really... Um, I'm admired still, or got on with or whatever. I mean, you guys were seniors. I had always admired you as a, as a senior player. But of course, Harvey Neil Fairbrother is a very good friend of mine. Still, we are in touch. Ian Austin was I was very close to. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe he's got a bar now in uh, wherever he's I living. Th beautiful I think wine he, bar. I think he yes, he has. Yeah, and he's a granddad. He's, he is, and he yeah. sells beer as well. Oh, on top brilliant. of brilliant. Which he was always destined to <laughs> destined do. Destined to do, absolutely. <laughs> no, but all the, everyone, I mean, it's difficult to name any, but everyone was so helpful. Yeah. And it was fun for me to coming to Lancashire. It was like coming back home, no, no political thing, no politics in cricket. You come, you play, you go home, you have a good laugh, and the next day you start again. You said earlier on, um, right at the start of this, this was your happiest time. Yeah. When you were here, when you were playing here, you probably felt the pressure was off a little bit and you enjoyed... Uh, playing in county cricket, but surely winning the World Cup in '92 must have been the pinnacle. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think for every sportsman, sportsman is basically ideas to represent your, uh, you know, your, your country's team in a World Cup and then winning it, and then of course being man of the match, and that too against the mighty England side at the mm. time. They were the most experienced team in the world, mm. uh, as far as one day cricket concerned. But yeah, that was uh, one of the best moments. In fact, the best moment of my life. What did it feel like? Um, because there was it, th this aura about you. I remember standing next to Warren Hegg at Slip. Uh, Warren was... Yeah, Warren I forgot was keeping, his name, yeah. Yeah, Warren keeping wicket to you. And he must have been, he must have been one of the best keepers you ever bowled. Absolutely. I, don't think, I can't remember him dropping a catch off you. No, and very you bowled, rare. You bowled 90 miles an hour and, and swung it and hooped it round He was corners. one of the best keepers, I think, who kept uh, uh, mm. uh, uh, on my bowling. He was phenomenal and a great and, and, and a great guy as well off yeah, the field. Yeah, Still, he's very he helpful, is. very easygoing, hard worker. But getting back to you, you had this aura about you, and I I know standing at slip, twenty yards back, yeah. watching you run in, there was a there was a fear and a trepidation in the batsmen facing you because they didn't know whether that you were going to hit them on the toe or on the nose. On the nose. I think that's what I've learned in country cricket. Uh, that's why the experience matters. Playing in under different condition matters, and and every ground is different in England. Mm. The weather is always nice. Mm. It's not. I mean, if it's 20, 26 degrees in England, you say it's a heat wave. No, it's not. Yeah. Heat wave is in <laughs> Pakistan right now. It's forty one degrees. 40. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. 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 So that that also helped. And remember, we used to have a a, a playing deck as well. And the next deck uh, next was pitch each side used to be dry as well without the grass that boys can throw one bounce as well yeah. because the reverse swing so that helped a lot as well I think yes. every 
if I mean even in my book is coming out in November, the Lancashire uh, stories are quite funny and and uh, uh, memorable and happy times. Brian Lara, Ricky Ponting, um, and Viv Richards have all gone on record to say that you were the the best bowler they ever faced. Wow. That's pretty serious. That's uh, that, that that's huge coming from the greats of the game. Yeah. And I think uh, it was because of my quick arm action, maybe. And you my were very difficult to pick up. Yeah. You had this scampering run. And I learned quick run. And I learned things as well. I was the only left-hander who went around the wicket, if you remember. Well, you started this. Yeah, I started this trend. You did. And I used to run. Uh, I used to run behind from behind the umpire. The umpire. Mm. I said, why not? And now leap out. Yeah, nowadays I see bowlers, even T20 format, they're getting hammered every ball. They don't change anything. No. So as a bowler, what's my job is to create a doubt in batsman's mind. Mm. If things are not going well, just have your run of diagonal. Di di diagonal. Mm. Just bowl the same delivery you want mm. to, mm. but do something different. But you were capable of bowling round the wicket and swinging the ball <coughs> away from the right hand. Yeah. Very difficult thing to do with a left, as a left arm bowler. I think uh, uh, both of these guys... Pass. Yeah, but I mean, nowadays, uh, uh, Shaheen Afridi yes. and then Mitchell Stark, yes. Trent Bolt. Yes, yeah. These you guys were the are pioneer. Yeah, I started bowling around the wicket, different angle altogether. And as a right-hander batsman, you if I'm bowling around the wicket, if you're batting, you have to, with the angle, you think ball's going to come in. Yeah. And if it just strays, it goes across a bit every time, every chance to take an edge. Uh, well, as we could talk for hours, um, and, and hopefully you'll come back and we'll do part two of this sure. at some point. But sure. just before we go... I talked about the batters who said you were the best. Who was the hardest batsman to bowl at? You see, York? I played against uh, uh, great Viv Richards, Brian Lara, Sachin Tendulkar, Alan Border, Graham Gooch, Mike Gatting, Alex Stewart. These are the big names. But I think one of the best was who played against uh, me and Bakar against Worcester. It's really important, really, to to not be afraid to, to take those opportunities and, and go as far as you can with those opportunities. And I think what for us is really important is that we get to do that for Lancashire cricket. And the beauty of what Lancashire cricket do is they they understand the importance of cricket in India and they understand the importance of that cricket fan that, that doesn't just live in India but is Indian. What's important for us as Badger and Coombs is to support that for Lancashire cricket as well. And I think. What we're very proud of is that we don't just press buttons, we don't just put up cameras, we understand the technical, digital, creative opportunities that we can use with that kit to heighten the brand for Lancashire cricket in India. But because we've got such a good team in Mr Singh and his lads, uh, it's been an absolute breeze for us. And, uh, and sharing that culture with them here and that experience here in, 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 in Bangalore with, with them has been brilliant. Been very tired and we've all worked really hard to get the best out of what we've been trying to work on here. The opportunity that's come with this project, it has honestly been such a great experience and opportunity to be able to work on and engineer a production like this. To, to this scale and the, this calibre, it's, it's crazy to think that it's something that I've done. <laughs> Everyone's been great, everyone's smiley, even at a, a, an unearthly hour that we, we all get here, and especially the Badger and Coombs team who, who do far more than I do. I just wander in here and chat about the cricket. Everybody behind the scenes is putting in the work and the skill to get this broadcast to, to, to what it is. So, um, yeah, as ever, there's lots of smiley faces behind the scenes, which makes it a pleasure to come in and, and and more. So, 12.30 start, 
fingers crossed. <laughs> we have just caught the, the very edge of a of a shower, which has uh, has, has blown through um, just the the very edge of it, and some kind of light drizzle was falling. So the ground staff, as you can see, have, have put the covers back on, or the the, the pitch cover back on. They've not dragged out the main uh, tarpaulin sheets or anything like that. And the the two not out batters there, Rory Burns and Dom Sibley. Um, are waiting to resume with uh, Surrey 11 without loss in reply to Lancashire's 202 all out. And it looks like we're going to start under floodlights as well. We ended under floodlights last night and because of some cloud cover around, the floodlights are already uh, flickering on and um, we just heard the sound of the bell. So that's good news. It, I think we just got a little bit unlucky with that little, that little shower blowing through. Um, and the umpires are heading down. We've got an hour of play, Mark Church. Something to look forward to. Well, it is, and, and, and thank goodness for that, because this is nicely set up with the, the cricket that we saw yesterday. Fascinating day. Yesterday, of course, Lancashire being stuck in by Surrey. At Ten past one yesterday, and 202 all out they were yesterday. And Cameron Steele with his five for 25. Dan Lawrence, four for 91. Josh Bohannon played beautifully for his 84. Mm. It meant Surrey had to go out there for five overs last night with Burns and Sibley. And we saw a bit of Nathan Lyon and one over of young Mr. Hartley. So it's going to be very interesting to see how Lancashire go about this today. There wasn't a lot there for the seamers yesterday, was there? A and if we can get in the 80 overs today, I think we'll see a lot of spin <laughs> from Lancashire. And that's a good thing in the shape of Lyon and Hartley because we were discussing this yesterday that there was a lot of talk, can those two play together? Yes, they can. And we, we, we're hoping that we're going to see them together bowling a lot of overs today. So let's keep our fingers crossed with the weather. The hovel cover is coming off now. We are going to get underway at 12.30. And if, if we could get those 80 overs in, we'd be in a very interesting position come stumps this evening. I, again, with Surrey, it will be very interesting to see how they go about it with the bat uh, in, the, in this, this third day's play. Uh, the way they normally go about it is, is, is they're pretty positive. But I, I think, obviously, this morning or this afternoon, as we are now, um, it, it's never easy up top, just five overs. So still a, a pretty new kookaburra to go with but i would expect lying into the attack pretty sharpish the um uh, play uh, condition playing conditions today uh, are as follows all being well without any rain as um, the hover cover is just about found its uh, position down below us here and um, we've got lunch until one th uh, playing in this first session till 1 30 so lunch at 1 30 and then um we're back underway uh, from 10 past 2 until 10 past 4 and then tea from 10 past 4 till uh, half past 4 and then the third session from 4.30 until 6.30. So an hour this morning um, in the first session and then two two-hour sessions to follow with 80 overs um, is how it's hopefully going to work out and that's obviously all subject to weather and there's, there is without doubt the possibility that we might see a shower because they're all they're blowing in and around the area some will catch us some will blow past and we won't get them which is great but there is always that little bit of an element of um of risk but i'm with you church if we can get a thick end of 80 overs yeah. in we should be set for a really well, interesting we should game. and we saw yesterday actually with, with the spinners there was some turn there as well especially mm. for cameron Steele. And with this strong breeze going across the ground, you'd expect the spinners to operate as as we saw from Surrey yesterday with Lyon operating from the, the James Anderson end, Hartley operating from this Brian Statham end. Um, it's going to be Will Williams to get us started. We didn't see Will Williams yesterday in those five yeah. overs. Rory Burns will be on strike. He had a, a, a little finger knock yesterday that kept him off the field of play for a while, but OK to bat. And Dominic Sibley down there at the non-striker's end. So interesting field set up already with the, the leg slip and three slips straight away for, for the left-handed Burns. And it will be Williams from that James Anderson end of the ground. And the left-handed Burns, the man on strike. First ball then of this third date as Williams is right arm over and Rory Burns is covering up, walking into this delivery that's on around about middle and leg stump and just pushes it back up the pitch. Williams does the fielding 
off his own bowling and there is no run. So those three slips at the moment, Keaton Jennings is at first slip, Bruce is at second and then Wells away at third slip. There's a, a cover point, the mid off, the mid on. There's a mid wicket, leg slip as I say, and the long leg. Sorry, starting this morning, 11 without loss in reply to Lancashire's 202 as Williams is over the wicket to Burns it's short and it's cut by Burns straight out to cover point Hartley does the fielding moving round to his left hand side whips it in over the top of the stumps and there is no run but yes we are under the lights mm. we ended under lights last night and we're starting <laughs> under lights this afternoon so we're, we're, we're not natural, as we were saying yesterday. No. We're starting unnatural. Mm. It's never right. It's the third, third afternoon as Burns waits once again. <laughs> and in over the wicket goes Williams to him. He's playing this one with soft hands into the, the cover region. It'll be the first run of the day. Nicely taken single. Burns moves on to three. Sorry, you're up and running on day three. And they move on to 12 without loss. Yeah, good to see uh, Rory Burns able to come out and bat last night because he had spent quite a lot of time, hadn't he, off the, off the field with a finger injury. Um, but thankfully, it's not um, serious enough to, to, to prevent him from, from batting. But he, he, he did leave the field, didn't he, straight away. He fell, uh, fell mm. down and then quickly got up and off he went and we never saw him again. I just wonder if he, he jammed his finger into the, into the yeah. turf. And that can be very, very painful. But it, y y you're right, he, he went straight off. Um, and, well, thankfully for him, fit enough to, to open up last night. Fascinating five overs last night as well. And as I say, I think we're all keeping our fingers crossed. Nothing against Will Williams or Tom Bailey, but it'd be lovely to see Lyon and Hartley together today. As over the wicket comes Williams to Sibley. And Sibley's allowing this one to pass off a goodish length. Outside is off stump. It's quite an interesting uh, day ahead for the for uh, the guy that's just on screen there, Lancashire's wicketkeeper Matty Hurst, because uh, yeah, I've had a little bit of time working with 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 Lyon, mm. but not much. Well, I'm sure they they've had a, a bit of time in the nets with Lyon, just bowling a few balls to him. But this is all a bit different, <laughs> isn't it now? But Lyon only arrived what three four days ago, so he would wouldn't have had a great deal of time to to get used to Nathan Lyon. Uh, simply. Stands with that bat raised, tall figure, Sibley. That's hitting him high up on the, the front thigh as he looked to work that into the, the leg side. R reminds me of um, a game last season when, actually, well, actually maybe the season before, these, these seasons roll into one, don't they? But maybe the season before, but it was, a, it was the debut for, it was the season before, the debut for George Bell. And he was keeping wicket for Lancashire. And it was in a game where Jimmy Anderson was bowling. And I asked him, what, what what did he feel more nervous, batting or keeping wicket to Jimmy? Williams is in, and Sibley, first runs for him today. Just nudges this one into the leg side. They'll take the single. Hartley comes round to do the fielding. Two off the first over here on BBC Radio Lancashire, BBC Radio London, Lanx TV. And Surrey are 12 without loss in reply to Lancashire's 202. Yeah, I think he got... He got 20 odd on his debut in a game where um, there were lots of low scores, 80 all out, 70 all out, that type of match. I said, well, what do you, you pretty nervous when you went out to bat. He went, I'm more nervous keeping wicket mm. to Jimmy. <laughs> well, the thing is, what, 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 what people I think don't realise is for keepers, it's very tough, especially if you haven't kept us on like Jimmy <laughs> Anderson. With the amount he swings it and late, and you don't want to be dropping him. You don't. No. Do you off Jimmy? You do not. So, yeah, uh, quite a test for the young man, that. <laughs> First up against young Mr. Anderson. And as I say, it'll be a test to hear against Lyon as well. It will for Mr. Hurst. So it could be Tom Bailey, Williams and Bailey, to uh, to open up today. And he's left alone by Sibley and taken by uh, Hurst. Not uh, any surprise whatsoever that uh, Will Williams and Tom Bailey have started off off today last night was different wasn't it we had five overs last night and we'd seen nine wickets fall to spin and the floodlights were on and you were always going to get almost certainly always going to get one of Lyon or Hartley and probably Lyon to open up with the new ball at, at one end and he did but kind of reverting back to what you'd expect today with Bailey and with Williams 
Back in Bailey. Again left, but it's a, it's a, a late leave, and there's good bounce and carry through to the keeper, but the way that Sibley left it, it's just got the slips a little interested for a moment or two. Yeah, encouraging that for, for Bailey. Good leave from mm. Dom Sibley. Yep. Very good lever of a cricket ball. Well, in these conditions, against two bowlers that can move it around and move it late, if you're a good lever, it's a, it's a good part of your of your armory. There's Bailey in. Plays at this one, just off the front foot. Smothering the ball away into the offside, and Josh Barnum, who enjoyed a good day yesterday, making 80-odd for Lancashire Fields, and again, there's no rum. He played very well yesterday. Did Bahannon had a little chat about that earlier, and does look an extremely, extremely good player, Josh Bahannon. One of those that sort of knows his game very, very well. Played very nicely yesterday. In comes Bailey, balls forward goes Sibley. Such a solid front foot defence, isn't it? Sibley, such a big guy. Mm. So I guess when he, when he, even in defence, when he's so positive like that, you feel like he's almost dominating out there. Yeah, sorry, he's leading run scorer in the championship last season. It was Dominic Sibley. He got back for his first season after the move back from Warwickshire last mm. year. Winning the championship in that, that first season back with Surrey, but they're a very experienced opening pair. These two have done it in international cricket, of course. Bailey to Sibley again. Three slips waiting. And again, he allows that one to go through. Three slips there are Keaton Jennings and then Tom Bruce and Will Williams. Slips one, two, and three for Lancashire. 13 without loss. Yeah, nice to have some cricket, though. It's all well and good. Bad weather. <laughs> you want to be playing, don't you? You want to actually see the players out there doing something. Final ball of Bailey's first over of the day. Again, defended by Sibley to uh, Luke Wells. And that's the end of the over 13 without loss. I was saying to Callum before, and we'll, we'll, we'll have we'll, on our while the inspection was taking place and waiting for the confirmation to come through, and we were of the opinion, I think the three of us were, that maybe the best we're going to get is like a similar to yesterday, a, a 10 past one start. Absolute bonus that we've got three oh, sessions. Yeah, it's earlier than I thought. I, I think, as you say, all three of us were thinking, well, same as yesterday, really. Well, the, the strange thing is that the way that cricket works, of course, is that we started at 10 past one yesterday. We're starting at half past 12 today, and we've still only got 80 overs. <laughs> so yeah. even though we're starting earlier, mm. we've still got the same amount of overs that we had yesterday. Yeah. So that, that is one of the, the vagaries of our wonderful game. <laughs> it really is. Williams is going to come round the wicket now to Rory Burns. He's got Hartley in that leg slip position. They are Keeping that leg slipping for Rory Burns. Our Lancashire. Still this strong breeze going across the ground as Williams is in to the left-handed Burns. And Burns solidly in behind this. And that rolls way down into that gully position. Luke Wells comes round from third slip to, to pick up. And there's no run. A few hardy souls inside the ground today. It'll be busy on the other side at the other Old Trafford today, won't yeah, it? it yeah, I think it's already pretty busy. They get there early, don't they? The, 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 the little stalls and stands that sell scarves and hats and memorabilia. Mm. They were set up by half past three. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As round the wicket comes Williams. No, he doesn't because oh. there's the breeze yeah, the just knocking him off his, yeah. his stride. So he'll have to wander back. Of course, yesterday we had a, a bit of a delay for the sight screens having to, yeah. to be split which are tethered down to the white picket fences. <laughs> and then the white picket fences had to be put down as well. And I see that umpire Hartley has decided today to not wear yeah. his hat. Good decision. Which I think is a very wise yeah. decision because it kept blowing off. Yesterday did his hat as Williams is in and Burns gets in behind this. That rolls away into the leg side. Round comes Hartley from leg slip to do the fielding. There is no run. But yeah, it's it's very difficult for the bowlers with this strong breeze because it, for Williams now coming 
round the wicket. Basically, this 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 breeze is hitting his right shoulder, and he's sort of pushing him off towards towards mid wicket. So it's quite difficult to sort of keep your keep your action with a breeze like this. As he's in again, and that's way down the leg side. And Rory Burns, absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with that. Just shoulders, arms, and then goes for a little wander. Off towards square leg, Nathan Lyon up there at mid on. He's got his sunglasses on today. There's Mr. Lyon, even though there isn't any sun. <laughs> Very good last night when he came off, wasn't he? And went and had lots of photos taken. And yeah, that was good. Signed yeah. lots of autographs. So yeah, straight away at the the close of play last night, he was off doing doing a lot of signing and, and photos as Williams is in and Burns turns into the leg side once again. That potters out towards mid wicket. And there is no run. And it's just great to see him out there and playing. And, and, and we sort of, when we started yesterday, we were wondering whether we'd actually get to see him bowl with, with, with Lancashire batting and talk of lots of rain and would we get cricket today? And would yesterday be the only day where we'd see some action? And as it was, we did before Stumps last night. And I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. We're going to get to watch him an awful lot today as well. It should be rather lovely as... Burns, late cut, loves that shot, does Rory Burns, just late, lets the ball come to him, then opens the face of the bat, guides this off down towards third man, back goes Luke Wells to do the fielding, and they'll pick up a couple of runs, two more to Burns, he moves on to five, and Surrey move on to 15 without loss, but he does like that shot, Rory Burns just waits for the ball to come, and then just, last moment, just opens the face of the bat, guides it off, down into that, Third man region. They're now popping a fielder back at deep backward square in front of the hotel. Williams with sawdust behind him. Round the wicket he comes to Burns and Burns is letting this one go wide outside the off stump. End of the over. Sorry of move with no great alarms. On to 15 without loss. Burns has five. And Dominic Sibley's on six. Yeah, I suppose it's not uh, an enormous amount to be kind of gained from a batting side in a session that's an hour long. Um, you want to make sure that you're, you're there for the for, for the bulk of the day, don't you? Um, you? You could potentially get yourself into a little bit of bother, couldn't you, in a, a session that's an hour long on the floodlights, with potential bit of rain around, but the ball's still new. Could be a really awkward session that you could lose quite a bit, couldn't you, in, in a session of that of that size? It's a kind of steady start from these two. Is it? It is. And, uh, but but on the flip side of that, from a Lancashire point of view, it's a really good opportunity yeah. to to make some inroads before lunch with Tom Bailey to, to continue with that uh, with that bid forward to uh, to Sibley hopping onto that front foot and defending again there's no run 15 without loss Sibley 6 and Burns on 5 spoke to Josh Bahannon last night after uh, impressive knock with the with the bat he said it was a it was a good day and it was a bad day hmm. it's good for the first half bit ropey for the second but uh, he said it was turning a little bit I said, obviously nine wickets felt to spin so he said yeah it was it was starting to you know to turn for the foot for the spinners there's, there's enough out there even early on in the in, in the game and said with one of the the greats in Nathan Lyon in the Lancashire side and a young test bowler in Tom Hartley that they not to miss it that they can have an effect today and simply defends back to uh, to Bailey there's no run well, interesting, Lyon's already warming up here at mid-off, going through his his warm-up routine. Yeah, I thought Bahan looked really good again yesterday. As I say, he just looks like someone who knows their game, knows the way they're going to go about it. He comes barely balls, a short ball to Sibley with uh, a bit of rain swirling around the ground. It's going to get the umpires a bit twitchy, is this? And I, I suspect under normal conditions, and we are going off, under normal conditions, they probably would try to play through this a little bit because it might just blow through. But s because the outfield is already so wet, yeah. it, it's struggling to take much more rain, really. So this swirly shower we've got is enough to for the umpires to say, look, we, we need to get, get them off. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think 
you know, this might, fingers crossed it doesn't, but this might curtail us now <laughs> until that 1.30 lunch break because it's coming down pretty steadily now, isn't it? And it's pretty heavy and it was, it was wet anyway and hover cover's now coming on. This is this is pretty heavy, heavy yep. downpour now, yes, isn't it? Is. it? Yeah, yeah. Real shame, real, real shame. I sort of just caught the edge of a, a big dark cloud, but this is this is quite heavy stuff now. Yeah, coming down, isn't it? It is, yeah. And the the, the radars that the ground staff are using, which we've got access to, and obviously predicting where the rain is going to go. But such is the strength of the wind that the. Th 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 that changes almost on a minute-by-minute minute basis. It might be scheduled to blow to the east of us, to the west of us, wherever it might be, but the wind is so strong that th th those showers that we think might just miss us in the end come and, come and get us, which is what um, unfortunately has happened. So the ground staff have got the, uh, the cover, the pitch cover on. Our, uh, our camera crew are uh, <laughs> working hard to cover their respective um, cameras and try and batten down the hatches, which is not the easiest thing to do, is it really, when the wind is blowing around? Who's on the, the Bay Watch Tower out towards our left? Because that's very brave up there. Alfie, it's Alfie. Hello, Alfie. Hello, he's, Alfie. he's battling with his. his he <laughs> is. <laughs> with his oh, dear me. me. Yeah, he's trying to get his uh, tarpaulin down. Trying to get his tarpaulin down, mm. but he's struggling a bit over there. I always, I oh, always feel for the, the Bay Watch Tower. up in it now. Uh, so actually, yeah, and the, the oh. as you can see for those on Lanx TV, it, the ground staff are now dragging out the um, covers to protect the uh, <laughs> to protect <laughs> the square. It really is coming down now, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. It's just not help with the with the wind. Is it? You got the the rain's bad enough, and then you you, you try and um, you try and get the the. Uh, the covers down and the wind I think is the rustling other thing around. you've got today is the r the wind's sort of circling isn't it whereas yesterday it was as we sit in the Brian Statham stand in the, uh, the Brian Statham we, we, we could see it going left to right today it's just sort of whirling round isn't it and you can see where that rain's come from mm. <laughs> and that was quite a heavy downpour there yeah, for yeah. for a few minutes yeah yep uh, I say it's 10 to 1 now I suppose they could they, they 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 could take lunch now, mm. take lunch now, and then that would give the the ground staff an opportunity to to dry up what's just just come down because it does look a bit brighter away to our left. But all we've done there is just caught the edge of a yep, a have. shower, haven't we? We have, yeah. Yeah, it's just a shower that looked like it might j miss us. Um, going to the, the the west of us has actually just been pushed across with the wind and there's there's quarters um, which is a bit, un, uh, bit unfortunate yeah all right well let's a little rattle around some of the other fixtures shall we see what's happening um elsewhere elsewhere yeah what if we uh, we got we'll have a look at this for uh, our listeners on the bbc sport website app and viewers on likes tv we'll be able to take you around the grounds as well i think we're going to start at trent bridge where uh, Nottinghamshire are playing Essex. So Matt Critchley and Paul Walter bat in there for Essex. They were 130 for five. So they lead Nottinghamshire by 90 runs in the game at Trent Bridge. Yeah, you know, actually just seeing a little bit of that. That, that. that game's shaping up rather nicely, actually, isn't it? Mm. Just the lead, oh, whatever it is now. But it, that, that, that Notts game is, is, is shaping up nicely against Essex. It's in Division 1, as is the game at Edgebaston between Warwickshire and Worcestershire, where Worcestershire are 30 for 1. So they lead by 57 runs. Warwickshire all out for 333. And Worcestershire second time round, 30 for 1, now a lead of 57. That's a good fixture to have, isn't it? First game of the season. Warwickshire, Worcestershire. Perfect. Taking a local Yeah, it's, local well, it's the local rivals, yeah. isn't it? Local rivalry. We're into Division 2, where Middlesex are playing Glamorgan. This is at Lords. This is the match where Sam North East got his triple century yesterday. Glamorgan making 620 for three declared. <laughs> Middlesex in reply are 233 for three. Who'd be a bowler? Eh? <laughs> Trail by 187. 
in, in that match. And the other game, oh, it looks lovely on the South Coast. Mm. Very nice. So this is Sussex against uh, Northamptonshire. And Sussex are 35 for one. Uh, sorry, 35 without loss. Uh, and it's in reply to a Northamptonshire total of 371. Wish we had a bit of that weather up here. Well, I think the rain stopped. Mm. That's, that, well, that's a good sign. Yeah. But I think that might put pay to <laughs> what we were having before <laughs> half past one. What did we get there? Two, three overs, didn't Six we? Three overs, something, something along yeah, those lines. Yeah. Disappointingly, we did see Lion warming up as we well. Did, which we did. <laughs> but hopefully we'll actually see him bowl a ball in anger at some point this afternoon. But yeah, it's just it's just one of those weeks, isn't it? It's just start of the season, bit of rain around. I see that at Durham again, they've had absolutely nothing today. So they haven't no. bowled a ball yet no. in the Durham-Hampshire game. Same with Derbyshire Gloucestershire. Yeah, so yeah. we've, we've sort of been very lucky the last couple of years at this time of the year haven't we with the weather but unfortunately the other thing here is the amount of rain during the, the sort of winter months as well and ground staff across the country have been working tirelessly to get us started on time but there's not a lot you can do if it's you know, heavy heavy rain in the build up to the season I think actually they've done a brilliant job to get us out there for, mm. for what we've had so far in the game Probably seen a bit more than we thought we would. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid it's um, it's just a, a, a waiting game again now. I think I can just looking at out towards the um, far side, you can see the rain falling again. So it's um, starting to uh, to come down. Another swirly shower passing through, which is edging more likely to the idea that technical, we might take lunch. Technical term. Swirly shower. Swirly, swirly, swirly shower. Thank you. Do you like that? Yes, yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, I think you can get those in modern bathrooms. <laughs> you <can> press <laughs> a little <laughs> button. And you get a swirly shower. Do you get a light display as well? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Nice. They, have the, they have the sort of rainforest effect, don't they? Oh, yeah, Maybe a swirly shower. <laughs> <laughs> Ground staff are pulling out more sheets, I'm afraid, from the, the hover cover, so they're wanting to, to further protect the, uh, the square. Which... Uh, They'll be exhausted by the end of this oh week, won't they? Goodness. Yeah, yeah they had the, the, the not just got the the outfield and the pitch to protect from the rain. They've got the actual ground to try and protect from the wind. There were issues with the sight screen yesterday and all sorts of problems to, to battle with. Right, well I think we'll um we'll probably just leave you for a few minutes, I think. Um the uh a particularly happy looking picture. The floodlights on and the cloud cover and the covers are on and the rain falling. So there's no imminent chance of any ch uh, potential play here. Uh, so um, fingers crossed that we uh, we're back out there. Perhaps increasingly more likely to be now after a lunch break. Uh, but uh, as soon as we have any updates and any information, we'll bring that to you. But um, rain stop play with Surrey 15 without loss. Trail Lancashire by 100 and. 87.
along to another edition of Beyond the Boundary. This week I've got with me a, a man who's no stranger to Emirates Old Trafford, former director of cricket here at Lancashire, it's Ashley Giles. Ashley, good uh, good day to you and uh, it's really good that you've uh, taken time out to come and uh, come and say hello to us. Um, do you still have good feelings about the old place? Absolutely. It, it, it's always a pleasure to come back to Emirates Old Trafford, to Lancashire. Um, actually, my, my wife and I often talk about my time here, which is only two years, but two really important years in my career. But my wife, Steena, always comments that I was incredibly well looked after here, really well looked after and welcomed by everyone at the club. So really fond memories, um, you know, of working with everyone from, mm. you know, you guys who were on the board, right through all the coaching staff and the players. Um, and it, it, it was also a great privilege. It's a fabulous ground, fabulous history. And I feel really privileged, as I say, to have worked with you know, two of the biggest clubs in the country in Warwickshire and Lancashire. Yeah, I mean, your time here um, came after a spell with England as one-day international coach. And I think at the time you were, you were very much um, of the mind that you didn't want to just coach. You wanted to try and step up. Uh, and move into a sort of directorship type role. Would that be true? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Spot on. Uh, and at the same time, I started uh, a master's course, a degree course in in sport directorship here in Manchester. Um, yeah. I, I've always wanted to sort of broaden my horizons or push my boundaries as to as to what I could do and my experiences. Um, you know, I love coaching. I still love coaching. Uh, and in many ways, that's the bit I, I, I missed and miss is that that one to one connection you get with a player on, on sort of taking him on that journey from A to B or a team from A to B. Um, clearly, when you make that step to directorship, you are slightly more removed and you've got to be more removed um, because your your role is different. It's more strategic. It's more broad. But um yeah, and Lancashire was certainly a good learning curve for that for me because I was both coach and also well, stepping into say, the boardroom. I was going to say, that it was an important step for you because you were ostensibly still doing a fair amount of coaching. So there was still yeah. that one-to-one -one and team liaison type uh, role. And um, I think you, you probably, I don't think you'd be... Um, exaggerating to say that you you laid the foundations along with Glenn uh, Glenn Chapel of this current squad although you look back mm. to 2015 the very few players that played in the T20 final that are still here now yeah absolutely uh, um, and I did see it was important transition years I think for Lancashire and, and we you know we mm. we both worked through that in in bringing some of these young players through giving them opportunities um, as well as making sure you looked after those those very solid citizens you have in a dressing room and, and some of them are still playing. I mean, Crofty's still out there, well, yeah. which is extraordinary. It is. You know, great credit yeah. to him as a... And playing an as well as ever this, Absolutely. this summer. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed that. And, and actually, when I look back, I, because I my first role at Warwickshire was both sort of coach and director, mm. um, and that was a similar role to I had, I had here, um, and in many ways, they're the most enjoyable because you get the best of both. It's very challenging. And, and in the modern world, with the amount of cricket we're playing in the different competitions, very difficult. But um, I, I did enjoy that role. And when you, when you were in that role at that time, we're going back seven, eight years now, um, how important was it to you uh, to develop the, the next layer of talent, if you like? To, to look at the way the academy and the, the age group structure was set up? Yeah, it, it um, always has been and was and is still. Uh, you know, I think that's the fundamental bit of, of our cricket, our club, both our clubs and internationally. We've got to be, you know, in, in an ideal world, looking at a strategy that's long-term, that's sustainable over a long period. Um, and um, I've always tried to... And probably maybe sometimes to my detriment, move away from quick fixes and winning tomorrow. Um, sometimes you have to do that. You have to be aware of that. It's still not always possible. 
but I've always wanted to, I, I'd rather build over years than, than months because um, I think that's be better from a sort of legacy piece to leave something behind. Even if when you're gone, that structure remains and grows and, and you know, hopefully Lancashire's got a bit of that. I hope, uh, and I certainly think looking at the Warwickshire squad as well that, that, that I went back to, mm. uh, I suppose what, what we did, myself and Jim Trout, and then, then you know, now Paul Farbrace coming in um, have built a squad that has had success and hopefully will over a long period. Well, I think I think you're uh, you're quite right with Warwickshire, but I think you're also right with Lan that Lancashire have done that, um, and that it's been a, a a club policy to develop academy and their their own talent, mm. and that's self evident when you look at the sides that are playing uh, now. But when you were you were in charge, I think probably the two standouts. That, that came through in your your time here were Liam Livingston and Hasib Hamid. Yeah, and um, you're both fantastic players. You so sort of cha you championed Liam a little bit, didn't you? You got him into the side. Yeah, and batted him lower middle order initially. And, and yeah, in a very different role. Mm. Um, and Hass was a, you know is a different customer altogether. Yeah. But I hope one of the things I did because you know Lancashire has got such a, a wide net of, of talent and available talent. It's a huge area, isn't it? A huge the area. The whole um, of the North West. And there's a huge amount of talent that's always come through your academies and youth systems. It's almost um, creating the opportunity for that talent. And so I think Liam was a good example where, yes, when he first came in the side, he batted seven and got runs. Um, but I think in good sides or in, in mature sides, you allow yourself to do that is to play a player that you might not be sure about, but actually it should be the senior players around him that pick up the slack. Mm. And if he does well, it's a bonus. But if he doesn't, he'll learn and he'll grow from that. But you're not expecting someone to come in and, and smash it up from ball one. That's the ideal scenario, isn't it? To fit your one or two highly talented youngsters into a framework that contains uh, some solid senior professionals. Absolutely, that's the difference between mature and immature teams. It's not them as personalities; it's them as a, a group. You know the amount of cricket they've played, and and uh, my experience is even going back as a player at Warwickshire in the in the early nineties were exactly the same. That I was able to go into a team that had had success, that knew its game, and not feel the pressure of having to get five wickets every time I bowled mm. or runs, but. If I did, it was a bonus, but I was learning from the best as well. It was, uh, you know, I think they're the, the, the best environments to work in. Plenty of um, commentators, the public supporters say, well, you've got to give the youngsters a chance. But you can't give them all a chance at the same time because that just leads to inexperience and yeah. inev not almost inevitably, but, but very often failure. Absolutely. You, you can ruin them. You can burn mm. youngsters and getting that timing right. So sometimes you... You put people in. I think back then, even Saqib was a, a another example yeah. who we played, but always with the mind, well, you might have to pull them out. They might not be quite ready, but you want to. You'd ra I'd rather err on the side of giving them an opportunity to pull them back, than than never knowing, just sitting on the sidelines. Um, but it's got to be in a controlled way that doesn't, as I say, and you said, burn them. Do you think our county system, from a county perspective? allows the development of talent um, to come through sufficiently. And I'm not necessarily pointing this at, towards, an, towards England. Yeah. Whilst everybody probably admits that, that the county system is there to, to try and provide England players mm. of the future, it would have to do, that would be part of it. But it has to stand on its own two feet as well, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, so... And is it, is it set up to do that now? Well, if I just talk about that, so, I, so, I, so, no, so I think, <laughs> I think um, you know, I always saw my role as a, as a head coach, director of cricket, and I think you did as two-pronged. You know, you've, you absolutely have responsibility to try and win things yeah. for that county. That's why you're there, and that's what you're being paid for. But we also have responsibility to try and produce England cricketers, and you've got to try and move these two things along together, which which isn't always possible. And there are times when the short-term pressures become really big. And so 
the choices between playing a young player, giving him opportunities, giving him time, perhaps, are, are somewhat um, conflicted by winning tomorrow. And, and I think many of the counties uh, have faced that problem. Many of the directors of cricket have faced that problem. And in a system that has promotion, relegation, not saying that's right or wrong, we're not going to get in that, into that debate, I don't think, but, it, but it, um, it can place those pressures. Well, there are so many different uh, variables and systems that, that, that are um, promoted, proposed, talked about in terms of divisional cricket for, for the county championship, whether it should be three sixes, mm. um, you know, 10 and 8 as we've got now, or 12 and 6, or whatever. I mean, you can talk. And we've been talking about this in my lifetime mm. in cricket for 45 years, never come to um, perhaps a satisfactory conclusion. But, but having said that, you're probably ideally positioned now and placed, having spent enough time in the county game and having an elevated position in, in mm. England, uh, within the England setup, to realise that there there is always going to be a bit of a conflict between mm. county and England. Always. And I, I'm yeah. not sure how you can get over that. Well, yeah, and I'm not sure, but I made the point during the winter which I don't mind repeating, is that, that there's got to be... Both sides have got to come together on this. There's, there's got to be mm. collaboration on what the best thing for the English game as a whole is. Uh, at the moment, I'm not sure those things are aligned. We're obviously playing a lot of cricket, a lot of different formats of cricket, and I think we've got to... I mean, ultimately, for championship cricket, which is what we're here for, which I'm watching today, which is great, because we're, we're watching two good teams mm. on a good pitch mm. at a great ground, you know, it's really, really going to be... It's it's tough cricket. But I think we've got to find a way to play more championship cricket spread through the summer. Mm -hmm. You know, we again, probably spend an hour or two hours working out how we might do that, but we've got to find a way to do that. Well, I, I, I hear what you say, and I, I'm encouraged by the county cricket that I've seen mm. already this summer. We've been blessed with a, a, a dryish April. Uh, and the only thing that I will say that, that, that you would perhaps need that we haven't had so far is a bit more pace in the pitches. Mm. I think the pitch has been pretty good, generally. Runs scored. Yeah. And it, it's hard work for bowlers to take 20 wickets in a match. Yeah. So you've just said it. We, we're Lancashire, Warwickshire, one and two in the county championship mm. last year on a test match pitch, basically. This is the sort of cricket that the selectors should be looking at and making decisions from, in my view. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. This is this feels to me to be the top, and this wouldn't be the only no. game in the country, but the, this is the sort of top end of, of mm. cricket. I think your point around pitches is a good one, the pacing pitches, and I think if we spread four-day cricket throughout the summer a bit more, we'd have more variance or variation in that, and you probably have more pace later in the year. There's no doubt the weather, actually, in April... It's pretty good. Mm, generally. It's pretty, generally pretty good. And we've got some very good groundsmen who can prepare very good pitches. But they're still going to lack some pace at this. You know, you'd have to be a magician to, to get them rock hard and flying through at this point. And we know, you know, well, what you want to do is play on varying pitches in varying conditions. But at the very top end... Yeah, you want some pace and some carry and guys yeah. who can bend their backs being rewarded for, for doing that over long periods on generally good good wickets, good surfaces. If you had a magic wand and you've already said we we need to try and play more four-day cricket in the summer, I think there are five games actually between in June and July this yeah. year, which is not bad, better than it has been. But if you had a magic wand... Um, would you continue with all forms of the game that, that, there are, that there are now? I think it's a given that we've got to carry on with 100 because yep. you know, the, the amount of money and time and effort and marketing and, uh, that has gone into that. I think, I'm answering my own question, I think T20 cricket is essential for the counties yep. and we've got to play four-day cricket. So we've got to try and fit it all in. Absolutely. And that's the, the eternal question. It is, and then 50-over cricket. Mm. You know, we, we've got a World Cup Coming up next year, um, we're world champions. And whilst in this current this current generation, it won't have such an impact, but if we're continuing to play World Cups at 50 overs, 
And you know, th there is a chance some of the next generation of players won't even play 50 over cricket. And, and you know, I know that the way we play, we set up for our 50 over cricket, which is fantastic, is more suited to the shorter format mm. anyway. But I, I suppose if I had a magic wand, what would I do? I'd still find a way to play a more consistent um, you know, championship cricket through the summer. So blocks, basically. But, but well, yeah, but I, I would, you know, uh, and this is me talking, yeah. I would think about, you know, how we could do the T20 slightly differently. It's a very good competition. The quality of cricket's good, but could we play that? I know it goes against this, you know, the, what we moved to in, in not swapping formats all the time, but maybe a more appointment to view once mm. a week, Friday or Saturday night. Let's just make it clear here. There's no agenda in this no. discussion. This is this is Paul and Ashley having a chat. Mm. So it's personal views. Um, uh, it's interesting what you say about 50 over cricket because one of your uh, the finer achievements, I think, uh, uh, in recent years um, was to was to be head of England cricket when we won the World Cup in 2019. And you talk about 50 over cricket. I remember covering the 2015 World Cup in, out mm. in Australia and New Zealand. And prior to that, it was thought and mooted that this might be the last World Cup of 50 over cricket. Yeah. And it was New Zealand coming along and McCullum playing the way he mm. did and challenging the norms of, yeah. of 50 over that reinvigorated the, the game. Which is which was great, yeah, uh, and that probably sparked uh, England because we'd been perennial failures from way back in the seventies. Mm. We'd never won it, so it was time we did, and we did. So um, basically, did that consume your thoughts in your England role at the time? Well, year one, certainly. That mm. was my first year in the job was leading into the World Cup. And, and, you know, most of that preparation had been done by Strauss, Morgan, Bayliss leading into that. But I felt great pressure in in getting that over the line. Mm. You know, we went into that as favourites. There was a period through that tournament where we looked like we may not even make semi-finals. And so, you know, my job then is almost just trying to support pull everyone together, make sure we're staying on track, which I know, you know, Owen Morgan and, and well, Owen's going to do. Trev was still very relaxed, but my job is to appeared very that. relaxed, Trevor. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, incredible. Mm. Um, uh, and I think that sort of came to head before the I India group game at Edgebaston, and I think the guys sat down and said, you know, what are we worried about here? You know, we, mm. we, we know there's the expectation. We know we all have those personal worries about what might what might not happen and it, it, we've been on that journey let's just play the way we've been playing and go out and and play with that confidence and and in an aggressive way and um can't fault them it's obviously a bit twitchy and 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 looking at strategy you know that strategy that was probably over five years in the in the making or four years in the making um we still only won on the last ball of the tournament of a super over on a count back. On a count back. So that, <laughs> that's how tight it is. So that had to be the strategy. Um, and it, you know, it, it what, but, but whatever, I guess, I'm not going to say too much about it. Whatever one hand gives, y yeah. y you lose something. Well, um, I, I was going to come on to a more general point, really, about prioritising whether you're yeah. in charge of a county or you're in charge of an international team. There is so much cricket played. Yeah. There are so many different tournaments, so many different series, uh, so many different forms of the game that the hardest thing, I think, must be uh, to treat each game, match, series with equanimity. Yeah. You, it's impossible because you have to have a priority at some point. Yeah, so, so firstly, from a county point of view... Yeah, and this is just my experience again, would be to, you know, we start every season with the high hopes, we challenge for everything. And then I think as you, the, the season ebbs and flows, you know, sometimes you're surprised. So for us, when I was at Warwickshire, you know, the 11 season, the way playing championship cricket, finished runners up to, to you guys, to mm -hmm. Lanks, and then one in 12, was a bit of a surprise the way we took this uptick. 
Mm. But our white ball cricket dropped off. I think the way, you know, us winning T20 in, in 15 here, we struggled through some of the group stages, but peaked at the right time. And, and you know, the, you then you sort of put your foot on the throat. With England, absolutely, we, we've had to, you know, test cricket, however we've played, whatever results have been like, has always been, a, a, you know, one of our priorities. It's just the, the conditions we faced on and off the field with COVID and everything mm. else and the opposition we faced on the field um, have been really challenging. But certainly in white ball cricket, after the 19 World Cup, we made the choice with two T20 World Cups coming up to make that switch to prioritise T20 cricket. To be able to challenge for a T20 World Cup or a World Cup, we knew we, w we wanted to go into it as best in the world. So whereas I think when I came on, we were third in the world in T20 cricket, third or fourth. Um, we got ourselves the number one in the world, got in a good position. Um, our 50 over went from first in the world to second in the world, but that was a strategic decision that we didn't have a 50 over World Cup for a few years, mm. focus on T20, and so we're happy with that. And, you know, barring a couple of overs that went wrong um, in the UAE, we played some really good cricket in that World Cup and could have been double white ball champions. But so, so in that terms, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of thought goes into the prioritisation. Do you think that um, in England we, we have this, um, it's a preoccupation, but do we have too much emphasis on Australia and the Ashes? Um, or is it right to do that? It's clearly very, it's clearly... You know, an emotional mm. series, a very important series. And you played in the one of the best Ashes series of all time in two thousand and five. Yeah, it has. Well, I played in eighty one. Yeah, so you know, both iconic Ama series. Amazing, in a way. Uh, and yeah, huge historical importance. But they, because of that, they almost become watershed moments. You know, mm. the the fallout from the last series. Again, we won't go into too much, but generally happens around World Cups and, and Ashes because they're, they're deemed as the most important thing. Um, there's emotion, there's the history, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and now, you know, we live in an environment that is, that is just craves 24-hour news. Mm. <laughs> and mm. um, sometimes, you know, it, it, yeah, there's, 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 there's got to be change. There's... Um, Something's got to happen. But th there is a lot of importance placed in those series. And I think going back to something we talked about just a minute ago, it's becoming more and more difficult. I think in any sport, and cricket, and particularly county cricket, was probably immune from that a few years ago, to, to set your target about building long-term. I've got a five-year plan. Well, you might not get five years. Mm. You've got to win instant, next year. Instant success. Yeah. And that leads you to making some decisions that maybe you wouldn't in other cases it's that's an interesting point i mean the public demands success players want success they're not yep. in the game a long time are they you know they don't want to be necessarily part of a side that's going to win in five years because might mm. not be playing then yeah uh, so it's a very difficult balancing act having said all that um you put yourself i think where you wanted to be your yeah. your Absolutely. aim through uh, your your formative years at Warwickshire, then as an England One Day coach, and then with Lancashire, and then Warwickshire, you wanted to be at the top of the tree. Yeah. You won't have any regrets about that, even no. though things perhaps haven't worked out quite as well as you would have liked. Absolutely, I, I've always set about what you know, and, and again, where you look at where you come from, your, your journey in cricket, all the things you've achieved. I look at mine. Uh, I I still feel very privilege to have worked in the environments I've worked in and do the jobs I've done and I, and I wanted to work it at, at that level of course um, the last two or three years have been the most challenging because of some of these circumstances we talked about particularly uh, with COVID uh, and um, challenging not just for me but for everyone involved in that system whether it be you know the board chief exec level um, the coaches, players, everyone. It's been incredibly challenging and at mm. the county level as well, but no regrets. Um, I, I, and I think, um, you know, I'm sort of three months down the line of coming out of that role now. Mm. It's, uh, I've actually had a nice chance to reflect and, and I feel fresher for it 
you know, I think there's some challenging times ahead for, for everyone still, but it's, um, I love cricket. It's, you know, it's, it's an amazing environment to work in, but, um, you know, we'll see what the future has in store. So having been at the top of the tree in terms of coaching director of cricket work, yeah. what does the future hold for Ashley Giles? Does he want to try and continue in that? Does he want to move into perhaps another sport? Or would you be happy perhaps getting back to grassroots and saying, hmm, I'm just a coach now. I'd like to have a, another go at coaching. Yeah, well, I think that's the process I'm still going through at the moment, what, which, is, which is great. Yeah. You know, I've got I've got some time to do that thinking, but you, you, you know, when I reflect, I have done all of those roles. I've I've been a head coach, I've been a director of cricket, I've been the sort of national selector, uh, I've been a one day international coach, I've been the more director suit sort of role, um, and MD. So. I have a lot of experience across cricket. Cricket is, well, the world's a massive place. The cricket world's quite small. Mm. You know, it's, it's mm. a sort of, it's, uh, it always reminds me of going to Lords for the Test match. You always see the same faces, don't you? The same yeah. characters wherever you turn. That's what the cricket world's a bit like. So um, the moment, you know, I, I certainly haven't fallen out of love with cricket. As I just said, I love cricket. So it could be cricket, could be going into form management, coaching I, I'm I'm pretty much open at the moment but um, you know I'm also open to to looking outside the box and working across sports across countries um, because ultimately the things we work with Walt are you know the the fundamental thing is good people structures mm. strategy um, but I think the people thing is the most important thing you get the right people around you you've got you've got a chance Ashley, thank you very much. It's been a, a pleasure to chat to you for half an hour or so. Uh, we could probably have gone on for hours and hours and hours, but uh, I'm glad to, s to see you uh, have come out of your England experience OK and you're looking uh, refreshed. And who knows what the future holds. So, thank you very much. So thanks, Ashley, and uh, we'll see you again soon on Beyond the Boundary. My guest on this edition of Beyond the Boundary is somebody who's been synonymous with Lancashire cricket for over 60 years. Started as a player in the 60s, went on to captain the side, play for England, then became uh, an umpire, first class umpire, coached Lancashire, coached England and became one of the 21st century's fantastic and best broadcasters. It is David Lloyd. David, it's great to see you. Where did it all begin then? Well, it, it, back in 1965, and, and it began on the ground, and it's, it's obvious is that, but when you play for Lancashire Boys, you played here, which is a, a great place when you've got the committee and the coaches or whoever who can see the, the young talent coming on. We played right at the corner, right at the end, next, next to the pavilion, the old pavilion, and I did all right. So it was north v south, did okay and then Lancashire versus Yorkshire and Cheshire and did OK. It, it was a fair trek in then, when you, <laughs> when, when you, when you used to start as a, as a junior professional, felt like it was a fair trek in from Accrington in the 60s. It were three buses for a start. <laughs> you know, when, when buses, upstairs it were for smokers. Now, I've never smoked in my life, I had the filthy habit. Uh, but you always wanted to go upstairs to sniff these blokes smoking <laughs> these senior service and caps them full strength. <laughs> and you put your kit bag, if you remember, when you got on the bus, oh, there was like bag. a well. So you put your kit bag in, there was no chance of anybody nicking it. It was always there when you got to Morsley Street, got to Morsley Street. And then I think I caught the 48 bus up to close by the football ground and then had to walk. Um, but I, w I wasn't the only one. There were lots of yeah. us uh, came in that same sort of journey. And you came into a, a Lancashire environment. Um, and I think, let's be fair, in the, in the early mid-60s, Lancashire weren't in a, a period of, of success, but they had some fantastic players. Uh, one of the finest bowlers of all time in Brian Statham, for one. 
Jeff Puller, yeah. Ken Higgs, yeah. Jack Bond was around. It, do you know, it's an absolute mystery. When you, you look at the calibre of players, you think it was so wonderful players, but you're dead right, we couldn't bat. We couldn't get runs. And Statham and Higgs got 100 wickets each, and I think we finished second bottom. And it, it was always... The, the, the laws of the game, or the, the structure of the competition, was really odd. They, they kept chopping and changing, and I, I recall that you had to come out at 65 overs, you had to come out at 100 overs and declare three-day matches uncovered pitches. So you were always sort of manufacturing games to fit the three days because inevitably, particularly here, we were losing so much to the weather. You, you look at Old Trafford now and the drainage, which is state-of-the-art. Back in the 60s, it, no, it was just natural soil and if it rained, you'd deluge in puddles everywhere. You just didn't play. And so we were always constantly manufacturing games over a three-day period on uncovered pitches. Mm. What about your first impressions then of Brian Statham mm. and Je Jeff Puller? Brian yeah. was captain yeah. in the 60s. Fantastic bowler, mm. but um, uh, not perhaps the best captain. Well, we used to, Tommy Greenough and I, and sometimes we'd play together. And Tommy used to say, we'll be coming on any soon, any time now. I said, how do you know that? He says, because the, the 48 bus has just <laughs> gone past. He says, at five to one, we usually come on when that goes past. So and it's uncanny. That's the number of times that we, you know, you get that last over before lunch. Um, if the seam was a ball first up in the morning. Um, but Statham was a wonderful man. He was a fantastic man. And he just led by example, really. Jeff Puller was brilliant, absolutely magnificent. In the, He's a left-handed opening batter. Here's this kid from Accrington coming in, batting at number eight, showing a bit of promise. And he would know that he's going to elevate, this young kid's going to elevate, and eventually he'd open the batting, which is what I did. But Jeff helped me all the way. He looked after me. Was cricket your, your first love? Because no. Because you were a good footballer? No, all, no it? it still isn't my first love. <laughs> I like horse racing, <laughs> golf and football. I'm an absolute football fanatic. I, I love football, particularly lower league football. And I, I still go and watch uh, whenever I can. Um, York City, is a, I live over York Way now, so we go and watch York City. I'm a season ticket holder there. They're in National League North. And even now, I take my boots with me, thinking I might get a do, because they're not very good. Um, and, of course, Accrington Stanley is my club. It, but you were synonymous with the resurrection yeah. of Accrington yeah. Stanley, weren't you? Yeah, I was the, the director for a while, and then my mate bought, bought the club. And he pulled me on one side and he said, I've got some bad news. He said, uh, you're, I know you're a director. He said, but I'm sacking all the directors. I don't want any of them. I'll, I'm running the show. I said, thank you. Thank you. It's costing me a fortune, this. Because he, if one of the players, and this is in the bad old days, if he got subbed, and wanted a shower and went and put the shower on, the floodlights went off. <laughs> so we had to have a new electric system and so on, but we, we've now got a cracking club. Hey, it's a bit different now. I've read in the papers brilliant. this week that there's going to be a new champagne bar. Yeah, it Not is Not something brilliant. that is synonymous with Accrington. No, I, don't, I think that'll struggle, really. <laughs> uh, we've got a, It's a conference centre, um, which is, I think it's 400 or 450. Uh, hospitality and conference centre, which, which is bang on. And now we've, got, we've never had it, tarmac. We've got tarmac <laughs> up there now, which is great when you drive your car in. But your cracking club now, Andy Holt, is the owner, the chairman, and he's done a brilliant job. Let's just come back to Lancashire and the late late sixties. There was a there was a sea change in mm. in Lancashire's performances. It was the start of a fantastic era of one day success. Mm. What triggered that? I think the, the, the club had had a, in the 60s, there was this unrest. And then we got a great chairman. I mean, gregarious, right up front, a bloke called Cedric Rhodes. And 
he shook the place. He absolutely shook it up. And the, you know, a lot of things you'd say, I didn't like that about Cedric, and I didn't like that about Cedric, but he was here every day, fully hands-on. And he gave the, the club a real shake. And then Jack Bond took over as captain. When they were scratching their heads, thinking, who, who should we make captain? Jack to was replace, in the twos. Replace Statham. It'd be to replace Brian Statham. Yeah. And I think they advertised in the Telegraph for a captain. That might, might have been before Brian Statham. But Jack was, Bondy was playing in the twos. And they give him the job. And I would think that that would be short term at the time. But it, it coincided and corresponded with a, a lot of young lads coming from club cricket. And you were playing uh, Saturday, Sunday club cricket, league cricket, knockout cricket. And we all came together from different areas. Um, lads from down St. Helens, Ken Shuttleworth. Lads from up Mosley Way, Staley Bridge, John Sullivan, Harry Pilling. Lads from down Lancashire League, myself, latterly Jack Simmons. And it clicked. And suddenly we got a one-day team playing one-day cricket to full houses. And they were glory days, real glory days. When you consider Sunday League, I think you started at two o'clock. You've got mm -hmm. to finish your first innings at ten past four. Be 16, 20,000 on a year. And again, it, it, when you do interviews like this, you can recall there were no advertising boards. They, they didn't have any. They weren't that sort of. It wasn't that sort of club. There'd be half a dozen people would work in the offices. That that's it. And so the crowd used to spill onto the pitch with a boundary rope, and the crowd behind the boundary rope, and you could have four or five thousand people sat on the ground. And so it, it was a great atmosphere. I mean, a fortress right on top of you, the crowd. What was Jack Bond's secret then? Because the, man management. And undoubtedly, he had some good players, yeah. or some good players um, who were starting to come to the mm -hmm. fore. I'm thinking of Lever and Shuttleworth yeah. and Lloyd and Wood, yeah. and the overseas players, yeah. Clive Lloyd yeah. and Farouk mm -hmm. Engineer. Yeah. yeah. But Bondy's big secret, man management. He got the great name Bond. That that was what he did. He bonded a team together. He was totally unselfish. And if we were in a jam, he'd go in and, and sort of stick it out, and grind it out. If we were flying, he'd drop down and send John Sullivan or anybody else to, to give it a whack, Simo and David Hughes. So he was honest, unselfish and great man management. I mean, he managed me. I could get a bit volatile and he could, he could manage me, no problem. You say you were volatile, David, yeah, and that stuck with you probably through your career and, and, and probably still a little bit in your life now. But but you've obviously learned to temper yourself. How much did uh, of an influence was Jack Bond on you in your future, not only as a cricketer, but uh, when you became captain and then coach, then an umpire? Mm. Um, how much did, did Jack Bond influence you? He was a massive influence, and two others at the club were massive influences, Edward Slinger mm. and Bob Bennett. They were great influences, and they knew how to calm me down, how to sort of shut me up a little bit, as did Jack. But Jack must have seen something to push me as captain, because I got, he was going to retire, and I got, he, he told me that, follow me, watch what I do. And I, we went on holiday together, actually. And he said that, you know, you'll, be, you'll probably be captain, and you've got to pick things up, and. You've got to learn how to step back a bit. Um, I'm a lot better than I used to be. I think I'm all right now. You know, Jack believed in me for a start, but I, I've got to tell you a funny story. We went, the end, when he, he was retiring, he was finishing, and I'm getting wind that I'm going to be captain. We go to Germany on an end of season jolly to, I think we're having Frankfurt or somewhere. And this is an end of season jolly to end all end of season jollies. And we sort of celebrated every night well into the night. He's made me captain for this next game. So at night time, 
I've gone so I thought I've got to get to bed, got to go to bed early. And I start mapping out on bits of paper where fielders should stand and so on. The morning after, we turn up and I was like, Captain, here we go, get yourself sorted out. There's only two turned up. <laughs> <laughs> so we got tossed up, well, we'll have a bat. And we, we batted like in some 35 over game, batted like and kept looking, is there anybody else going? And then Harry Pillard and John Sullivan staggered out of a room. Keith Goodwin, he spent all, it's, it's like an army camp. He spent all day saluting all the soldiers because he used to be in the army and waving aeroplanes off, so I couldn't get him to the ground. And we, we showed up, I think it was me and Edward Slinger, rather me and Edward and me and Bob Bennett, who opened the batting and just had to show things up. And I've got all these bits of paper in my pocket as to where I could put my fielders, only got two. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's not quite like that now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, so it's, that was that was basically after a very successful period. You, you, Lancashire had won mm. um, the Gillette Cup three years on the trot. John Player League twice, um, and. You then became captain mm -hmm. in 73, mm -hmm. following on from Jack, mm -hmm. and were captain relatively young, weren't you? Yeah, what were you, 25, 26? 20, I might have been 26, 27. Um, and we were just on the wane, you know, just on the cusp, right, you know, just on our sell by date, if you will. And, you know, you're missing Clive. Clive, if West Indies were here, mm -hmm. that's it, gone. And you didn't replace, you, you didn't say, oh, we'll get somebody else in for three or four weeks. Um, and so, you, you know, we lost you know, the kingpin player, lost the number one. Um, Farouk, God bless him, what a wonderful character within the team, belligerent batsman, brilliant wicketkeeper, just coming to the end. And so we, had a, we did all right, and we continued Gillette Cup success, getting to finals. I think you've done great if you get to finals, particularly at that time in the 70s, if you keep getting to finals, you're doing something right. And d during my time, we got to three. You won it won again one. in 75. Won it in 75. Um, in 74, 76, we were just on the wrong end. We played Kent. And I think Alan Knott was man of the match. He got 15. And it was one of them dismal, nasty, horrible days and horrible pitch. And the game didn't happen, really. We didn't, and we got beat by North Ants as well. Although North Ants at that time had a really good side, mm. they had a good team. But, but Lancashire, since let's say since '68, had have had various elevens uh, teams mm. that have been hugely successful in yeah. one day cricket, and have only ever won the county championship once. Yeah. Why is that? Why is it? Is it the glamour of one day cricket? Do you think? Yeah, partly. Um, in in the early days, over, uh, with uncovered pitches particularly on this side. And I know you can say, well, Yorkshire were very successful on the east side. We, we, the, the rain comes up here and it drops buckets on Old Trafford. And that definitely hampered us from the players that we had. But I mentioned Cedric Rhodes. And from the club perspective, he would make us fully aware that one day cricket pays the rent. You know, we're filling the ground mm. every time we play a one-day game. And you're winning. And spectators are clamouring for tickets, sold out every time. So we, we were under no illusions that, that one-day cricket was priority at the club. And if you did OK in championship cricket, good. You know, you did all right. Yeah, you're doing all right. Mm. We had... You, you, I know we had one year where we were second and pushing and pushing. Uh, to be champions, and we had a rain curtailed game, final match down at Sussex, and it didn't just happen. And Tony Gregg, I think, were captain at Sussex at the time, and we just didn't push on and finished up fourth. But we had a really good season then. But but one day cricket was mm. was the king. On a personal level, your your cricket playing a long time ago now, but it tends to get pushed back into into the periphery because you've done so much in the game. Mm. But you had an England uh, career which was perhaps too short, um, just less than 10 games, but you averaged 42 as an opener. Uh, were you frustrated that you didn't play more for England and do better no. as an individual? No, I thought, 
me, I'd run my race, my time were up really. I'd only get into that team if Jeffrey Boycott wasn't around. Dennis Amis was a fantastic player. John Ed Richard opened and just dropped down. So, you know, these are stellar players and, and Boyks, uh, for whatever reason, got injured when I got into the team. So I'm in form. They're looking for an opener. I got in, did all right. And of course, I averaged 42, which helps when you got 214 not out in one knock. <laughs> that that run half help, get the average <laughs> up. And so I went to Australia. I'd never really been out of England. I had a ball. We had a great time, great tour, great opponents. And they beat us 4-1 because they were far better. But I knew at the end of that that, you know, once... And I come back with an injury, with a neck injury, which has reared its head like you wouldn't believe in this last 12 months. And I knew that if I wasn't fit yeah. and I wasn't informed, they were not, they'd look somewhere else, which they mm. did. Did you, did you think to yourself then that the step up to international level was perhaps, unless you were playing at your very, very best, was just a bit beyond you? Yeah, I did. Um, you know, I, when, I, when I played here in England against India and Pakistan, I, I felt, yeah, well at home, yeah. I'm good enough for this. But when we went to Australia, you come up against Rodney Marsh, who's recently passed away, um, the Chapels, um, Thompson and Lily, Max Walker and, and Ashley Mallet. You know, that were tough. Um, and they were better than us, which is how it is. If you they win 4-1, mm. and we had good, we had good players, yeah. um, but they were better than us. I'm just, I'm just thinking that, that you know your formative experiences coming from Accrington, playing for Lancashire, your time under Jack Bond, your time as a leader mm. for, for, for Lancashire, and then uh, your time playing as an opening bat for England uh, probably set you in really good stead for what you were going to do in in future. Mm. You went to be an umpire, mm. and then you went to be a coach. Mm. Did you have a career path planned? Definitely. And yeah. you, you really wanted to be... I mean, you were on the verge of becoming an international umpire when you went yeah. back into coaching. Yeah, yeah. Um, in my latter stages, so in my early 30s, early to mid-30s, I finished when I was 36. And I always said I wish I'd have finished when I was 32. And I'd gone in to see Chris Hassel when I was 32 and said, look, I, I think I'm thinking of calling a day because I want to do this. And he said, we'd like you to carry on. I carried on to 36, which was a mistake. I could have done two years, could have done to 34. But there were two things that coming back from England and realising I'm just going to be a county player, I changed my game. I started being a bit of a dasher, where I was careful, building innings, you know, leave the ball, I started going after it. And I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, and the other thing that in that, when I was 30s, I took all my coaching badges, which, which is the best thing I did mm. whilst I was playing. Mm. I did all this whilst I was playing. And I, you know what I'm like, I'm coming back from these coaching winters, which are tough, down mm. at Lily Shaw, yeah, yeah, yeah. real tough. And I'm wanting to put all these ideas into play. <laughs> and Bondi and Sav, just shut up. You just get, look, we're the, you just sit. Well, I've got, just sit down. We're not interested. We're not interested. <laughs> but I got all these badges and I, I've but got you, a, you were always a great thinker about yeah, yeah. the game, a great theorist. It, it, and you developed oh, into a, a wonderful yeah. innovator, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. Through, yeah. Your, through your time as, as Lancashire coach initially. Love that. Love that. I, First up, I came with David Hughes. Yeah. Yozza and Alan Ormrod had parted company. I think Alan had gone. Hughes was here, and the, I came in and looked after the twos. And that, that was a, a great time. I, I enjoyed that. Then Yozza left, and I was elevated to, to do the job. And so I, I was in cahoots with a groundsman, a bloke called Peter Marron. Pete, Pete Marron, me and him, and we, we had a dressing room attendant, you know, called Ron Spriggs. Mm -hmm. So I used to get in here. And so I'm, we're in the pavilion, all, all this side. And I wanted an, an office. I wanted to be away. But, you know, if I want to pull a player, I want to come in here. I want to sit down. And that. Pete Marron made me an office in the defunct urinals. 
<laughs> and so he boarded these urinals up and, and proper lavish, but, but blocked them all off. And that was my office. It, it was brilliant. At the, right at the back of the pavilion, overlooking the police station and the town hall. And so every morning, I get in here half past seven, and Pete Marin and Ron Spriggs would come up and sit with me, with three of us round the table. And it, it always, it, it sort of reminds me of like Bill Shankly and the, the boot room at Liverpool. And Spriggs would make the tea, big black, big pipe pots of tea, put them down. And Spriggs would sit down, he said, have you seen that lad in the tooth? He said, he should be in the first team. I don't know how you're not picking him. <laughs> and so Ron Spriggs thought he were picking the team. And, but it, it, it was, uh, you know, the, around the dressing room, I, I think I ate them hard, the players at that time because I had all these slogans round the dressing room, all, you know, commitment, character, charisma, yeah, all over there. And they're coming in and what that. I said, that's what we are. That's what we are. I had a sign also, this is Old Trafford. You were, all, you were ahead of your time in that, though, really, I think, in terms of coaching. I don't think... I think you innovated that sort of approach. You, you, I remember you playing music to the players as yeah, well. Yeah, to, little to bit. Stir them up or calm them down, whichever. Yeah, yeah. stir them up. Uh, but when you say you play music, there were little clips, like a minute and a half, nothing more than that. And then I got them all to choose their own clip and play that. And it, so I wanted them to go out. I wanted to run down the steps at Old Trafford and flipping charge onto the field and let everybody know, particularly the oppo, that we're here for business. That's what we do. And the one thing I said to, to the lads, I didn't say a lot, didn't say a lot. I said, we might not be the best batters. We might not be the best ballers, but we will be the best fielders. We work like stink on fielding and fitness so that we'd, we'd just swarming all over them in the field. And that, you know, I always, particularly one day cricket, we, you know, I had lads like Gary Yates, Peter Martin, young Glenn Chappell, Ian Austin. My lad Graham, Neil Fairbrother, the Crawley, Atherton, Gallion, name them all. Fantastic team, that. Brilliant team. I said, in one day game, you switched on. I said, there'll be one moment that we have to win. It's that moment of magic, that when somebody picks the ball up and runs him out. And I'll never forget, played Yorkshire on here, big game, Darren Lehman. He's probably the best overseas player they've had. Mm. And I, I said, we run him out. He's got a bit of weight. Look at him, Tubby. He's a bit Tubby. I said, we run him out. I said, he'll want to get to the other end. We run him out. I said, if he's on strike, ball five, six, tighten up, infield, tighten it up. We're running him out. Forget the other geezer, run him out. And it was our Graham. It was rapid. It Graham was, was ready. You wouldn't think low so. Low to the that. ground as yeah, well. He was low to the ground. Yeah. And, he picked, and, and I'm on that balcony there, across the other side. And as soon as he, he's pushed, you know, he, he's, he's sort of back foot, which he, he's, he's got another yard to make up because yeah. he's on the back. He's pushed it and Graham's moved round at cover like slow motion. And I've got hold of the edge of the... And run him out! And he hit the stumps <laughs> full on. And he would get no DR and none of that business. And they will go to the umpire upstairs. And the old square leg umpire give him out. And I'm jumping about on the balcony. <laughs> you had a very talented team. I don't mm. think there's ever been a good coach of a bad side, has there? No. But no. that let's forget that. Yeah. You were a good yeah. coach of a good team. And we forgot a bloke called Akram. Oh yeah, he was quite good. <laughs> yeah, well there you go. If you have him, you've got two players in one and one of the best ever, haven't you? Well, if ever, I get asked every time, I get asked, what's your best world eleven that you've seen? So I start at number eight, I just put Akram, and at number nine, I put Warren, and then build the rest of it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, let's just break off. Shane Warren it, it recently um, died in tragic circumstances. Uh, for me, he was the best spin bowler I've ever seen, uh, and one of the top three cricketers I've ever seen. And a great bloke. Top bloke. Fantastic bloke. Kind. Yeah. Very, very generous. Yeah. Great mate. One of the, I'll tell you how good a mate he is from the other end of the world. If you're in adversity, he'll ring you. Mm. He'll just give you a call. And so that was a tragedy, but he lived life to the full. Sleeping was a damn nuisance. 
And so the whole cricket world will miss him. And there have been some great players. There's been some of the greatest players haven't been the nicest people. Mm -hmm. This bloke with top drawer. And you, you were always a great admirer of spin bowling as well, and spin mm. bowlers. Would he be the best you've seen? Yeah, yeah, he is murally. Yeah, well, he's he... right up there. Yeah. Um, and when you talk about spin ball, he's always spin, rip it, make it go both ways, which both of them lads could do. And so he championed the game, uh, did Shane Warren. Not just resting back and, you know, I'm a great bowler, look at me, I'm brilliant. He championed the game of cricket, he cared. He'd control the game as well, wouldn't he? Oh, I. It, it, it would come under his spell, whether, he, you, were, whether you were on his side or, 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 more importantly, if you were against it. He'd make damn sure that him at the other end is playing me, not the ball. He used to, I mean, when I was in England, when we play against him, I said, don't play him, play the ball. He'll be right into you, which he was. He loved that aspect of it. Mm. Just a stare and a chip and a bit of something. And a hugely perceptive commentator in... in brilliant. In late, late yeah, late absolutely year. brilliant. Well, yeah. A big regret that he didn't become Australia captain. He, yeah. he couldn't become Australia captain. But he, you know, he had a very colourful life. Yeah. Um, and he'll be, he, he will be sorely missed. OK, back to you. Back to um, your coaching, which you did with considerable su success for Lancashire. It wasn't long before you were recognised by the England hierarchy and appointed England coach. Mm. That must have been a fantastic uh, time of your life. It, it was, with Atherton as captain. You know, that was a, a good combo. Um, and Raymond Illingworth was doing the whole job, if you remember, he was supremo. Mm. But Illy was great. You know, when I came well, in and, and, and took over that side of things, it, of sort of preparing the team. So let's look at, at that time in the late 90s, the coach, you know, I would it's expect him to... Uh, sorry to interrupt, but it's not a bad blueprint for where we are now with English cricket, the way it was then. Mm. Because yeah. we're, we're basically rudderless at the moment, I yeah. think. Yeah. But anyway, go back to you. Back to you. Yeah, so, so Illy was doing everything. I came in to prepare the team. That's, that's how it was. It, I, w I always looked at... It, 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 I, if I have to tell this bloke who's opening the batting for England how to hold the bat, there's something wrong. Yeah. But you prepare them mm. to play and you're giving them knowledge, strengths and weaknesses of the opposition. We had monitors and, and VHS videos, all that sort of thing of, of this is how he plays, these are his vulnerable points, this is you doing brilliantly, by the way, put little clips on, and, and that, that worked, and that was different, nobody else was doing it, nobody uh, was doing that sort of thing. Um, but the main thing for me would be to prepare the team and then hand it over to Michael Atherton or Alex Stewart. The captain. Because he, he, he's running the show then, yeah. right? there's nothing you can do over five days. Were you not helped Tremendously by the fact there was a influential, stable uh, individual who was in charge of the ECB at the time, and that was Ian McLaurin. Yeah, he, McLaurin was good, and he, he came in, and you could tell from his big business and, and Tesco's and chairman that he was a bit taken aback, and he had to. He, he what by the yeah. was there an. Mean, Amateurish nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly. Without being it. unkind. Yeah, it, it, it needed to. But you tried to bring it into the professional yeah. area. You, you've already said we did video analysis. Yeah. Um, yeah. We prepared the play. We didn't coach yeah. them. We didn't, weren't yeah. technical with them. No, but but we, we had technical people like as they do now. We had a yeah. bowling coach, batting coach, wicket keeping coach who would work with the players. So if I'm head coach, I'm sort of preparing everything and organising everything. And then it's over to the captain, who's, who's not had to do anything with that. That's your job now, the team. You work the team tactically. I can't, you can't start, as I did with Winker, start shouting, move him round there. Atherton, Stewart, or whoever, captain's aside. No, if you don't like the captain, change him. Um, but that's the way that it was. But weren't you, in conjunction with Ian McLaurin, instrumental in bringing in... Central contracts. No, I wanted to. We, you, well, the, you wanted behind them. the scenes, it were always central contracts, but there was no money. Mm. They didn't have the money. 
and then there became a, a big sea change in the year 2000 when broadcast deals started up, up, yeah. up. Um, and that's when England got on a level footing with the rest of the world with central contracts. Whereas players were, it's not just to play for England is an icing on the cake. The, playing for England is your job. Mm. That's what you do for a living. And that's where you get your money. Mm. And now, fabulously, they're well paid. Cricketers are pretty well paid. Who do you have, Anderson or Statham? Oh, jeez. Well, number one, I'd, be, I'd say I want both of them for a kickoff. <laughs> um, Anderson or Statham? Uncovered pitches. Anderson or Statham? You can't pick, can you? You can't. Really you can't. I mean, Do you know? I, I think know Jimmy's, pick... Jimmy's career in numbers is yeah. far superior to Brian's. Yeah. But he, 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 in in, in um, test match numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not in career numbers. No. Brian's got two and a half thousand wickets. Yeah. yeah. But about the same pace. Mm. About eighty-five. Lively enough. Deadly accurate. Statham, in uncovered pitches, used to knock a little channel out. We're Nothing not talking like. about pitches with loam and clay, just the, the soil of the area. He'd knock a, a, a little strip out um, we, we, because of the accuracy. It was the size of a dinner mat, wasn't it? Yeah, basically. Yeah, and Jim's the same. He had just, it, it's, it's that God given talent that they bowl that length that is so awkward for any batter. There's a magic length, it's, and it, it's a span of about that. It's the it, length that you, says you, to the batsman, do you play forward? Or do, do I play, play back? back? And, and by the time you've made your mind up, it's, you've nicked it. That's it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it, it's simple, but so mm. hard to do. Yeah. Um, don't mind you not being definitive on that, that's fine. You, you've been in the game, as I said earlier, and we'll come to the end of this shortly, in the best part of 60 years, in all your guises. And your broadcasting and your speaking has mm. sort of sat in the background mm. for a lot of it, and obviously not in the last 20 years, but you'll have seen an inordinate number of cricketers. Mm -hmm. And I'll put you on the spot now. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me mm -hmm. who you think is the best player you've seen who plays for England, for a start. Kevin Peterson. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Number one, Kevin Peterson. Because he, he, could, he could just bend everybody to his will and do extraordinary things mm. and from from the job that we did he got you on the edge of your seat mm. um, you know powerful big tall commanding reminding me a lot of Ted Dexter um, same sort of build and had a presence and Peter I don't know Peterson I don't know Kevin Peterson at all really to say hello to him but um, as an England player he, he was my number one Graham Gooch, brave, thorough, mm. dedicated. Um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Boycott, get past that, mm. get past that flipping lot. And, and I, I've had that many up and downers with him. Oof. Oh, with Lancashire Yorkshire like that. Yeah. But I still class him as one of my best mates. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking yeah, nonsense. I don't talk as much nonsense as you. <laughs> he's, an he's an awkward son. So, oh, but, dear me. But fanatical about the game, and does he ever talk sense about it? Yeah. I, yeah, well, he doesn't now because he's gone. Yeah. Must well, be crackers. Anyway. Um, OK. Peterson, the best played for England, general, in general, any country. Mm -hmm. Give me, a, give me a flair. Batter? Yeah, whatever. Batter me th me three, I could qualify this and say that the three, three, three favourite players yeah. are all West Indians. Mm, good. Gary Sobers, Viv Richards, Brian Lara. Them three. All left-handed batters as well. Great, yeah. Great players. Ricky Ponting. And there's a, the big debate that you, you, we can do it here in Lancashire's dressing room. You, you try and have this debate in in Mumbai. Who's the best player, Sachin Tendulkar or Virat Kohli? Now, I've seen them both, I've worked on them both. Both unbelievably talented. And I've only got one place in my team. I've got one place at number four, number five, wherever. Who am I going to pick? Virat Kohli. 
Now I've just alienated a country. <laughs> They've got like, uh, but yeah. I'd have Virat Kohli, mm. a real battler. I like that type of player. But another of my favourite players, Jarvin me and Dad. Oh, just yeah. a real battler. I get stuck in. Another of my favourite player. Now I haven't got. I wanted to tell you. No. I wanted to tell you. Tell me. So we, uh, my favourite and all time. We've all talked batters there. Yeah. Was he Akram? I was going to say. Yeah. Akram. You've left Akram out. Well, Akram. And every managed, time. Yeah. I think and his was, mate Wakar. He was great man. Akram. Wak Wakar, brilliant man. The yeah. pair of them together. Yeah. Was he and Wakar? Um, OK, just before we, we say to Art, um, you've done everything in the game. I don't think there's anything you haven't done. Probably professionally scored the game, but that's by the notching, by. Notching, notching. Notching, yeah. So playing, captaining, coaching, umpiring, broadcasting, which element of your varied career do you enjoy the most? Well, at 75 years of age, broadcasting, although at the minute I'm out of work worldwide. Won't um, be for long. But, um, well, there's no better than playing, is there? Yeah. I loved umpiring. That, that would, I just, my lad umpires, my eldest lad, and I, I just said to him, don't take it too seriously. <laughs> don't think he, I said, because we've all been players and we're never out. Mm. Batters are never out, never. Mm. I got, in, in, this, in this changing room, Livy, Livy comes up to me, He's never out, Livy. Well, he comes up to me, and he, he's a flipping handy lad. Yeah. He, he can look after himself, Livingston. Yeah. He said, Can you tell that lad of yours that you can't be out LBW if you hit on the pad at playing a shot and you're outside the line of the stumps? And how quick as I didn't miss a beat, I was straight back at him. I said, You mean to tell me you've been hit on the leg out there? <laughs> it's the flattest thing I've ever... How, you've been hit on the leg. I said, you should be able to bat out there without pads. I said, no excuse for getting... I'd have given you out just for getting hit on the leg and walked off and he looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> David, thank you very much indeed. Um, 75 now and still going strong. Keep going forever. If you give players the right level of help, you can help players who might have been fringe players become quality players. Do you see the, the influence of the way that England have played in the last six months drilling down into the county game? We can't just have a squad of players for Lancashire and expect them to all play for Lancashire all year. I was fairly argumentative as a youngster. I thought... I what did, do you mean as a I youngster? Did think, <laughs> not that I didn't believe in coaching. I was always prepared to listen to people I respected. Where did the spark come from and why did you think you wanted to become a coach? The concept of being a pro didn't really dawn on me until I was offered a contract. Not frustrated, but I was determined that we could go better than fourth place. Does that rankle with you that you never got more of an opportunity to play for England? If somebody had to say what defines Glen Chapel, that, that last game probably would be it. Hello and welcome along to another edition of Beyond the Boundary. I'm delighted to say that my guest today is somebody who's been synonymous with Lancashire cricket since the early 90s. His connection has been uh, unbreached since 1992. Uh, he is one of the county's best ever quick bowlers, take 985 first class wickets captain the side to the county championship victory in 2011 and is now the head coach. It's a, a very warm welcome to Glenn Chapel. Glenn, I just get the feeling that with all your enthusiasm and having got to know you pretty well over the last five years or so, that you'd still be playing if you could. <laughs> um, well, I, I was lucky enough to be able to play for a long time. The body didn't let me down. Um, and I still have a bowl in the nets now and again. I don't think I'm up to standing out in the field and diving around, but, um, but yeah, I still enjoy the skill stuff. But 24 years as a player is a phenomenal span, especially as, a, as an opening bowler. What fortified you through all that, through obviously your early part of your career, it's, it's all said and done, but through the latter part? Yeah, well, I think in 24 years you change a lot in that time and your outlook changes. Um, from starting off being surprised that you're a professional cricketer and wondering what you're doing, 
to going through thinking halfway through I thought I've had a decent career now but it's going to take a big effort to carry on and as I played for longer I, I seemed to get more and more resolved to, to carry on and sort of do something that I could be proud of at the end of it. Jimmy Anderson no less uh, said a couple of years ago he said I've never played with anybody who works harder at his game that's a, a fantastic testament to your your time in the game and the attitude that you you put into it yeah again I think I realized as I moved through my career that you had to put the right the right kind of work in I'm not sure about working harder but I did work work as, as hard as I deemed necessary but it became you know the work that you do is important. So if it's ten minutes, it's ten minutes. But if it's if it's an hour, it's an hour. You need to prepare to play the next game you're going to play, and to be able to get through a full season. And there's a lot of things around the edges of being a bowler that you need to pay attention to if you want to if you want to stay on the park. And that's just not not the normal stuff. It's all the modern stuff that we do to prevent injury, to make certain areas of your body stronger. Where did all this come from then? Because for a, a Lancastrian, which you're not, because you were born in Skipton. <laughs> and somebody who's grown up on the border of Lancashire and, and Yorkshire at Irby. Um, what, what was your early influence in all this? Were your parents um, very instrumental in, in instilling in you a work ethic? Yeah, well, work ethic, um, I think so, certainly. Um, certainly grounded people. Um, but, you know, they were both involved in the cricket club down at Irby. Um, Dad was a pro in the leagues, played for many years for Irby, Nelson, Darwin. Um, and we were a family who just spent time at the club really, I had a lot of friends there, so we were always there playing cricket, whether it be tennis ball, um, in the nets at night with the men, um, and in those days you would progress quite early, so I, I was playing at six in the under 12s, I was playing at 11 in the third team, um, and there were no restrictions on anything, so it was just a life spent playing cricket basically. Um, Did you play at school? No, only a couple of games. I think uh, no, my school was more football. Um, played two games, I think, at school. Won one against the team, another team who didn't play, and then we played against Quegs in Blackburn and got beat by about 200 runs. <laughs> so. so you're very much a product of family, club, and the Lancashire age group setup. Yeah, absolutely. My school were very helpful. They were, you know, they were always keen to let me go to every representative fixture and training thing going. Um, the representative stuff, because I lived on the border of Lancashire and Yorkshire, I went to school in Lancashire, which made me qualified for Lancashire schools. Um, but the first instance I remember was our club having winter nets at Burnley, and there was a coach called Jim Kenyon. Oh, yeah. He was connected down here. <coughs> so he, he brought me down, and that was my first connection to the club. Jim Kenyon was uh, one of the stalwarts of the coaching setup in Lancashire in that in the 80s uh, and way before that as well. And he must have brought quite a few um, young cricketers into into Lancashire's uh, books, I would say. Yeah, there's a lot of players of certainly my era, older and younger, who have good things to say about Jim. So I remember him coaching me in a similar way to what my dad would do. You know, challenging you. Can you do this? You know, what about the in-swinger? I want, I want to see three out-swingers, all that stuff. So that's good coaching. You know, back mm. in the day when coaching wasn't really a, a, a learned thing, it was just experienced cricketers helping lads along the way. Well, it wasn't an occupation then, was it, no. coaching? I, I mean, I, I think coaching has only really come into, um, into its own as a profession, if you like, probably during your time in the game. Would you, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. When I started, we basically had a manager, didn't we? Mm. We'd call him coach or manager. Mm. And again, he would help us become better at cricket. But a lot of the learnings were from your teammates as well in those days. Uh, so, OK, so you, you, teammates, who were, the, who were the biggest influences early in your career, apart from your dad, obviously? Mm. Uh, well, all the, all the fellas I played with at the club, I mean, that was a... An enjoyable and tough school, you know, a lot of uh, what you'd call sledging and grown-up stuff in the leagues, people falling out with each other. But that, you know, that sort of made you appreciate what playing cricket against adults is like. And then as you move through, I was lucky enough to play above age in age group cricket. So you look at, I played with people like John Crawley, two years older, Ronnie Irani, um, people like that. So you're constantly learning off, uh, from people who are more, more advanced, if you like, with more experience. 
And then coming into Lancashire's team, um, that was pretty daunting in a way because certainly early on in my career, I think we had everybody else in the first team had played for England. Uh, mm. So we had a whole host of quality cricketers from overseas as well as, you know, homegrown players, others, Neil Fairbrother. When I started, I think Neil Fairbrother was captain. Then we had Mike Watkinson, others, um, Graham Gally Lloyd. and Crawley. Gally and Crawley, De Freitas, Wazim Akram, obviously a key influence, Peter Warren. Martin, Warren Haig. I mean, the list is, goes on and on. Mm. Um, so how influential were your peers then? Because you, did, you didn't play, uh, I, I, I hesitate to say this, but like any player who goes on and has a really substantial career, he didn't play many second team games. No, a handful. Mm. Um, I so you're learning on the job, basically. Yeah, you are. I'd played second team from 16, um, briefly at 16, then more at 17. Joined the staff on a summer contract in 92. And I think the team was struggling with illness and injury. And, I'd, and old age. And old age. <laughs> Me. You, you were still around. <laughs> yes. Telling us what to do at Crosby one day. Oh, I remember. <laughs> that, that, I remember. Yeah, yeah. God. Um, but I'd done well in the second team, and I was whisked off down to Hove to make my debut in down there. And when you when you came into the first team, it was predominantly as a bowler. Yeah. And obviously you were raw, um, but you would have had some thoughts and ideas about what your main strengths were. What were they? I think my bowling was quite developed from a young age. I think at you know, 13, 14, I had the skills and the, the accuracy required probably better than most at that age. So I was always confident of, of those areas of my game. The bit I always remember, and it's probably different, completely different to lads nowadays, is that I'd not, I didn't have any contact with professional cricket as a youngster because we lived quite a long way from Old Trafford. There was no thought to come and watch a game here. I think my first game that I watched, I was probably 16. Maybe watched a couple at Headingley when I was nine or ten. But the concept of being a pro didn't really dawn on me until I was offered a contract. So that was the, that was the thing. Different to now, we've got the academy, we've got lads coming through who believe they've a chance to play professional cricket. Didn't really dawn on me till I, maybe when I went on the under-19s tour with England and then getting the contract. So it was all pretty quick and mm. it's like, oh my word. You know? There's already an element and a theme of being self taught and self-reliant in in your development uh, would you say that that has carried through now into your coaching uh, mantra if you like your philosophy on coaching well I keep trying to keep trying to learn and become more aware of certain things certainly as a young player I did, not that I didn't believe in coaching we didn't know what it was to, to that degree I, I was always prepared to listen to people I respected, rightly or wrongly. Um, mm. People I thought knew what they were talking about. But at the same time, I was fairly argumentative as a youngster. I thought... I what did, do you mean as a I youngster? Did think, <laughs> <laughs> I did think I knew best quite a lot of the time. That's something I try my best not to let uh, enter into my coaching theory. Um, and as a coach, now I think where I'm at is that try and constantly make it about the player and the team rather than about yourself. Obviously, we still make mistakes, but um, I think that's the key. The players know a lot more than you think sometimes. So try and get the knowledge they have out into the open. Yeah, it's an interesting progression, really, for, for you as a bowler, coming from uh, where you came from, not having an awful lot of um, what you would call formal coaching, that you decided that that's where you would go um, once you were coming towards the end of your playing career. What, what actually prompted that? Where did the spark come from? And why did you think you wanted to become a coach? Oh, I think as I got older as a player, probably around 28, that kind of age, I began to see what good people running teams could do and what they could do for a team. And it's not about, it's not always about technical coaching. Um, there is a, a big element of that at certain parts of the year. But it's how a team performs as a unit and there's a whole load of things that go into that. And I think one thing that teams do now, probably in some ways better than we used to because they've more resources, is they perform day in, day out with energy. And that comes down to all sorts of different things. You know, I think the players I played with early on, 
given the facilities and the training today, would be superb players. But, you know, absolutely. But I think if you give players the right level of help, you can help players who might have been fringe players become quality players. Um, so more players come through into the system. The best are still going to be the best. But there are ways you can help. And sometimes that might just be to help them think about their game. And there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of other things that impact on players negatively nowadays. Distractions, mm. more distractions than ever. Mm. You know, we spoke about the game constantly because there wasn't the elements of professionalism that there are now. So we were in the bar talking about the game, learning from each other, inadvertently, if you like. You're the last of a, of a whole long line, I think, uh, of players who used to do that, spend time after the game talking about cricket. Um, and you were very much uh, an individual, a player who led by example. Heart, bowling fast, opening the bowling, bowling plenty of overs a day is tough work. It really is hard work. You have to go through all sorts of uh, strifes and stresses to be able to perform. So you led by example as a bowler and then as a captain. How does that transfer into coaching now? Because it's much harder to do that. You can't do it. You, you can you can lead by example in the way that you do your job as well as you possibly can, and that's the I think that's the overriding concept that as a captain and as a bowler you wanted to be seen as someone who could do the hard yards. Um, however tough it got, you always wanted to to set that example, um, and you had to enjoy it. You know, at the end of the day, I enjoyed that. Um, the only way that I can think right now that transfers into coaching is do your job as well as you can, and that. You know, that's not me bowling 20 overs in the next nets to show them I can do that. It's do the right things as a coach. Does um, Do you get frustrated as a coach? Uh, uh, whether it be about tactics, players, attitude, what is the thing that does frustrate you? Or do you, do you put those frustrations to one side, of, one side and concentrate on, on the good things, if you like? Well, it's not a perfect world, so you can't you can't walk around saying I don't get frustrated about anything. Um, players have massive challenges nowadays. The, the county clubs have huge challenges. The schedule of, of world cricket has changed massively over the last few years. They're challenges we've got to overcome. We've got to understand what our job is because we can't just have a squad of players for Lancashire and expect them to all play for Lancashire all year. We're going to be pulled around a bit by different players' schedules be that international cricket, franchise cricket, um, tour games during the season, all sorts of things. So we've got to plan accordingly and try and be as strong as we can day in, day out, all year long. Um, in terms of players' attitude, I try not to get frustrated because what we do is a lot of work to make sure we've got good people, good lads here. And we have, absolutely. So there's not much frustration there. Um, if there is, you pick it up and you and you try and get better. But um, over the course of time, especially when a team's being pulled around, you need people who come into the environment and out of it and come back with energy and enthusiasm, respect for their teammates and want to do well for the club. And if you've got those, then things tend to run a bit better. Let's come to that back to that in a minute. I just want to wind the clock back a little. Uh, it's over 10 years now since Lancashire won the county championship. You were captain at the time. Um, there were all sorts of constraints placed upon you then. You didn't have Old Trafford as a base because it was being uh, transformed. The square was being turned round. Um, you'd already been playing the best part of 20 years. And that win, that county championship win, just came out of the blue to those that weren't really associated with Lancashire. How did you formulate that season's plan? Was it down... Was it down to you? There must have been elements from outside as well. But that was a phenomenal effort to win the county championship then. Mm. So Peter Moores came to the club in 2009. I think we'd finished fourth in both of those years leading up to 2011. But at that moment, the team had theoretically weakened a little bit. We lost some senior players, Stuart Law, people like that. And um, I think there was... An area of naivety. I mean, I was I was a senior player, but I, you know, I wasn't a coach yet. But you had I, much captaincy experience. Yes, yeah, so I'd done I'd Three done the years. previous two years, yeah, okay. so I was into the role then, and I was 
not frustrated, but I was determined that we could go better than fourth place. Um, and I think there was an attitude around, we just said, right, we're going to win the championship this year. And that's not always the best thing to say because <laughs> that can create early issues if you start losing games. You can go from thinking you're going to do that to being nowhere. But we had a group of young players who were, who were hungry and I think we just decided to let's challenge ourselves because there's nothing lost with that. Um, we just said we're going to win the championship. That's our aim, simple as that. And that's what we said. We needed a good start to do that. Um, but fortunately, that's, that's what we got. Uh, the final game of the year was down at Taunton, obviously. You were uh, suffering from uh, all the strains and stresses that, you, that bowlers suffer from as they go through a season. You'd got a slightly, I don't know whether it was pulled or torn, or it certainly wasn't torn ripped but it wasn't clever your hamstring uh, and you just powered through powered on through um, <laughs> I think that sums you up to be perfectly honest in in, <coughs> in uh, if somebody had to say what defines Glenn Chapel, that that last game probably would be it would that be fair I hope so um, I just I still can't work that game out in terms of my personal injury. I've torn a lot of muscles in my time and I know what a torn muscle feels like and I think into about the fourth over on day one I tore a hamstring to the point where I couldn't walk so I'm thinking all right so I had to go off get some ice on it get some strapping on it and for the rest of that ne the next two sessions it was just behaving like a, a properly torn hamstring so I thought I was done. I think back end of the day might be remembering this wrong but Back end of the day, we had a, po a point where, you know, there was nothing to lose. So well, I went back out there and I, you can always bowl a little bit, hobble around, but it wasn't much better. I had some incredibly tight strapping on it by Sam, the physio. And But as I went on, it sort of eased a bit. It was still tugging, but it eased a bit. But bizarrely, by the end of the game, it was probably 70% right <laughs> and you know talk about bowling through injuries well and we talk about that a lot as both I, I don't who knows because I never got it scanned maybe it was me inventing something maybe there was nothing there maybe it was a weird cramp didn't feel Tension. like that could have been something like that no it? I mean who knows but yeah. I don't <laughs> I can't say that yeah I can play with a torn hamstring because that's obviously not true um, but for whatever reason fortunately it got better and allowed me to play a part in the game you've been well, would you say that's the pinnacle of your, of your career, winning the county championship in 2011? In terms of a long-term achievement, mm. because it's, just look at the history around Old Trafford, it's hard to win a championship here for whatever reason. We haven't managed it. Maybe that's a load of different reasons in different years. But um, to do it with a young team, you know, 16 games I think it was in those days, it takes mm. a, a collective effort for a long period of time. So I think, yeah, in terms of effort-wise and focus, because it, it's an achievement over six months. It's not just a final. Hmm. You've been fortunate enough to play with a number of top class, maybe the best in the world, cricketers in your time at Lancashire. Um, two would be Wazim Akram and Murali. Um, there are others as well. Who would you Who would you say was... Uh, not necessarily most influential, but um, the best you've you've played alongside. Well, those two are obviously right up there. I mean, p watching Was Bowl was just it made fielding enjoyable when we didn't enjoy fielding so much. But you know, I'd stand at fine leg watching Warren flying around behind <laughs> the stumps, and the batters, you know, basically Clueless. either petrified or amazed at what's coming down. Um, <clears throat> Did he teach you much? Yeah. Did you ever did you ever get to master reverse swing which he was the he was the uh, well I suppose he was the one of the pioneers of Yeah I think I was decent at it I wouldn't say master it because he mastered it so I didn't do what he yeah. did but I learned from him and you know early on yeah it was going against the way it should go as reverse swing but learning what length to bowl with it is quite important sometimes on different surfaces um, and he was very influential he used to be standing at mid-off and say you know he used to say drop your shoulder 
hit back of a length because people used to think you put it up there when it's reversing. Well, he said if you hit back of a length, it tends to look like it does more. Um, obviously, there's a reverse swing in Yorker that demolishes the stumps, but you don't always have the pace for that, or the batter might be up to that. But, you know, a few subtle tactical things he was great with. The other players, well, there's an, another, there's a, a load of them. Um, I bowled at Stuart Lowe for a few years, and then... When he was playing yeah, for Essex. Yeah, so he played for Essex. And in the crazy days when we had a Sunday league game in the middle of a championship game, I'm pretty sure he got 100 first innings, 100 on Sunday and 100 second innings. Mm. So we were pretty pleased when he came and, and signed for us. We, and Yeah, he was a phenomenal batter. What did he average for like 60 odd, 70? Yeah. So yeah. class-wise, in the brilliant Aussie team of that era, in my mind, he was as good. Only played one test. One test, 50 odd, not out. Mm. Mm. Uh, does that um, rankle with you that you never got more of an opportunity to play for England? <laughs> I always say no, um, and I can see the reasons why I didn't at certain times. I also think they made a mistake quite a few times, if I'm honest, because I look at the people who've played and I've no, I've no problems with the good players who played a lot of tests. Mm. That's absolutely fine. And if I'm honest, I, I'm quite clear that I wanted to play if I want to look back on an England career, it wants to be 50 tests. Mm. So two or three wouldn't bother me. It's not That doesn't bother me at all. Um, so way over it now. Not, not a problem. It's just cricket at the end of the day. Exactly. Nothing you can do about it no. now. Uh, <laughs> suffice to say that you can um, take great uh, joy from the career you've had at Lancashire, um, which isn't over yet, quite clearly. Uh, let's just move it forward now because your playing days are obviously gone, e even <sighs> though... Even though you'd, you'd <laughs> quite like to carry on, um, they've gone. But you've been head coach for a number of years now, um, and you must still enjoy that challenge. What is it that that really sustains you and keeps you going as a head coach? I think the big thing is I want to see a, I want to see a team go out there and play together and be strong together and win. Obviously, I want to I want to help put together a, a team full of quality. But it's that idea of building a team to win, st win something and to know that you've earned it over a period of time. Um, so then every season's quite demanding. But by the time you've had four or five weeks off, you start to be constantly thinking about what you need to do January, February, March mm. to get ready for the new season. But I think with a club I've been at for so long, <clears throat> I just want to help us bring some success back because we've we've now been through a period where if you put our collective results together I think we'd be the most successful team in the country we just haven't won mm. but we need to keep putting ourselves in those positions playing good cricket all year to give ourselves that chance but just keep believing that when we keep getting there we'll be successful but the, the overriding thing is to get a squad together who enjoy playing together and we'll go out there and give 100%. How does the head coach role differ from being, say, just a bowling coach? Less time with individual players. And that's the big challenge, is to make sure you spend enough time with the individuals who want that time. You can still coach, and we do. So currently we don't have a specialist full-time batting coach. But as experienced coaches, I think we we all feel that we can we can help in those areas. And obviously, last season our batters had an incredible year. But less yeah less time spent with individuals because you're always thinking about what the whole what the whole needs. Yeah, during your time in the game, thirty years. Um, I think we've already touched on this. Coaching has become um, it, it's it's developed away from the periphery and it I, I think it probably was on the periphery when you started to becoming a mainstream function now where teams have they don't just have one coach they'll have specialist coaches for bowling batting spin bowling fielding wicket keeping etc etc um, and the the skills within those different co coaching uh, elements have become greater and greater. Let's, let's just take bowling, for instance, fast bowling. Um, when you and I, when you 
played, uh, started playing, variety and variation wasn't really on the agenda. It was about consistency of performance. Now we're looking at variety in all forms of the game becoming predominant, aren't we? Mm. We're looking at bowling, wobble seam. I mean, wobble seam's become a, a standard ball. I don't know, it used to be, oh, I've missed the seam this time. But, mm. uh, reverse swing has come through the, you know, all sorts of different adaptations have, uh, have come into the game in your time. So you, you are constantly adapting from the old school type of player and coach into very much a, a modern phenomenon. Would, ha, has that been difficult? It's enjoyable, to be honest. So as a player, I grew up, as a bowler, I grew up certainly with in-swing and out-swing and holding length. They're the key principles to fast bowling in, in, in England. And you'd have bowlers who weren't swing bowlers, they were called seam bowlers, and that might be because they bowled a wobble seam hmm. or a very straight seam, but that's a skill in itself. Um, as soon as you tilt the seam in swinging conditions, it will, it will swing. Um, but there's a, there's a whole raft of different things now. So, for instance, the skill of a bowler in white ball cricket at the highest level, they have to bowl everything. They have to be able to bowl the old-fashioned Yorker, but they have to be better at it than they used to because the ball's harder now and the batters have practised hitting the full half volley or the low full toss. Um, you have to cramp for room. You can't give any width. When the batter moves, you have to know whether to follow or to go wide. When you go wide, you have to be able to hold length if that's, if that's what the ground dimensions or the pitch need. Slow ball, if you bowl a wide slow ball, you need to be able to bowl the best will be able to bowl a full one, a length ball, a slow ball. And people watching on TV from the old school will be saying, he's just bowling a load of rubbish. Hmm. He's all over the place. Slow ball bouncers, all these things. But that's in, that's in coaching. It's in players' minds now. So when they're pre prepared to play against good players, powerful players who can hit it 15 rows back, when you're running into bowl with the right field, which who knows what that is, unless you've planned properly and even then, the good players can deal with that sometimes. Mm. But you're not just thinking, I'm going to take him one side. What's his body shape when he's trying to hit the ball? Will a length ball be better than a short ball? Will, will a full ball deceive him more? It's unending, never ending. Mm. And that's really exciting as a coach, learning these, these new tactics as you go along. It's a classic topic and it's very relevant at the current time because essentially what we're talking about here is one day white ball cricket and variation and mm. being able to adapt but uh, you and I well know that over the last six months, with the way England are starting to play red ball cricket under the influence of McCollum and, and uh, Stokes and Key, that those sort of elements are coming into, into red ball cricket nowhere better served than that test um, in Royal Pindy that England have won on the flattest pitch you would ever wish to see. Um, so <laughs> my point being... The game continues to evolve and all for the better in my view. So let's just concentrate on red ball cricket for a minute. Do you see the, the influence of the way that England have played in the last six, month, six months uh, drilling down into the county game? Without question. Already has. <coughs> um, I think it's been documented that Brendan doesn't like the term basball, so he's not suggesting there's any element to that. But the, the principles they're playing by is their, their willingness to lose in order to win, shake off the fear of losing Red Bull games, which is inherent in all of us, because a draw was always seen as valuable. When you play in a relegation system, a draw will always be valuable. But how can we get ourselves to think win above all else? And if we lose, fine. So I think that mantra, that, that idea, is going to influence everybody in the game. Even more importantly, it makes Red Bull cricket enjoyable because they're watching and hopefully the supporters are thinking, yeah, we can take a loss because they're playing such enjoyable cricket and they will win more than they lose because they're a good team. Um, so 
without doubt, it's already inspired players. It's made coaches think about the best way forward for their team. You still have to do the best thing for your team. You can't copy someone else's methods. But I think the idea that winning is more important than potentially losing mm. is something we can all learn from. Are players, batters in particular, going to come to you, do you think, over, over time and say, um, red ball cricket, Glenn, I, I want to play the way um, that England are playing? Mm. It's my way to that, success. It's yeah, my abs way to, absolutely. to better myself. Two things spring to mind there is continuity of selection gives a player a chance to do that. So England is, is showing openly that they're backing players. That also gives players less chance to get in the team. But if you're going to ask players to take risks, they have to be sported. Um, we want to win games of cricket, so how can we find ways to create space in a game to give yourself a chance to bowl a team out if the pitch is hard work? That's what England did in Ralph Pindi. They scored at such a ridiculous rate, they had the time, and eventually they won out. So they're the sort of things that you, you need to think about. English condi conditions changed drastically, so in the summer England were playing aggressive cricket on pitches that were doing a little bit. And they were sailing even closer to the wind there because, you know, a couple of pieces of bad luck early on and all of a sudden you've lost wickets. But they were saying, no, we're going to keep going. Mm. Uh, quite a relevant point, this. Can, can you see and would you advocate Lancashire playing their red ball cricket in that way? Well, if you look at the, the run rates from last season, we scored at quite a bit quicker than we had done previously. And we have players who are, who are erring towards that style of cricket. Uh, Luke Wells, for instance, mm. his early career was a was a traditional opening batter. His strike rate is now one of those along with the England players. He's going out there and, and trying to boss the game from ball one, taking it on. Keaton had an amazing season. His strike rate as he gets in is going through the roof. Mm. So he's taking his game to another level. The captain, Dane, has always been an aggressive player, but even more so this year. Mm. So, ab absolutely, but we're going to play how Lancashire want to play, mm. and we're going to decide that. But absolutely, we're looking to win games of cricket, so we'll, we'll be trying. OK, we're coming towards the, the, the final part of this, um, beyond the boundary. What, are you happy with where Lancashire are, Lancashire cricket are, at the moment, and how do you foresee... The, the short term short term future medium term future of, of Lancashire cricket well if you look at the squad that we have without any players being away then it's we've got a terrific set of players at Lanx all through the age ranges we've just taken on three new players one early on in the season two new players Josh Boyd and Tom Aspenwall um, Matthew Hurst so and then I'm doing a little bit of work with the academy and you see what's coming up. So we, we, we'll always have potential pros in our pathway. So absolutely, in terms of resources, player-wise, we're in a good position. And you look at the results over the last what, couple of seasons, second in the championship twice, two more seconds in one-day trophies. We're right up there in terms of challenging for everything whilst we've got young players coming through. So... It puts a bit of pressure on because there's expectation there, but that's where we want to be and we want to you know, keep getting better, but we've got the players coming through to do that. There's no miracle switch that you can click to get to number one, but that's obviously your ultimate aim to win trophies. Yeah, I think one thing you can look at and say, right, <laughs> unless the weather takes you out of it, to win a championship, if you're the best team, you've got a very good chance. So if you play the best cricket over the course of a season, you've got a very good chance. At the end of the day, in, in one-day competitions, you've got to win the last one. And you can't always control that, because when it comes down to one or two runs, you've got to just say, OK, we'll still look at the minute detail and we'll do what we could have done better. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got, to, you've got to win on the day. Glenn, many, many thanks for talking to us and many, many future successes for you and for Lancashire.
Welcome along to another edition of Beyond the Boundary with myself, Paul Allen. And uh, today I'm delighted to have the greatest left arm quick bowler in the history of the game alongside me. Played for Lancashire for 10 years, has become an adopted Lancastrian and had a wonderful international career with Pakistan. Wazi Makram, welcome along. Welcome, Thank you, Alt. Welcome back to em Emirates Old Trafford. Does it still feel a little bit special when you come back of to, course it does. to Manchester? When I was parking my car, so a lot of memories came rushing back. The playing days, obviously the ground has changed a lot for better. But uh, yeah, uh, every time I come here, I, la last time I was here about three years ago, when there was a COVID test, so yes, we were in yes. a bubble in the hotel. Yeah. But over and all, uh, playing for Lancashire has been the highlight of my cricketing career. You know, I'm writing my book. It's almost ready. It'll be out in November. Okay. So a lot of uh, positive stuff of Lancashire. For me, playing for Pakistan and coming to Lancashire was like a little oasis. Everything was comfortable. You guys just played cricket. And we had three senior players, Paul Allett, <laughs> Michael Watkinson, and Graham Fowler. <laughs> they used to have make fun of all the junior players. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. It was a tough school at times, I it agree. Was. But uh, it, it's great that you... Uh, hold Lancashire in such reverence and, and, and uh, such esteem. But tell us a little bit about where, how you came to, to come to Lancashire in the first place, because you were a very raw international cricketer in, in the late 80s and 88. Yeah. You, you hadn't much experience of, of Western culture. None. Uh, I don't think you had much experience of playing over here at all, had you? Not at all. I think in 86, uh, the great Imran sent me to play league cricket up north in mm. Durham. Okay. I played for uh, a club called Burnup Field. Yes. Uh, boundary was about 25 yards okay. one side. And uh, it was tough for me, you know, uh, as, as a, a kid from Pakistan coming to this weather and this country. But the idea was 87, we were touring. So just get the idea how the wickets work, mm. how the weather works. So I enjoyed it. We used to end up every night at that nightclub on, <laughs> you know, on the Newcastle River. On, <laughs> on a the ship. Tyne, the River Tyne. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I bet, and the fog on the Tyne was and all And then, yours. yes, coming back to your question, uh, 87, I think, or 88, 87, we were playing in Sharjah. Yeah. And Neil Fair brother was playing for England. He got picked up. And Laurie Brown, a physio, great guy, one of the best physios I've worked with, great yeah. human being too. They got hold of me there. Would you like to play for Lancashire? And remember those days, Lancashire uh, county cricket was, you got to be number one player in the world. Mm. Only one overseas was allowed to play in playing 11 and you can only register two. That's right. So I thought they were talking about Lancashire League. I said, yeah, sure, I'm ready for Lancashire League. They said, no, no, county. I said, really? So yeah, that was my first experience that I found out. And did you, you knew nothing <coughs> about county cricket, presumably? No idea. None. Nothing about it? Nothing about county cricket. I only read about it in Urdu magazines, cricketing Urdu magazines, that's how it works. But uh, when I arrived here, I remember in 1988, uh, but before that, in 87, there was a test match here at, uh, at Old Trafford. And uh, our chairman, Bob Bennett, at the time, he, uh, the Lancashire uh, think tank, they got my family here. Yeah. For my birthday surprise, they called everyone, my two brothers, my younger sister, my dad and mom, to, to celebrate my birthday here. I think it was on 4th of June, if I uh, remember correctly. But that was the first experience of me of, uh, you know, Lancastrian hospitality. So the club embraced you right from the word go, and yeah, you in turn embraced the club. It was <coughs> actually David Hughes and Alan Ormrod who were running the cricket department at the time, and yeah. they must have been the two that um, instigated your, your first appearances for Yes, for probably. And I remember uh, uh, they has, uh, both of them, David Hughes, Yosa and Alan, mm. has been a great influence early on as a 20-year-old kid come, coming from a different culture altogether and mixing up with, you know, Western culture. And they, hel they really helped me a lot. Remember the first time we met, um, we was a Forte Post House in Nottingham. That hotel on the first floor. Yes. And uh, Alan told me to come to team meeting at six o'clock in the evening, day before the game. I said, "Okay." He said, "It's in the bar." <laughs> okay. I said, "That's different." Yeah, <laughs> I come from. A yeah. you would not 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 a drinking culture. Yours. Exactly. <laughs> but again, uh, you guys. The minute I arrived, walked into that uh, wine at at the bar, you guys all shook hand and said, "Welcome to Lancashire." So that gave me a bit of confidence. And remember, the next day there was a game against Nottingham. And I was sitting in the corner right somewhere because huge seniors, I think, I don't know if it still happens or not, the senior players, they have their certain spots in each dressing room and they go and sit there. Mm. So you as a junior, <laughs> junior, you have to wait 
that everybody is comfortable, then you pick up your spot, if you get a spot. I, I remember wandering into a dressing room and somebody, it probably wasn't you, I'd have... Uh, was sitting in where I normally change. I said, listen, yeah. I've been changing I think it was 15 me. years. I think it was yeah, me. Well, <laughs> I, I would let you off. But that's a good culture, though. Yeah, I suppose, <laughs> it, uh, I, suppose it, uh, I suppose it is in a way, although it might be a bit outmoded now. Yeah, no, probably. Now then, your, your um, rise and uh, appearance in, in cricket f was quite extraordinary because you played very little first-class cricket, if any, in Pakistan. None. And you turned up and bowled at the, at the nets. Um, yeah, I, it was a, a camp of a Pakistan, a Pakistan camp. It was a camp for hundred kids, young kids, and I did, uh, you know, well for my club, uh, Ludhiana Jimkhana in Pakistan. So they, uh, you know, said this guy is good. So they go, my name was in that uh, in particular camp, and uh, uh, I remember first four days, mm -hmm. there were hundred kids, and including Ramiz Raja who played a Test cricket oh, by yeah. then, one Test, and Mohsin Kamal, another Test cricket cricketer, and top first class performers were there as well. So th nobody gave me the cricket ball to bowl, so I got a bit down, depressed. So I went back to my captain in the club, Sadiq Khan. I said, look, there's no point in me going. I've been standing there for four days. He said, no, no, you go tomorrow. I'll have a word with the camp commander, and he'll give you the ball. So the next day, three or four batters to go. He gave me the old ball. I impressed him for some odd reason. Aga Sadat Ali, another late test cricketer. And then the next day, he gave me the new cherry. And you see, I used to bowl big in-swingers then. And I troubled in almost everyone. to the right-hander. To the right-hander. Good ball from a left, <laughs> left arm quick. Good ball. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I impressed everyone there. And then Javed Miandad was the captain of Pakistan yeah. squad. So he came to practice. So Qadhafi Stadium is a huge ground. Yeah, yeah. So one side was our camp and his net was the other side. So he wanted some bowlers. So the camp commander said, you want to bowl at Javed Miandad? I said, what? Javed Miandad? I had a poster of him in my room. I would love to. Well, one of the best, one of the best Pakistan batsmen ever. Ever, ever. Uh, and one of the best in the world. In the world. So I went to bowl at him for a couple of days and he got impressed by me. And then New Zealand was touring Pakistan. And suddenly my name came in uh, to play against New Zealand team. Uh, first three-day game, President 11 versus the New Zealand side in Rawalpindi. I was over the wound. So was my family. Right. Javed Miyadad, Sarfaraz Nawaz, Tahir Nakash, all these tests, Ramiz Raja, Salim Malik. All these guys were in the squad. And Javed dropped, I think, Tahir Nakash or Sir Faraz to have me in playing 11. That was my first first class game. How, how on earth did you feel playing international cricket from straight out of club cricket? How yeah. on earth? Because that would, um, that would uh, well, it, it would cause issues for, for an awful lot of guys when you were 17, 18? I was 17. 17. Yeah, 18. So how did you feel? I, I think probably too young to I even bother I was too young it. to even bother about Absolutely spot on. Yeah. It was blessing in disguise. I didn't know probably half the team of New Zealand. I knew Martin Crow, Jeff Crow, uh, Jeff Howard, John Reed, Jeremy Connie, the big names there, you know, yeah, cricketing. Yeah. And they were a good team. Good, great time. team at the time. Yeah. So I got seven for 50 in first innings. I don't know how. And second inning, two for 50. I was just running in and ball. And well, I, I didn't know at the reverse swing at the time. But it was just happening. I know how. How? <laughs> because you're a good bowler. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, were you, as qu were you quick? And, and presumably you were raw then. As you I was say, raw. I you say, I don't know how. But you did swing the ball. You swung the new ball. But, and but you had this, you, you had this very, yeah, very remember quick arm. Yeah, Pindi wicket was like a, like a road. Mm. You know how Pakistani, flat, 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 no, flat no grass, no bounce. But uh, uh, I've got, uh, I think before lunch, I got John Wright caught, caught in second slip. And then from there onwards, just everybody walked in. I would just start bowling full. And everybody was getting leg before bowled. So, yeah, I think I was too young and naive. It was a blessing in disguise that I didn't know who the players were. And Yeah, and you didn't have time to worry about it, no. presumably. So, so um, what about your development then? Because... You're, you're set into the world stage straight away. Yeah. Uh, and you've got this natural, raw talent. Were you allowed just to carry on doing that? Or was there some um, pressure on you to, to change what you were doing? Oh, there was no pressure. I had very good mentors in Javed Miyadad yeah. and then Mudassar Nazar, who still oh, yeah. lives in Manchester. He does, yeah. Well travelled person uh, in Mudassar, yeah. yeah, well travelled, who also helped me off the field. And then. 
that was on New Zealand tour. And then Imran was joining us. He was playing for New South Wales. Mm -hmm. So he was joining us. We were then we were meant to tour to uh, go to tour uh, for to Australia for mini World Cup in 1985, mm. where India I think won eventually. India Pakistan went the finals. So I played. I think my first game was against Windies or against Australia, and I got five for 21, first top five wickets. Again, just bowling full, not no control of the swing. That I learned eventually. But in the beginning, just come and bowl and hit the right areas, and that's what I did. And Imran was standing at mid-on, you know, telling me on every delivery what to do. So that, as a young kid, was a huge confidence. My hero was telling me what mm. to do, and I, I listened to everything he wanted me to do. And I think that's how I, I sort of got into the groove of test cricket. Was, was Imran a, a good teacher, a good mentor? Mm. Did he allow you to develop naturally? Yes. Or was he, was he dictatorial? No, he, he was very easy, whatever I'm comfortable with. But he always he always wanted me to work hard when I was eight, 17, 18. He, mm. You know, those were the tra trades I've learned from him, me, mm. and that Mudassar, that, you know, talent can stay for two, three years, and the hard work can prolong that talent for another, say, 20 years, 15 mm. years. Mm. And I think that's where I have to come back to Lancashire. Uh, when I played in 88, I remember getting my first 100 here, first class 100. And in 89, I became the number one player in the world. Mm. That one six months of county cricket, playing with you guys day in, day out, traveling. And you guys were very helpful. You were helpful as a bowler, our captain. I, yours are. <laughs> I don't know. It's, a very, it's probably the best compliment that anybody's ever paid me to say, for you to say that I help you with your bowling. Um, uh, but I'm flattered. I do remember um, giving you. Uh, a real kick up the backside once when you came off because you said your nose was running and you didn't feel very well. Yeah, Tunbridge I remember. Wells, do you remember? Yes, I remember. Uh, I remember that game as well. Tunbridge uh, Wales. I don't want to play there anymore. <laughs> no. I never liked it there. So I said, come on, this is hard work. Bowling is hard work. Yeah, I remember. So you have to bowl even though you might not be feeling great, you might not be bowling great. So that might have been a lesson. Probably. I think tough love sometimes works. Yeah, yeah. And I'm glad you did that. It, it helped me. And you see, the whole team was behind me, the captain, the club. Yeah. I, I remember they would put me in this hotel. Is still there or not? Trafford Hotel? Just oh, the down hotel. the road. Yeah. Down the road. Well, Bob Bennett, used to, the chairman, used to stay there, Yeah, so he? they gave me a no, room No, I don't there. think he's still there now. Nah. But it was all right at the it time. It was okay. So I, w I went, uh, so we went to play away games. Uh, we were away for two weeks, two and a half weeks. I yeah. came back. They checked out. They checked me out. <laughs> I couldn't find my clothes. I said, where are my clothes? They said, we checked you out. I thought you're not coming back. <laughs> so we had some great stories. But again, when I bought my place uh, here uh, at the time, I remember I must uh, give compliment to this uh, Pakistani uh, uh, Sufi Sadiq. He's still around. Mm. Uh, accountant, he says, I'll help you with your accounts and all. Mm. Uh, I said, I need to, I said, ask Lancashire. He said, you buy a house. I said, buy a house? I'm 20 years old. I have no money. What do you mean buy a house? So get a mortgage. I said, what's mortgage? Mm. Then he explained, we have six-year contract. So Lancashire gave me a six-year contract. First time any overseas yeah, yeah. player got such a long contract. Yeah. So that shows the shrewdness of the skipper, Yoza, and of course, Alan, that they realized this guy can actually... Well, those, those were the golden days of, of uh, uh, county cricket being yeah. able to sign overseas players long term because now of course there's so much cricket you, 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 you can't can sign it. somebody for two weeks but and you, like, you were available for us virtually all the time except when Pakistan were touring England. yeah and because there was no there, there was there was cricket was not all year round mm. it was only Pakistan season from, from September October onwards till March that's right and then county started from April onwards till August September okay so county cricket was uh, essential in your formative years yes uh, it, when because you're such a pioneer and because you are one of the best bowlers there's ever been with the, the, the record, you've got over 900 international wickets across one-day internationals and test matches, 400, over 400 in test matches, over 500 in one-day internationals. Um, it wasn't all about just running in and bowling fast. You pioneered uh, the ability to reverse swing the ball, which is yeah. now, which is now and if you remember, I wouldn't say it's commonplace, but it, 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 it's a fundamental part of the modern game. Yeah, it really is. Now it's called reverse swing. It used to be ball tampering then, mm. if you remember. Well, <laughs> so they said. But you used to throw me the ball when you yeah. were bowling at the other end. I couldn't swing it. Yeah. You used to bowl without swing, and suddenly the ball is going towards yeah, the next side. Bit, a little bit. And then a eventually you got the hang of it. You said, yeah. OK, if it's going in, I'm going to just pitch outside off stump. Yeah. And I remember the first year when there was used to be rain, I used to take Gehan Mendes 
yeah. at Nets. Yeah. And you got me, uh, Walter, Paul got me on the side and said, Vaz, listen, I know you're young. <laughs> There's six months to go. <laughs> yeah. So just take it easy. Because <laughs> you used to roar in, didn't you? In the yeah. Nets. Nobody wanted to face you in the Nets because you were, you were unplayable. But I think nowadays, obviously, mindset has changed. Mm. The more you bowl, you know, a lot of youngsters ask me, how should I increase my pace? What to do? It's a very simple answer. The more you bowl, the quicker you'll become. Because mm. your bowling muscle gets strong. And bowling muscle is not just one particular muscle. It's everything in your body. Mm. And I think nowadays you bowl six, or, uh, six deliveries, eight deliveries, and say 12 deliveries, say, okay, I'm done. Okay, thank you very much. Mm. So probably cricket is too much, but mindset has changed over the years, sure. But reverse swing didn't just happen. Uh, no, you, must have, you, you must have developed this in, uh, in line with, with Wakar, probably. And, Wakar came a little later. Imran, Imran. Imran was Udassar the one. Udassar and Imran. Yeah. They were the one who actually taught me how to reverse swing. And I remember you being um, absolutely paranoid about keeping the ball dry when yeah. we were out there. The rough side. Just keep it dry. Keep it dry. Don't Do not spit shine. on it. Don't, yeah. don't put sweat on it. Especially dry. the rough side. Yeah, yeah. And I remember our spinner, good, very good spinner, Gary Yates. Yes. He used to bowl like this. Yes, he did. And I had to go at him three, four <laughs> times. I said, you better change your habit, buddy. Because the rough side, if it gets soft, then it won't reverse. The rough yeah. side has to be rough. And shiny side has to be shiny. And we had a, a, a at Lancashire, we had a wonderful ten years when you were oh, eighty-eight, incredible. To ninety-eight. We won all those one day, uh, one day games, and you you were actually uh, a constant in that team. But there were actually two teams because the old guard, like myself, Graham Fowler, Guillaume Mendes, moved on in about ninety-one, ninety-two. Yes, and then you had. Uh, another crop of lads with the Avertons and the Fair, well, Fairbrother was there as well. As well. Um, Crawley. Peter Marin uh, came in. Chapel. Pe Peter Martin Peter came Martin. in. Chappie Chapel. came in a little later. Then Bumble, Junior mm. Bumble. Ian Austin, the great mm. man. Yeah. Uh, what, a, what a performer he had been for Lancashire in shorter format. Who was who was the, the, the guys that stuck out most for you in, in Lancashire? Who were, the, who, were mean, the, who were the guys that you really... Um, I admired or got on with or whatever. I mean, you guys were seniors. I had always admired you as a, as a senior players. But of course, Harvey Neil Fairbrother is a very good friend of mine. Still, we are in touch. Ian Austin was where I was very close to. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe he's got a bar now in uh, wherever he's I living. Th Beautiful he, wine bar. I think he, yes, he has. Yeah, and he's a granddad. He's, he is, and he yeah. sells beer as well. Oh, on top brilliant. Of that, which he was always destined to do. <laughs> destined to do, absolutely. <laughs> no, but all the, everyone, I mean, it's difficult to name any, but everyone was so helpful. Yeah. And it was fun for me to coming to Lancashire. It was like coming back home, no, no political thing, no politics in cricket. You come, you play, you go home, you have a good laugh, and the next day you start again. You said earlier on, um, right at the start of this, this was your happiest time. Yeah. When you were here, when you were playing here, you probably felt the pressure was off a little bit and you enjoyed uh, playing in county cricket. But we surely winning the World Cup in 92 must have been the pinnacle. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think for every sport ma sportsman is basically ideas to represent your, uh, you know, your, your country's team in a World Cup and then winning it. And then, of course, being man of the match, and that too against the mighty England side at the mm. time. They were the most experienced team in the world, mm. uh, as far as one day cricket concerned. But yeah, that was uh, one of the best moments, in fact, the best moment of my life. What did it feel like? Um, because there was this aura about you. I remember standing next to Warren Hegg at Slip. Uh, Warren was yeah, Warren I forgot was keeping, name. Yeah, yeah, Warren keeping wicket to you, and he must have been—he must have been one of the best keepers you ever bowled. Absolutely. To. I don't think I can't remember him dropping a catch off you. No, and very you bowled, rare. You bowled ninety miles an hour and swung it and hooped it round. He was corners. one of the best keepers I think who kept uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on my bowling. He was phenomenal and a great and, and, and a great guy as well off yeah, the field. Yeah, yeah. Still, he's very he helpful, is. very easy going, hard worker. But getting back to you, you had this aura about you, and I, I know standing at slit, twenty yards back, yeah. watching you run in, there was a there was a fear and a trepidation in the batsmen facing you because they didn't know whether that you were going to hit them on the toe or on the nose. On the nose, I think that's what I've learned in country cricket. Uh, that's why the experience matters. Playing in under different condition matters, and and every ground is different in England. Mm. The weather is always nice. Mm. It's not, I mean, if it's 20, 26 degrees in England, you say it's a heat wave. No, it's not. <laughs> heat wave is in Pakistan right now. It's 41 it's 40. degrees. 40. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, that that also helped. And remember, we used to have a, a, a playing deck as well. And the next deck, uh, next was pitch, each side used to be dry as well without the grass. 
that boys can throw one bounce as well yeah. because the reverse swing. So that helped a lot as well. I think yes. every, if I mean even in my book is coming out in November, the Lancashire stories are quite funny and and uh, memorable and happy times. Brian Lara, Ricky Ponting, um, and Viv Richards have all gone on record to say that you were the the best bowler they ever faced. Wow. That's pretty serious. That's, uh, that, that, that's huge, coming from the greats of the game. Yeah. And I think uh, it was because of my quick arm action, maybe. And you my were very up. difficult to pick up. Yeah. You had this scampering run. And I learned, quick run. And I learned things as well. I was the only left-hander who went around the wicket, if you remember. Well, you started this. Yeah, I started this trend. You did. And I used to run, uh, I used to run behind from behind the umpire. The umpire. Mm. I said, why not? And now leap out. Yeah, nowadays I see bowlers, even T20 format, they're getting hammered every ball. They don't change anything. No. So as a bowler, what's my job is to create a doubt in batsman's mind. Mm. If things are not going well, just have your run of diagonal. Di di diagonal. Mm. Just bowl the same delivery you want mm. to, mm. But do something different. But you were capable of bowling around the wicket and swinging the ball <coughs> away from the right hand. Yeah. Very difficult thing to do as a left, as a left arm bowler. I think uh, uh, both of these guys... Pass. Yeah, but I mean, nowadays, uh, uh, Shaheen Afridi. Yes. And then Mitchell Stark. Yes. Trent Bolt. Yes, yes. These but guys you were the are pioneer. Very, yeah, I started bowling around the wicket, different angle altogether. And as a right hander batsman, you if I'm bowling around the wicket, if you're batting, you have to, with the angle, you think ball's going to come in. Yeah. And if it just strays, ac goes across a bit, every time, every chance to take an edge. Uh, whilst we could talk for hours, um, and, and hopefully you'll come back and we'll do part two of this sure. at some point. But sure. But just before we go, I talked about the batters who said you were the best. Who was the hardest batsman to bowl at? You see, York? I played against uh, uh, great Viv Richards, Brian Lara, Sachin Tanulkar, Alan Border, Graham Gooch, Mike Gatting, Alex Stewart. These are the big names. But I think one of the best was who played against uh, me and Vakar against the worst was Martin Crow. Uh -huh. He always played us on a front foot. At 93 series, he got 200 out of three test matches. Pakistan won 3 0. I got 16 wickets in two games. I got injured. Vakar got 30 wickets in three test matches. And uh, he got two hundreds. And I think in England, uh, who really played both of us well with the new ball was Alex Stewart. Mm. Because he realized, I have to attack. Mm. I can't just block and wait for the semi-new ball. By the time, it'll be too, old, uh, too late. So, yeah, he was also quite difficult, especially. And in one-day cricket, I suppose uh, uh, Brian Lara and all these guys were there. But Gilchrist was the most difficult, especially when there were no bounces. Mm. Was it's been fantastic to talk to you, um, and I hope that you'll you'll come back and talk to us again. You're going to keep coming back to, to Emirates, Old Trafford, and absolutely Manchester? any time. I mean, I'm uh, 20 minutes away every summer. I'm here for a month and a half with my family. My boys are 23 and 21, 24 and 21. They were born here in Bidinshaw Hospital, mm -hmm. so they love coming here. They have a lot of memories of their mother as well. So yeah, love coming back, enjoying the weather, enjoying my little town, little Altrincham town. Just walk around and a messy. Just love it. Beautiful. Well, we love having you back. Thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you for everything that you've done for Lancashire and keep coming back. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thank you. At the time, I didn't really feel like I was trailblazing. I was just a, a young girl who loved cricket, had a passion for it. Because at the time, there was nowhere really for you to go. I never, I never believed I was good enough to play for England. I say it's his fault, I'm a number 11 now. The girl coming on now, this is where we cash in, this is where we get stuck in. And I got four for, and like not many overs. And my mum just turned around to me and went, that's, that's my daughter, by the way. He, you know, he always maintained that I was good enough to be there. It was nothing to do with being a girl. That was probably my goal, was just to do as much as I could for as long as I could. I remember that summer being, it just lit cricket up didn't it I must have had six hours sleep throughout the entire test match you know they've got a girl playing for them is she any good I remember being more nervous making my first team debut for Hayward than I was for my England debut you like the, a young Kate Cross to not have to do what I did not have to be the first girl to do things welcome along to Emirates Old Trafford for another edition of Beyond the Boundary and I'm delighted to say that today I've got a trailblazer alongside me None other than Kate Cross, the first girl to be admitted to the Lancashire Academy, the first uh, lady to play in the Central Lancashire League and one of the original centrally contracted players for England. Kate, I think it's pretty fair to say you are a trailblazer for women's cricket, isn't it? I think when you say all those things, I guess hindsight 
gives you a, a bigger picture. Obviously, at the time, I didn't really feel like I was trailblazing. I was just a, a young girl who loved cricket, had a passion for it, wanted to play as much as possible um, and was lucky enough to get those opportunities. So I think that the trailblazing kind of comes with the territory, but not what I intended. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Obviously, you wouldn't think that at the time, I, I don't think. But thinking about it, the first girl to be in, in the Lancashire Academy, going back to 2006, that must have been... Uh, a, a very interesting experience and, and possibly quite a scary one for you. Yeah, it was. I, again, I think at the time I was just delighted that I got another couple of training sessions in the week and I was getting to come here and, and do it at a ground that I'd watched a lot of cricket at and, you know, that felt really special. Um, but I do, I remember it being quite intimidating. I remember going to that first training session. I was 15 at the time and obviously my dad had to drive me because I couldn't drive. And I remember being really nervous on the drive in that, you know, I was going to be training with, at, at the time, what I thought were really elite athletes and, you know, young lads who could go on to play for Lancashire and, and England. Um, but I think that the thing that probably made it um, pretty big for me was the media attention around mm. being that first girl. And I'll always remember how John Stanworth remained so calm about his decision to select me. And, he, you know, he always maintained that I was good enough to be there. And if he'd seen a lad with the skill set that I had, he would have selected them to be in the academy. It was nothing to do with being a girl. Um, and I actually think that really helped me with my journey in cricket. Um, not that he took a chance, but, you know, he did something that was out of the norm. Well, that, that's probably how it should be. But it was in advance of its time then, wasn't it? I mean, it, it's how it would be perceived now. Yeah. But then, even though we're only talking not very many years ago 16 17 years ago it feels like a long time well yeah ago. maybe but 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 it was it was um out of the ordinary then yeah it was and like i said there was there was a lot of media attention around it and i had to get stuck into doing live interviews with sky and the bbc and um i remember doing these interviews and then week one of training when the academy actually started and we kicked into winter training week one was around media training and John got the cameras out and said, you know, you're going to have to get used to, to this. And I was thinking, I really could have done with this about 10 days ago when the, the media interest, uh, interest started. Um, but that, I, I always kind of maintain that that was the moment that I thought cricket's the sport for me. That I was playing a bit of netball at the time and I loved netball. Um, obviously played a lot of sport at school, but cricket was, that, that, that moment was like, you know, I could really take this seriously now. That, that's interesting because at the time, there was nowhere really for you to go, was there? There was no, no there was no professional women's cricket. I um, mean, in England played, and there was there was sort of amateur county cricket, but that's you, you couldn't have dreamt of forging a career in the game at that time. No, absolutely not. Obviously, like you said, there was no professionalism in the game. If it was, it was it was kind of semi-professional, and mm. the girls that were playing for England were paid Peanut. a basic wage to. You know, there was a lot of subsidising, a lot of coaching, a lot of work with Chance to Shine. But mm. I actually, it's hard to think what my aspirations would have been at that time because I never, I never believed I was good enough to play for England. But I always just want, like I said, I just wanted to play more cricket. And I felt like that was probably my goal was just to do as much as I could for as long as I could. Um, I'd been playing for Lancashire first team for two years at that point, which is quite a scary <laughs> thought as a 15 year old. <laughs> um, but I think, I don't, yeah, I don't know if I actually did have an aspiration to play for England. I think it was just more that I wanted to probably see what, what I could get out of myself and what the opportunities would bring. There is no doubt that it helped you coming from a sporting family. Your father obviously was a was a, a very good professional footballer your elder brother played decent cricket um, and uh, played good club cricket so sport within your family was extremely natural wasn't it yeah yeah there was no no doubt in the summer that I was having to play cricket with my brother in the back <laughs> garden I'm the youngest of three so almost the product of being told what to do and bossed around by by Bobby my older brother um, I always joke as well that as we went through our cricket careers, me, my sister and my brother, Bobby's an opening batter, I'm an opening bowler and Jen was the wicket keeper. So you could see how it worked in the back garden and I never got to bat. If we ever got Bobby out, that was it. We'd go on inside and play a different game. We weren't allowed to bat. So. Did he not bowl, Bobby? 
not very well. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's why I was why I'm, I say it's his fault. I'm a number eleven now. So, um, but yeah, sport was it was just always part of my life growing up. It was never forced on us though. Um, I think Dad was always quite um, aware that he didn't want to force us into having to play sport. And I'm terrible at football. I've, I'm definitely not my father's daughter there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it was just you know. I remember my summers just being really bright sunshine. You're always in the garden. I'm sure it was rose tinted glasses now looking back, but you just, I think the community that cricket creates is one that you're just always down at the cricket club. Um, as I got older, I'd get into scoring and doing the tins for the first team or helping mum do the teas. Um, or was playing in the car park. You know, we had a little runway strip near the scoreboard that we could, we could play as a under 11s group and, you know, I was just always playing cricket, so it, it just felt like it was natural to be doing that. And I always wondered what my friends did in the summer holidays when they, if they didn't have a cricket club to go to, what would they do? Um, did you go to the cricket club because Bobby, your brother, played, or did your dad play? It actually, or was it just because you wanted to go anyway? It stems back to my Uncle Bob, so um, Uncle Bob. But not brother Bob. Not brother Bob, Uncle Bob. Does mm. get a bit confusing. Mm. Um, he was the under 11s coach down at Haywood, and he'd played cricket for Haywood. Um, all his life basically my dad would play down there when he was out of football season so the kind of the the family tree always goes back to Haywood I'm, I was actually born in or grew up in Bury. Um, but I when I went down to play my first bit of proper cricket and went down to training it, it was Uncle Bob that was the coach so I think that also helped me back then because I was the only girl you know stood out like a sore thumb I was the only one with a ponytail in the back of my hat so it, I think it was quite nice having the family there to kind of eased me into it and it was back in the day when uncle bob had to be called sir by everyone it was very strict <laughs> strict under 11th coaching but i was allowed to call him uncle bob as long as no one else was around so how did you progress then to play in the men's first team you were the first woman to play in the central lancashire league which is a another trailblazing step yeah it was it was actually one of my goals growing up like i said i didn't really have the aspiration to play for england but i always wanted to play first team cricket for haywood um, probably because I saw that every week and, you know, it was visible to me. And I, I guess the women's stuff was less visible. It mm. wasn't on TV as much as men's cricket was. Um, but I progressed like any of the lads down at Haywood, started in the under 11s, played all the age group stuff. And then it got to senior cricket. Um, and my brother was first team captain when I was, you know, kind of getting good enough to play senior cricket. And he would never pick me, <laughs> never pick me. There was some political decisions, obviously, in committee where he thought he can't pick his youngest, his little sister. And then he stepped down as captain. He did 10 years of captaincy and um, another lad took over and they needed a bowler. So I got, got to go in the first team. But I remember being more nervous making my first team debut for Hayward than I was for my England debut. I think probably because of the pressure of... Different environment, isn't it? That and also... Playing with all these blokes around you. And also, I, as I grew up playing for Haywood, everyone knew there was a girl that played at Haywood. Mm -hmm. And so there was always just that little bit more interest in how I bowled compared to how anyone else bowled, naturally, because, you know, they've got a girl playing for them. Is she any good? And what about the comparisons then? Because you're in, you're in the tough school of cricket. You're not one of these opening batters who just swans <laughs> around and strokes it to the boundary every now and again and, you know, uh, runs very elegantly between the wickets. You're, you're there marking your run-up out and having to sweat, sweat and toil all the way through the day. So what about the comparisons between the men and you, if you like, or were you unaware of that? Yeah, I think I wasn't aware of it. I, and it, it's all I knew. I only knew men's cricket. Mm -hmm. I'd never played women's cricket growing up other than when I was playing for Lancashire, which was actually quite few and far between. Um, but yeah, I, I think I just wanted to be part of the team and I wanted people to see me as a cricketer and not as a girl that was playing cricket and obviously you always got the comments there was always someone who had something to say when you turned up to an away game um that's a really nice story actually well, it's, it's not nice because I got heckled but my mum was watching me play third team cricket uh, I can't remember where we played and there was a group of lads sat behind her and I came on to bowl after the power play and then um, power play it wouldn't have been power playing club cricket but you know I didn't I didn't open you were the first bowling. Change. yeah I didn't open the bowling hmm. and um there was this comment mum passed this story on to me saying that this, these blokes are oh, there's a girl coming on now this is where we cash in this is where we get stuck in and I got four for and like not many overs and my mum just turned around to me and went that's 
that's my daughter by the way and you know she had that little smug that ability to have that smug story but you know there was always something like that that got said so I think I think growing up that I didn't know again I didn't really know it was happening at the time but I think there was almost this need to constantly prove myself when I was playing cricket because you had people who had those views on women playing and um you know it wasn't as normal as it is now to see a girl playing in men's cricket back then so I think there was just always that little bit more pressure when I played and that I think in turn spurred me and motivated me to be the best cricketer that I could be Mm. um and then obviously when the the um when John Stanworth then accepted me into the Lancs Academy I think that almost gave me even more motivation to keep wanting to prove myself because someone you know in in quite a big role has made a big decision that's gained media attention and I wanted to prove to everyone that he'd made the right decision and you know it was even though there was a lot of talk about it being a wasted spot because I was never going to progress to play for England and it I think there was some some monetary gain if someone from the academy yeah. did go on to play for England yeah. there was a lot of controversy around that um, and I think, yeah, it just it made me want to prove to people that John had made the right decision. So th- there was, a, I think, a lot of that that has now shaped who I am as a cricketer. I was going to say, in essence, it's hard work being a girl, a woman at that time, progressing into the men's game. And it's quite obvious that you've got a propensity and a liking for hard work by doing what you're doing. Where do you think that's come from? probably everything that I've just said I think that element of standing out a lot you know you could you, you just couldn't go under the radar being the girl that played for Haywood um and I I work I did work hard I probably wish I'd worked harder knowing knowing what I know now I think if I could go back and do my time again I wish I'd you know got fitter earlier and and worked a bit harder but I I, I do just think my passion for the game got me through a lot of it because I loved playing and I wanted to play at every opportunity um, I saw how much fun my brother was having at the weekend with his mates going out playing in the first team. You know, I wanted that, I craved that. I then kind of found a lot of like-minded girls who were going through the same journey as me when I first started playing for Lancashire. They all had the same story of playing men's cricket and um, kind of getting the sexist remarks and stuff. So I think there was there was a lot of things that probably went into the pot. And, and like I said, it's easy to look back with hindsight now and realise that, you know, that is where my res- my resilience came from or whatever it might be but just I just love the game I just wanted mm. to to play as much as possible and I think that's what inspired me and, and motivated me to keep doing it. Uh, aside from cricket you, you're, you've also worked hard to get a degree you've got a degree in psychology at, at Leeds I think and you've gone on and got a master's so what's uh, inspired you and kept you going to to work hard to get those uh, academic qualifications? Well, the first one, when I first went to uni, that was because I needed to get a job. Cricket, <laughs> cric- there was no, no career in no, cricket. That, right. So I went to uni in 2010 and the professional contracts didn't come in until 2014. So I went to university with the view that I'd need a degree, find a job that would help me, you know, play cricket as well um, in a semi-professional state that it was still in at the time. Um, recently the Masters was more I'm getting towards that stage of my career where everyone's talking to me about retiring because I'm in my 30s now so I thought I'd better do something just in case and the worst happens um, but I've always had I think my journey in cricket has always made me want to help you like the, a young Kate Cross to not have to do what I did not have to be the first girl to do things but actually have a really clear path that would you know help them play for England or for Lancashire or for Thunder, whoever it might be. Um, so I did a <coughs> master's in um, a sport, a sports director's master. Mm. Um, I'm not very patient with coaching, so I think I'm more behind the scenes kind of decision making. But um, I think that's why I did it. It was just so that you know young girls wouldn't necessarily have to have the journey that I had in it. Not that I would change my journey for anything, but you know I just want girls to think sports are really great option as a career especially cricket because it's given me some of my best times in life it's given me some of my worst times in life but it's given me you know some of the most incredible memories and you want as many girls to think that that can be for them so that's why I think I've been inspired to keep going academically as well Uh, in a way they say life or some of the good things in life about being in the right place at the right time 
um, even though initially in your career, so 2006 onwards, there was very little um, women's cricket. It started to snow, the, the effect of women's cricket started to snowball as it got into the early two th 2000 and teens, didn't it? 2013, 14 were the, the first central contracts. And you first played for England in 2013, I think you were involved in 2011. So when did it start to dawn on you that there may be a possibility of, of pursuing a, a life in cricket almost totally without having anything else around you? Probably the day that we came back from Australia, we did um, what, back What, when you'd won back. the Ashes? Yeah, thanks mm. for mentioning that. Um, we did back-to-back <laughs> -back Ashes, so I wasn't involved in the 2013 home series, but the girls won it back here, and then we went and defended the Ashes in the winter of 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and we got back from that tour, and we got an email from the ECB about a bonus, and at the time it felt like this really significant bonus. I think it was like 10 grand or something like that to be, you know, to win the Ashes. Um, and then we went over to the World Cup, the T20 World Cup in Bangladesh in that March. Um, we returned from that trip and we got this email saying that professional contracts were coming in. And it wasn't until I read that email that I thought, right, you know, I might have a job here. If I'm offered a contract, then I could consider myself a professional sports person. Mm -hmm. So um, that was really, it was quite unexpected because there'd been no talk about professionalism of the game. Um, like the girls were in that semi-professional era of working with Chance to Shine to subsidise and do coaching whilst they were still training as, as England players. And I'd just come out of university, so I um, graduated, I think, in the summer of 2013. So, I, I again, it was right place, right time for me. Mm. That I'd just finished uni, was looking for jobs, thinking, what could I do? Um, I'd done a degree in psychology, so I was kind of looking down that route. And then this email landed in my inbox, and next thing you know, you're offered a... A central contract by England so it was like it was dream come true kind of stuff but really until that that email landed I, there was never an expectation that I was going to have a career in cricket. You had a dream debut in Perth though didn't you in the in the test match? Yeah that was pretty special. Even Winning the game wickets in both innings what do you get three for 35 in each innings? Or yeah it was strange like that. yeah and then my the next test match I played I had the same figures in the game as well it was six for 70 in both in my first two test matches which was strange but um yeah that was that was a real magic four days it was hard work that was it's hot I remember it being really hot like you were getting in the ice bath after every session um I'd never played anything longer than a 50 over game of cricket and then was suddenly exposed to these conditions in Perth at the WACA um you know that is that's real dream stuff being able to make your debut in a test match against Australia at the WACA as a fast bowler you know it was really special and to win that game as well, it was back when we just started the multi-format, the multi-point series yeah, of yeah. the Ashes, and um, it was worth six points for the test if you won. So it was a big, big win. Um, but I was exhausted at the end <laughs> of it. I remember um, David Collier was the would he have been the CEO or the chairman of the, of the ECB at the time? Yeah, probably. Yeah. And he rocked up to um, the pub that we were in in Perth. Well, we they all. always like to trip away to Perth, the, <laughs> the ECB hierarchy. Didn't yeah, it's, it's the one that everyone <laughs> seems to go on, isn't it? Yeah. But um, he, he rocked up with the ECB credit card, so we were all thinking, oh, this is amazing, we've got a free night ahead of us. And it was a, we finished at lunchtime, so it would have been about 2 o'clock we're in this pub, and by 2.30 I was getting woken up because I'd just fallen gone. asleep, completely got the adrenaline had gone. I must have had six hours sleep throughout the entire test match. I was just on a high after every single... Well, those swan Day. lagers do it to you as well. Yeah, I think I'd only <laughs> had about two. I was gusted. I missed a big party. But, yeah, it was, a, again, a, probably a bit of an eye-opener of what was to come because there was that, there was just the doing it because it was there, the opportunity had come. Of course, I wanted to play in a test match. There was no talk about bowling workloads back then or, you no. know, nothing like that. Um, but, yeah, it was a really special, special four days for us. Interesting point, that, because the format that you, that, the women play now with the point system in one day internationals and test you don't play very many test matches but i get from just chatting to you here now and knowing you anyway that you really enjoy the challenge of the test match do the do the girls in general um look forward to playing test matches yeah yeah always and wish they'd play more yeah yeah it's always just you get you you always get your colored kit for t20 cricket and one day cricket but the 
the special packages when you know you've got an Ashes around the corner or potentially mm. when we play in India or someone like that because you get your whites as well and it's it's what every kid in the back garden plays growing up isn't it it's or my generation especially it was always test match cricket and that was what was on my telly what I was watching the 2005 Ashes was just you know I remember queuing up outside here in 2005 to what, get in on that final, final day, day yeah mm. I actually snuck in I managed to find a little two two lanes were merging with the queues and I just snuck right through the middle and got in um but it was just I remember that summer being it just lit cricket up didn't it it was mm. just incredible yeah. Andrew Flintoff running in and game making making things happen and changing games and he had a personality I remember he was the first player that I saw that had this big personality on on a cricket pitch and I thought that was really special and I wanted to be part of that um so it was always it was kind of what I was brought up on you know white ball cricket wasn't really around back then and um so it was still always my dream to play test cricket and it, it, it's the same for every single player now if you ask mm. anyone they'll want to play a test match um I find it such a shame that we don't play enough of it because we almost have to learn as we play we because you don't play, you don't play it domestically, do you? No, we don't, don't play, play any red ball, no. any red ball cricket, and we play two test matches a year now, and that's a lot. When mm. I first started, it was one every three years, mm. and you'd, it would be in the biggest arena of playing in the Ashes, where it really mattered, where the points were heavily weighted for the test match. So you you learn in the the job as you go, and you know one session really teaches you a lot, and then you don't play it again for eighteen months. So it's um, it, I th I think it's a real shame in that aspect because I think we'd learn. As female cricketers, I think we'd learn a lot more about the game by playing more red ball cricket. Um, you know, you've just got to do your basics for longer and generally the better team comes out on top in, in test cricket. And um, I think that's what, what I love so much about it is that it's the toil and the hard work and the emotion and everything that goes into four, well, five days for us now. We played a five-day test match this summer. but And then at the end of it, you want to do it all again it's crazy you put mm -hmm. your body through hell but you want to do it all again it's just got this um, there's a great degree of satisfaction about it isn't there yeah i think that's something you get from bowling 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 fast it doesn't matter particularly whether you've had wick tape wickets or had a good day there is a, a great degree of self-satisfaction to be had just the physical effort that you put in and getting some form of reward at the end of the day yeah you, and, you think that? yeah i agree with that and i think there's there's the kind of chess play of it as well and how mm. you the, like the tactics of test cricket obviously if you understand the game and the nuances of it then you see a lot of the ebbs and flows in test cricket but for me it's the being under the you know under pressure of trying to work batters out whilst you're whilst you're out there I feel like t20 cricket you probably do your homework and you know how players play mm. and how you might get them out but there's very little time to set players up whereas in test cricket it's all kind of about that trying to s stay one step ahead of the game but you know work players out as you go and I just think that's quite special. So you've had a, a great time winning the Ashes 2014-2015 um, but it's not always been plain sailing for you because a year or so later you hit a bit of a wall and you have a, an issue with anxiety and stress. Um, how did that manifest itself? Uh, and I know you don't mind talking about it because you have talked about it before. Uh, and w why do you think that occurred? Somebody who was quite obviously having a good time within the game. Yeah, it was. I think it was actually a bit of a shock to me that I was feeling the way that I was feeling. Um, like I said, I studied psychology at uni. I remember being in a lecture and we were going through depression and anxiety and symptom symptoms of those illnesses. And I remember being in this lecture theatre and like ticked off five of six of the symptoms. And I thought, wow, that's exactly how I feel. And I remember speaking to my mum and it was a really difficult conversation because I actually find saying the word depression really difficult. Mm. And I remember saying to her, I, th I think this is what I'm suffering with. And she she said to me, she said, I've been wanting to talk to you about this for a while. You've not felt yourself. She um, recognised it, did she? Yeah, she, she, I think she just recognised that I'm quite a bubbly character. I'm quite extroverted and I think I'd, I was quite insular when I was at uni and didn't seem to be enjoying myself as much as 18-year-olds at university should do. Um, and it actually, it, that whole time of my life is actually a big blur. 
the uh, years kind of merge into each other and so you're talking about yeah. when you were at university and even when you were playing in your early days for England it mm. didn't act it manifested itself then but didn't actually come out yeah until what was it 2016 2016 maybe? so that uh, yeah that's three or four years later so I I think a lot it, like I said it does kind of all all merge into one but 2016 was when it all came to a head basically and for anyone who has ever suffered with anxiety or depression it's it's really I say easy it's easy to go into your cricket environment and be the character that everyone knows you to be but it was when I was getting home that I noticed that I was finding all of the cricket things really exhausting because I was putting this mask on um I was you know pretending I was having the best time of my life because why wouldn't I I'm traveling the world with England and getting to play cricket for a living and actually I was despising every second of it I was dreading going to training um I was putting so much pressure on myself to perform every single day because I was being paid to do that now so um my my hobby the my passion that I'd grown up with became my job overnight and I really struggled with that transition and it wasn't until I started seeing um a psychologist who um a bloke called Mike Rotherham who was working with the England team at the time I started having um sessions with him consistently there were weekly sessions and um this all happened because I basically had a really big breakdown when I got to Loughborough one day I ended up getting pulled out of a tour to the West Indies this was the year before the home world cup as well in 2017 so I remember there was a re I was having a real big argument with myself about if I tell anyone how I'm feeling then I might risk a place in the 2017 world cup squad if I don't tell anyone how I'm feeling then who knows what might happen I'm really struggling um, so I was having this internal debate for a long time and it all just came to a head and I remember crying the entire journey down to Loughborough. The only reason I went down was because I was picking Sophie Eccleston up. She couldn't drive so I had to pick her up en route and I didn't want to let her down. I got to Loughborough and I hid in the physio room. I couldn't even go and see any of the girls. Couldn't face them. Just couldn't face anyone. All my best friends were in that squad and I, I couldn't bear the thought of being around them. Um, and so... I got the help that I needed. I spoke to our physio. Mark Robinson was our coach at the time, and he said, look, I'm pulling you out of selection for this tour. Go away. Make yourself, you know, get yourself better. Cricket doesn't matter right now. Make sure you're okay. And this is when I then started seeing Mike Rotherham. And actually, again, it's, it's hindsight, and it's really easy with hindsight, but mm. we got to a point about six months later where we worked out that actually me growing up as David Cross's daughter as Bobby Cross's brother, as Jenny Cross's sister, as, you know, a young, one of the young Crosses, I, without knowing, had a lot of pressure on me growing up. And it took us ages to unpick this, but I, I didn't realise the pressure that that came with and the perfectionism that I'd created around myself, the desire to prove people wrong, all went into this pot and kind of bubbled over. But... And also you add the professional contracts into that of, you know, needing to feel like you were doing everything perfectly and, you know, you weren't drinking, you weren't seeing your friends, you were training, you were making sure you got your 10 hours sleep, you're doing everything as well as you possibly could. And I just built this life that wasn't, um, that wasn't obtainable, I guess. Full of, full of self-doubt. Yeah. And lack of self-worth. Yeah. And I think I said it at the start of this interview, but I never believed I was good enough to play for England. So then there was this imposter syndrome as well that came in and... Um, and it was that it was no one's fault. It was just how mm. it had kind of all happened. And being the first girl as well, there was mm. just this natural. Well, Kate will play for England. She must do. So there's this just this pressure that I, a lot of it was my internal dialogue with myself as well. That oh, I'm, well, I've played for the academy now, so I must do this. I must go on to play for England. Um, so anyway, we got to the kind of got to the bottom of it, and you know we did some hard work. I remember having to have a lot of difficult conversations with my parents as well. Because I felt a lot of pressure when my family came to watch me play. That it happened at Worcester, did it? Yeah, that was the example I was going to use. Yeah. Everyone, had it was the first day. So I've been playing for England a few years, but this day at Worcester, we were playing Pakistan. And it was the first day that all my closest family had been able to watch the same game. So it felt like a really big deal, and I really wanted to do well for them. And I think Nat Siver hit record runs, and we had our highest total. And um, we should have beat Pakistan. It was a, you know a game that we were on paper going to win and I remember bowling and just getting hit everywhere and my figures were terrible and I remember thinking 
um, I am, I'm not good enough to be here. I'm actually like, this is, it's all going to come out now. Everyone's going to realise I'm no good at cricket. Um, and I remember just being on the pitch with my sunglasses on and just tears were rolling down my face. And I thought, I'm live on Sky Sports here. I need to, you know, something's not right. This isn't, you know, it's, it's you know, the dream that everyone sells you just isn't, doesn't mm. seem to be what I'm experiencing. So, um, so yeah, I had to have conversations with my parents around how much pressure I felt when they came to watch me play and they were laughing at me. They were going, well, what are you on about? You're playing for England. We're so proud of you. We don't care if you do well. You, you're out there representing your country. You're representing us. Um, so there's a lot of difficult conversations around mm. that. And that's when you, I think if you speak to anyone who's played, I'm not even professional sport, just pr sport in general, I think you, you have to go back to that kid in the garden. Like, why do you play? What do you love about this sport? And actually kind of hitting rock bottom for me was that opportunity to refall, like to fall back in love with the game. Um, and since then, since around 2018, I've, I've arguably have probably had my best years in an England mm. shirt. Um, I've loved the game. I've loved giving back to the game. I've loved experiencing everything that cricket can give you. I um, feel like I've got much better balance with cricket and life and travel etc so i feel like in a way it was the worst time of my life but without it i don't think i would i think i would have stopped playing cricket and and not played again well that was a fantastic account of of your the poor time the, the bad time that you had uh and how you've come out of it and how you realized that without that you, you probably wouldn't have got on to do what you've done now what, was there any one point something w that you saw watched that that sparked you to rejuvenate yourself and say oh, come on I can do this again there was a moment um just after I'd got back from Loughborough actually when I'd had this breakdown I had three days in my bedroom I didn't leave my bedroom other than if I needed to use the toilet or get some food from downstairs I was still at my mum and dad's at the time and um my dad came into my room and I think my mum and dad just didn't know what to do. They'd not really dealt with anyone who was struggling mentally and I didn't know what to do. And um, they just, I remember my dad just said to me that they wanted to help me, but they didn't know how to. And he just, he said to me, his quote was, I can't remember where he got it from, but he just said, tough times don't last, but tough people do. And it, it, I just, I really vividly remember him being sat on my bed and my blinds were closed. It was the middle of the day, you know, I'd been asleep for a lot of it. And I just really remember not wanting to feel how I felt. And I was just fed up of, like I'd come home, not showered. I'd been, like, like I said, I'd been in my room for three days and I, it just really felt like I was at absolute rock bottom. And I remember that I didn't want to feel that way anymore. And I wanted to get myself better. Mm. And then I think the natural, you know, process of getting yourself better and understanding your mental health more and, how you work, how you function, what your triggers are, got me in a better place, which then made me realise that it wasn't cricket that had triggered me. It was everything that came with cricket, but actually cricket's still an unbelievable sport um, that I'm still really passionate about and still want to be a part of. Um, whether that's for England, I wasn't sure at the time because I didn't know if I actually had... I think I, I felt like I closed the door on that a little bit by not going on that, that winter tour. Um but I still wanted to be part of it. And I think that was what actually kick-started me to make sure I really bought into the sessions I was doing with Mike. And they were really difficult, but you need, I needed to go through those conversations to make sure that I understood myself to, to be better as a human being before I was better as a cricketer. Mm. Um, so yeah, like I said, it, it all is a bit of a blur for me, that kind of time of my life. But um, there's a lot of people that I think if I if hadn't they hadn't been around at that time then I probably wouldn't be playing cricket now I think I would have probably packed it in and, and not looked back. Well you you said uh, a few minutes ago that, that um, from 2018 onwards has been your best time in the game and it's been a good time to be in the game um, whether you're a man or a woman to be perfectly honest um, but especially in terms of women's cricket the way that the game has now developed with franchise leagues around the, around the world. You played in the Big Bash in Australia um, uh, as one of the first overseas players. Um, how do you, you obviously want to carry on playing, I assume you do, but how do you see the women's game going now, it's going from strength to strength? Is, that, is the, the balance shifting towards franchise cricket or is it still very firmly in, in an international 
format? That's a really difficult question to answer because I think if you'd have asked me where I saw women's cricket was heading five years ago, I don't think I'd have been able to create or envisage what is what we have now as the outcome five years ago. So it's quite hard to, you know, with the with the way that women's cricket is travelling, it's quite hard to, to think where it could be in the next five years as well. There is more franchise cricket turning up in our calendar, but we're still at a really strange phase with the global game that not all countries are professional. So you've got the kind of top four or five that are professional with us, Australia, India, South Africa, New Zealand to an extent, but they're still very pretty much underpaid from what I gather. And I think I would rather see the global game rise at the right pace, kind of as a as a group of playing nations rather yeah. than just seeing the top five or top three kind of run away with everything. But without these global tournaments, you, you don't have, without the franchise tournaments, sorry, you've not really got the platform for girls to get exposure and get um, opportunities to play cricket under pressure. So it's, it's a really difficult balance for the women's game at the minute. Um, but like I said, you, I couldn't imagine the game being where it is right now if you'd have asked me five years ago. You know, to have... Well, it's changed for you exponentially, really, because you're a Lancashire girl through and through. You played for Lancashire, you played for the Thunder. But what happened last year? <laughs> you had to play, you went and played for the Northern Superchargers, but you were you were um, you were picked up by them. So there's this fluidity now in the game that is probably very difficult to get your head round as a traditional um, women's player and somebody yeah. who's grown up through this um, through this system. Yeah, but you're there now. We are, and I am. I do play for a Yorkshire team you, um, can, you can say it <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't no one from Yorkshire will be watching this will they? Um, I think again like the men the men have a blueprint they've had they've been playing professional cricket a lot longer than us and they're they've you know used they've gone through the stepping stones that we're going through now but we almost still try and use some of the men's blueprints but it doesn't quite fit in the women's game so you're seeing these auctions and people getting sold across the Pennines to go to different teams and that in the men's game is a lot more normal and a lot, a lot more accepted. And if you're a professional cricketer, you might up sticks and move to Kent because you've been bought to go and play, you know, your county cricket there. Whereas in the women's game, we're not quite there with the pay yet. We're not quite there with the, like the used to being moved around and picked up and dropped in a team. So it, it, it or the facilities, the it's facilities still definitely getting better now. Definitely. Since they brought in the domestic structure and the regional um, the way that they've regionalised the, the women's game, then, you know, this is, for the Thunder Girls, this is home. And mm. it's a test match venue. It's got unbelievable facilities, great coaches who've been part of Lancashire and, you know, really understand the morals of what it is to be a, a Lancastrian, etc. So there's, we're very, very lucky here. We're very well supported and we're, we're probably the region that a lot of other teams aspire to look like, um, which obviously we should be very proud of as, as a county. Um, but there's just this element of it's moving so quickly that you know some parts of the game can't keep up with it. So you've got a girl who moves up from London, but the pay is not good enough to be, you know, being able to buy a property up mm. here. It's very different in the men's game. The men will be able to afford things like that. So it's um, it, it's in this really quite finite balance of where where does the funding go? And I think the funding is not quite big enough yet to cover all bases even though the game's moving at that, that exponential rate. So I'm glad I'm not in that decision-making hmm. um, stage of, of my career yet. But it, it, it's great. It's un unbelievable. It's brilliant to be a part of. But there's there's always kind of these... Um, grudge, not grudge is the wrong word, but, you know, there's just these bits where we're like, we just want that to be a bit better and that to be a bit yeah, better yeah. and that to be a bit better. You feel you're catching up, basically. Yeah, I th yeah, I think that's what but I'm saying. But not quite there yet. Yeah, but it is in, in such a healthy state. You know, we've got 100 professionalised girls in the country mm. now. Um, think back to 2014, less than 10 years ago, there was 15 contracted players getting paid to play women's cricket. So um, it is a really great place to be. And that's, I think, why it's so difficult to think where we could be in five years' time. Um, what about the future then for Kate Cross? In five years' time, you're still going to be bowling? How old will I be then? 37. 37. Oh, yeah, be. doesn't I don't feel like I'll be bowling at thirty. So I don't, I don't know. I've never, I've not got a date for no. an idea. And why would you? No, 
I want to keep enjoying the game. Um, I feel in a really good place with it at the moment. I feel like I'm really still enjoying it and feel like I can, I can offer a lot. Um, training's not a chore yet, which I know when that happens, and that's probably going to be when I start thinking about retiring. But um, we've got a World Cup in 2025 that I'll be really keen to, you know, be nice for you to win one of those, wasn't it? Would be lovely. Um, but yeah, I want to try and stake a claim for selection for that. And then I, I think with the women's calendar now, you you think 2025 ODI World Cup, there'll be an Ashes in 2026, then there'll be another T20 World Cup in 27. You know, there's always something around the corner. So I think that's what probably keeps us more interested than in the past when you might have had to wait six months for a tour. And exciting times for Emirates Old Trafford because... We've got five games here starting in 2025, I think. Yeah, yeah. so I need to... You need... Because I, I, you love playing here. I love you? playing here. I love that I get to call this place my home. And that was... I remember speaking to Daniel Gidney a couple of years ago saying that that's something on my bucket list is to play an England game at home yeah. at Old Trafford, at Emirates at Old Trafford. So he then gave me the good news that they've got some games. So I was like, right, I need to keep <laughs> keep going and try and get into, into the team for that. Um, but that, again, that's just... I think I was 23 when I got to play my first game here and it was in the Kia Super League um, and it rained, of course it did. Um, so I think we actually got rained off for the first game but I remember the excitement that I had was like, you know, the seven-year-old in the garden who'd seen it on TV and seen Andrew Flintoff playing on telly here and I, I couldn't believe that I was getting the opportunity to play here. And now this is, you know, where we play a lot of our cricket yeah. and it's the norm and it's we've got a home dressing room um, we've got our lock. We've got our own lockers. Uh, you know, this I, this is what I call home. So, um, it it has changed so much. But I think to play to be able to play an England game here would be on the bucket list and really want to tick that off the to do list. Kate, thanks very much. It's been uh, a, a really enjoyable um, forty five minutes at has least. Has it? Oh yeah. Time flies. Fantastic. Or? You've been uh, you've been a, a really good. Uh, Good interviewee, and uh, I think everybody will enjoy listening to you. Uh, I certainly hope so, and we'll get you back in because there's plenty more we, we've got to discuss. So, Kate Cross, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So the 4pm inspection is currently taking place with the uh, two umpires and the uh, head groundsman, uh, Matt Merchant, out in the middle. The f as you can see, the full covers are on there, the three out there for those viewers on Lanx TV. The two umpires and Matt uh, taking a look at conditions. It's kind of rained on and off for the last couple of hours. Um, initially, it was... Um, an issue could well still be a problem with with strong winds preventing us getting out there and removing the covers and trying to get some cricket. But um, it's not a massively optimistic scene, Mark Church. It is, and unfortunately, and it's it's exactly what everybody didn't want to happen today. Because as we said before, we we finally did get underway for what was it, 21 balls. We were very excited by the prospect of play, but yeah, the the wind has caused havoc, uh, and, and understandably as well. And then we've had two or three pretty hefty showers, haven't we? Mm. I personally, I'll be amazed if we get back out there today, because of course it was it was pretty wet anyway, and the ground staff have worked tirelessly to get us out there for the the overs that we have managed to get in during this game. But at the moment, with the two umpires out there, it will be really wet. You mm. can see that on the covers. You know, puddles on the covers are never a great sign. Um, and it's a, it's a really difficult, difficult job, this. And I suppose the other problem we've got is we did get started. So hmm. that's the other thing. We did actually get underway. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been a lot of sort of sitting around and waiting for, for decisions to be made, really. Um, and, and as I say, for everybody, it's, it's a very frustrating 
situation in this opening game of the summer. It's not currently raining, which is a, um, which was timed quite nicely for the 4 p.m. inspection mm -hmm. that was scheduled. So they've been able to have a little look around while it's not been raining. But as you mentioned, Churchy, and you can see Matt walking across the covers, there's quite a lot of water on the covers, which obviously they would need to remove all that and then look at it because the issue has been the ball was run ups and the foot marks yeah. at both ends. So you can't even look at that until the covers are removed. And that's in itself quite a lengthy process. It is. And, and, and you can see them there that it's obviously very, very wet again. And, and you've had all that water on, you've cleared all that water. You've now got fresh water on top. And as I say, I, I would think it would take them from here a couple of hours to to get everything off and get everything dry. The problem is, is whether they can actually get the covers off mm. be because of the, the very strong winds. They haven't been able to take those covers off anyway. So it, it's gonna, gonna take a while to do that I if they get to that point, but I'm not honestly sure they'll even get to that point. I think we should get an announcement at some some stage fairly shortly. But, but as I say, y you can just, tell from the body language there of both the umpires and the head groundsman that it is very wet out there and as I say it's, it's a pretty thankless task because you you spend the whole morning getting it dry you get out there for what was it 3.3 <laughs> overs mm. then it rains again <laughs> then the wind picks up again then it rains again and everybody's done as much as they can do really and I know it's stopped now but what time are we? Ten past four, so we're already past four o'clock. And and the other thing I would mention is the light's not great either. That's the other thing. It's not got a lot going for it, has it, really? Then? Now, well, <laughs> from a cricketing <laughs> point of view, no. <laughs> maybe from a rugby point of view, yeah, it would be okay. Yeah. But uh, And for the players as well, it's sort of frustrating, you know, indoor school. We saw some of the Surrey players wander across with a football, just have a bit of a kick around. Um, but but there's not a lot anybody mm. can do in this situation, which is a real shame because, as I say, when we went out there today at 12.30, I thought, oh, the, yeah, the weather's looking OK. And then we caught the edge of a shower, didn't we? And, and that was that after 3.3 overs, came off for lunch, and then it started raining heavily mm. again, and it rained heavily about half an hour ago. Um, so I, I'd be very surprised if we get back out there today. I really would. We did have that slightly unusual situation in the afternoon where it probably was at least 45 minutes to an hour where it didn't rain. But uh, we were then informed that the, we couldn't get the, the, the covers off because of the, the strong winds. It's just kind of a health and safety thing. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, we, we, we've spoken about seeing them like sails, the covers. And if you're a member of the ground stuff and you're hanging on to the edge of one of those, you you know, you could do yourself a serious injury. So so I, I understand the reasoning behind that. I, I, I do get that. And uh, and that's the problem because the other thing is the wind hasn't really dropped at all. It's still very blustery out there. So so until they can actually get the covers off, we can't get anything done. No, we can't. Um, so we're, we're, we're still kind of waiting to find out what the verdict was from that uh, inspection and that chat with Matt. Um, which I'm sure would have included the conversations of, well, you know, if you can start to peel off the covers, how long is it going to take you? And this, that and the other. Um, um, we will bring you that uh, news as soon as we um, as soon as we can. Um, and then, of course, tomorrow is the final day. I mean, w we're basically looking at, at the possibility if we get any further play either today or tomorrow at, at bonus points. Yeah, we are. And I think that was always going to be that was always going to be the case, wasn't it? If we didn't get a lot of cricket today, then we were going to be looking at that anyway. And, you know, let's keep our fingers crossed we might get some cricket tomorrow because I don't think we're going to get any today. No, and I think the news we're, we're just getting is that play has been uh, abandoned. Yeah, just to confirm that now, that's all come through. That play has been abandoned for the day here at Emirates Old Trafford. So just the 21 balls bowled. Yeah, and, and just just disappointing, isn't it, really? And it just this game has never really got started. We had a, we had a great day yesterday, but just as you think you're, you're going to get into the nitty-gritty, the rain's come, the winds are picked up. Here's Keemar Roach. He's making his way slowly across the <laughs> outfield. Is Keemar huddled up? 
So uh, he'd have enjoyed seeing a bit of sun yesterday, <laughs> but I'm not sure he'll be enjoying yeah. this at the moment. He's the first to the warmth of the hotel, isn't he? Absolutely, yeah. 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 Straight it's over, warm. straight over the outfield. So a real shame, and, and and let's keep our fingers crossed that yeah. tomorrow the weather improves. Fingers crossed, and um, we shall try again tomorrow. Uh, whether it's raining or not, we'll be with you from about 10:45 um, for coverage of this fourth and uh, and final day uh, here from uh, Emirates Old Trafford. No play. No further play possible on the uh, on the third day due to uh, due to rain. We'll catch you tomorrow. Sunday school tea party. There are no hiding places. It's another monster hit for six. I know we are good enough, but we're just not showing it on the pitch. You put that support in, you put that investment in, right, start winning games. Ah. Doesn't work like that, does it? It means so much, it means so much to me, the staff and everyone in here. A few wins put together, maybe they could actually grace finals day. Oh, that's a ferocious looking shot. We don't want equal pay, we want equal opportunity. They're going to try and show a little bit of something for the investment that's been put in. The reality dawns, that is what professional sport is. Eighteen sixty four. We were first class then, and we're first class now, with a dream to spread cricket through Lancashire's towns, where girls and boys, with willow and leather, become more than a badge, but the red rose together. A club where more than legends are made, but friendships. Obsessions, moments, replayed on our screens, in our minds, in our hearts forever. Because it's who we are, our DNA, the Red Rose together. Statham, Briggs, Jimmy, Freddie and Joss, Jappy, Sir Clive Lloyd, Carol Hodges, Kate Cross. What a roll call. It's a hard one to measure with future names still to be written on the Red Rose together. We're all about people. It's what the Red Rose really means. Yeah, the ones signing autographs, but the ones behind the scenes. Our community, grassroots, the ones that feel tethered. Whether you're from here or belong here, we are the Red Rose together. And what about this place? Talk about world-class venues, internationals, gigs, events. You can choose from a menu of triumph, of disaster, of pain, or pleasure. We've seen it all at Emirates Old Trafford with the Red Rose together. Red ball, white ball, lightning and thunder. Have you ever sat back? Have you ever just wondered? How far we've come. The storms we've weathered. Or how far we'll go. As the red rolls together.
Alex, nice to see you. First things first, um, you love ice cream. Top three favourite flavours, hit me, come on. Oh, I mean, easy. Mint chocolate chip. Yeah. Raspberry ripple, vanilla. How have you answered that so far? Well, it's easy. I've not, ridiculous. you know what? I actually haven't had an ice cream for ages because I got not, got spotted as the ice cream girl from the BBC and yep. I was like, this cannot carry on. I, no, can't, be be known for, I can't be known for just eating ice cream. Um, so I've stopped eating ice cream now. I just went to Italy and we had gelato every day. But if you say gelato, it makes you sound super pretentious. Yeah, it does. It makes you sound posh, doesn't it? Especially then when you have pistachio and elderberry. Oh, stop. Honestly, unbelievable. <laughs> I was like, what should I have? They were like this. Also, they were like pumpkin seed. No. That's what I thought. Amazing. Is it? Yeah, maybe only in Florence. Probably don't get it in like Warrington. <laughs> You've got to stick to the what you know. You know yeah. what's where? Strawberry chocolate vanilla. That one where you can Done. get the only one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a good start. Mm. How did you get into cricket? Um, so I played football with all the lads on my estate. So I was the only girl. There was okay. probably about six or seven lads. So we all played football. One Friday night, they were like, we're going to go up to the cricket club. So I ran home. I was like, mum, mum, can I go and play cricket? She's like, no, you do everything. She's like, you do football, you do basketball, you do hockey, you do anything, everything, gymnastics, swimming. I was like, come on. She's like, no, not any, not one more spot. I was like, the bar's open. Come on, mum. She's like, right, come on, we're <laughs> going up. That's it, <laughs> <laughs> not quite like that but yeah so we yeah. went up every Friday night um, and I absolutely fell in love with it so every Friday after school I'd be up at the cricket club from as soon as we finished school right until I got told I had to go home because it was dark just loved it now I didn't google you earlier definitely did but you went to school in Clitheroe is that right yes so did you play at school as well as at home yes yeah, so I played at school uh, when all the girls in PE went to do netball I was not very good at netball I kept bouncing the ball and they were like like you oh were playing basketball. Yeah. Wanted to be Jordan. All the girls were like, oh my God, this girl's so annoying. So I, then I started playing cricket with the boys. So the girls would go and play netball and I'd say to the teachers, can I play cricket? And they'd be like, well, yeah, fine. When you started playing, was it immediate 